Hunter x Hunter is currently in its longest hiatus after the release of chapter 390 on the 26th of November 2018, meaning that we have had no new Hunter x Hunter material for near enough three and a half years. A lot of people have started to accept that we may never get a conclusion to this incredible manga series, and that the end of the anime had cited the end of Gon's story arc, so in some way the story has been completed. In this video, I want to go through all of the story, including all of the material covered within the Hunter x Hunter 20 11 anime and then diving into the manga only material with the 9 chapters of the Dark Continent Expedition arc and the 42 chapters of the Uncomplete Succession Contest arc. So without further delay let's get into my breakdown and analysis of the entire Hunter x Hunter story. The first arc of Hunter x Hunter, the Hunter exam arc, spans from the first chapter to the 38th chapter of the manga. It was published between March 1998 to January 1999. Hunter x Hunter is written and illustrated by the famous mangaka Yoshihiro Togashi. In 2018, during the 50th anniversary of Weekly Shonen Jump, we learn more about the creator of Hunter x Hunter through his comments in the third volume of the Shonen Jump exhibition. We quickly learn through this interview that Togashi is the type of mangaka who has a specific strategy that he implements into his work. This is because he cares incredibly about how he is perceived as a manga artist. Everybody knows that his breakthrough success as a mangaka was his incredibly popular series Yu Yu Hakusho, but what was his mindset after he had completed Yu Yu Hakusho? We need to know this so that we can appreciate how Hunter x Hunter began as a series. After the abrupt conclusion of Yu Yu Hakusho, Togashi started a new sci-fi manga called Level E. He wanted to show a different side of himself as a creator to his audience. His desire was to detach himself from the reader's expectations, which they had formed from his previous work. You can see even before the creation of Hunter x Hunter, Togashi wanted to create a series which would keep the audience guessing. After his sci-fi manga ended, he decided to create a battle manga, but he went into the series wanting to make it a hit. He studied the reader polls and tried to understand what his audience wanted from a manga. He himself describes Hunter x Hunter as a die-hard battle manga, which is combined with a deep story. He even goes on to describe the protagonist Gon as a main character who has never been seen before in the pages of Weekly Shonen Jump, because at first glance he may appear bright-eyed and innocent like so many of his contemporaries, but the difference with this character is his unwavering determination in battle, and how this monstrous determination gives hints of a darker aspect to Gon's character. But rest assured, during these arc analysis videos I'll be going through how Gon's character changes, and how these glimpses of a darker aspect of his character are capitalised upon by Togashi later on in the series. Togashi at this point has been writing Hunter x Hunter for 22 years. His chapter count of 391 pales in comparison to other series like One Piece which started in 1990 and is nearing 1,000 chapters. Togashi has become infamous in the manga community for regularly taking breaks and going on long hiatuses, even to the point that frustrated fans refer to Hunter x Hunter as hiatus hiatus. These breaks stem from his history of health issues that he sustained during the publication of Yu Yu Hakusho. He was under constant pressure from Shonen Jump to meet their strict weekly deadlines. Because of this, unlike so many other manga authors, his health began to deteriorate. They also put additional pressure onto him by forcing him into writing his manga in a particular way, which would match with the ethos of Shonen Jump. They forced him to take the story into directions which clashed with his own creative ideas. During the publication of Yu Yu Hakusho, he was prevented from creatively expressing himself the way that he wanted to, and it was for this reason that he became disillusioned and demotivated. And this ultimately came full circle with the unexpected conclusion of Yu Yu Hakusho, a series that was very near and dear to my heart. Some believe that these events led to Togashi making a one-of-a-kind agreement with Shonen Jump, who were desperate for another successful manga which would parallel the successes of Yu Yu Hakusho. Some say that this contract granted Togashi with freedom from these strict deadlines, as well as having creative liberty to write his story the way that he wants to. Sure enough, with this creative freedom, Togashi was able to create a series which would rival the success of Yu Yu Hakusho. Despite hardly seeing Hunter x Hunter in the pages of Weekly Shonen Jump, whenever a manga volume is published, the sales speak for themselves. A new manga volume of Hunter x Hunter rivals the sales of a popular series at that time. Despite the long breaks and the hiatuses, Hunter x Hunter is a global hit. The manga has had two anime adaptations. The first 
releasing in 1999 and the second in 2011. And the reason that I've mentioned all of these details and give a little bit of a backstory about Togashi is so that you know the unique history behind Hunter x Hunter, and a little bit of an explanation behind the long breaks which may deter a lot of people from getting into the series. Hopefully through these arc analysis videos I can convince a handful of people to start reading or experiencing Hunter x Hunter. Despite the long breaks in serialization, I do believe that Hunter x Hunter has been created with a lot of love, care and attention to detail, and it is for this very reason that I'm going to now begin my Hunter exam arc analysis and try to pick up on all of the details that Togashi drops throughout the series. The first arc revolves around applicants from all over the world undertaking the Hunter exam. Upon its completion, successful applicants are granted permission to become a professional hunter. The Hunter Association, which is first mentioned in Chapter 12, are responsible for the examination. Becoming a professional hunter automatically makes you one of the most gifted members of society. Upon successful completion of the Hunter exam, a hunter license is given to you, and this gives you permission to travel anywhere in the world. They are also granted permission to partake in activities which are forbidden for ordinary people. An example of this would be to hunt for treasures or even animals. So our story begins with our protagonist Gon wanting to follow in his father's footsteps by becoming a professional hunter. This first arc of the series revolves around his journey to acquire his hunter license. Thankfully this arc is broken down into several easy to digest portions, which helps to break down and analyse the story as well as seeing the involvement of the different characters during each phase of the story. In the opening pages of the first chapter, a hunter is described as being fascinated by strange beasts, uncovering hidden treasures, exploring long forgotten mythical lands, and most notably having a desire to learn about the mysterious unknown. Someone who is enticed by the allure of being a hunter resides on an island named and shaped after a whale. We see Gon who is camouflaged under leaves trying to fish for the elusive master of the swamp. He is trying to catch this incredibly large fish because of a wager that he makes with his aunt. If he isn't able to catch this fish then he won't be given permission to take part in the hunter exam. One thing that we quickly learn about Gon is that he is incredibly ambitious, and he is willing to put in the work to progress towards his desire with very little delay. This introduction to his character tells us everything that we need to know. He feels strongly about partaking in the hunter exam. His determination leads him to catch this large fish which five men put together would find difficult to do. His aunt obviously never expected him to complete this task because she is reluctant for him to take part in the hunter exam. Her feelings of reluctance stem from the fact that she doesn't want Gon to follow in his father's footsteps, the very father who had abandoned Gon as a baby, in order to continue with his life as a professional hunter. The first chapter of the series has a pivotal moment that is omitted from the 2011 anime. This flashback introduces us to a character called Kite, who plays a very important role in a later arc. But aside from that, this moment also serves to introduce Gon to the concept of a hunter, as well as explaining how he knew that his father was a hunter. As well as this, we find out that Kite learnt everything that he knew about being a hunter from Gon's father. After teaching all of the basics about being a hunter to Kite, he gave him one final test, which is to find him. This is what leads Kite to Whale Island, and thus very briefly introduces his character into the series, as well as explaining the profound impact that he has on Gon's character at such an early stage in his life. Kite explains how Gon's father is a one-of-a-kind legendary hunter, how everyone pales in comparison to him. It is Kite who tells Gon that his father is still alive, and you can even go as far as to say that it is Kite who instills within Gon his desire to become a professional hunter, to follow in his father's footsteps. I definitely feel that this scene should not have been omitted from the 2011 anime. It is an excellent way to briefly introduce Kite's character into the series, and it makes his reintroduction during the Chimera and Dark even more impactful. Also, I think it is quite silly to omit a scene which is vital to understanding how Gon formed his desire to become a professional hunter. When Gon's aunt explains how his father had left him with her when he was just a baby, Gon's determination to become a hunter isn't wavered, as he tells her that being a hunter must be an important job, so much so that family comes second. His aunt is protective over him, and finds it difficult to accept that Gon wants to become just like his father, but Gon has no desire to live a simple life. He even explains that becoming a hunter isn't something that a weakling can do. Sure enough, throughout the series and even as early as this arc, we understand the life-threatening danger that is associated with becoming a hunter. Gon's goal to become a hunter also stems from a need that he has to actualise his full potential, knowing that he is the son of a legendary hunter, and learning about the legend of his father from the first professional hunter that we see in the series, Kite. All of these notable characters that have been introduced into Gon's life push him to begin his journey of growth and development. Knowing that he is the son of someone great not 
not only makes you want to see how far Gon can go, but it also builds a sense of anticipation as you look forward to the moment where Gon will finally meet his father again. But before all of this, he must first partake in the hunter exam to become a professional hunter. After beginning his journey and embarking onto a ship, he says goodbye to his aunt and tells her that he will return one day as a great hunter, but he is quickly grounded by the other applicants who are on the ship. They scold him for his bright-eyed optimism, stating that there are many people who aspire to become a hunter, but out of these several hundred applicants, there are only a handful that are accepted. Not only is there no guarantee that you will become a professional hunter, there is also every chance that this exam is the last thing that you'll ever do. This is no longer a childish dream. He is immediately told not to get cocky and underestimate the difficulty of the task which lies ahead of him. And this is how Gon's journey to find his father and to become a professional hunter like him begins. After this initial introduction into the world of Hunter Hunter, we then begin the first phase of several phases of the hunter exam, the preliminary phase. It is said that the pass rate for the hunter exam is less than one in a hundred thousand. This incredibly low pass rate is highlighted during Gon's first night on the boat. There is a huge storm that tosses around most of the applicants, resulting in them being injured or even becoming seasick. The captain of the boat, who seems to be screening the applicants in this very early stage, explores his ship to realize that only three candidates are still able to move. One of them is of course Gon, and the other two we learn are Kurapika and Leorio. Gon further proves why he is one of the best applicants on the ship, by predicting a storm that is bigger than the one from last night is on its way. This of course impresses the captain as he immediately realizes that this is Jin's son. He further assesses Gon's suitability as a hunter by asking him the size of the storm and when he thinks they will hit it. When Gon answers him with precise details of when the storm will hit, the captain realizes that he didn't just make a lucky guess. When the captain announces that there is going to be another storm which is twice the size of the one from last night, nearly all of the applicants leave the ship and sail back on lifeboats. Only three candidates remain and of course this is Gon, Kurapika and Leorio. Through the preliminary phase of the exam, we understand why only one in 100,000 applicants stay till the end and pass to become a hunter. Becoming a hunter is highly sought after. Most of the applicants didn't know that the hunter exam began as soon as they boarded the ship. And this proves to be true even for Kurapika and Leorio. When the captain asks the three remaining applicants on his ship why they want to become a hunter, Gon replies enthusiastically, as he obviously says that he wants to follow in his father's footsteps. But Kurapika and Leorio don't want to reveal their reasonings to someone who is just transporting them to the location of the exam. When the captain reveals that he is assessing their suitability as a hunter, each of them begin to reveal their reasonings and their purpose behind becoming a hunter. The driving motive for Kurapika's character is that he is the last of his clan, called the Kurta clan. He desires to become a hunter so that he can capture a group called the Phantom Troop. They are a villainous group that robbed the eyes of his people and killed the remaining members of his clan. As the only survivor of his clan, he desires revenge. The only way that he can do this is to become a blacklist hunter so that he can accept the A-ranked bounty that is placed on the Phantom Troop. His is a dark desire which may lead him to his death, but Kuripika reveals that he does not fear death. What he does fear is that his anger towards the Phantom Troop will lessen with each passing day, so he wants to waste as little time as possible with these fresh feelings of hatred in order to exact his revenge, an incredibly dark reason for becoming a hunter when it's compared against Gon's reasoning. As for Leorio's reasons for becoming a hunter, he initially says that it's because he wants a lot of money, but later in chapter 7, the real reason behind why he wants to become a hunter is revealed. His real reasoning is that he had lost a friend because he couldn't pay for his medical bills. Because of this, he had decided to become a doctor. He wants to help the sick and at the same time not charge them for his help. He feels that the medical bills that he couldn't pay for felt like a price had been placed onto his friend's life. To become a doctor also requires funding, so he desires to acquire a hunter license, which will make it easier for him to begin his studies. Kurapika, Gon and Leorio quickly become acquainted as they begin to help and look out for each other throughout the exam. When they reach land, they are advised by the captain of the ship to travel towards a pine tree which is on top of a hill, advising them that it is the best place to go to in order to locate the exam hall. None of the applicants were given the precise location of the exam hall, they were only told the general location of it. On their way to the pine tree, they travel through a village which appears to be deserted, and it is here that they are tested by the mind-boggling two-choice quiz. After passing this test, they are shown a path which will lead them to the navigators who will guide them to the exam hall. Without the help of the navigators, it is impossible to reach the location of the exam. It is their job to know where the exam is being held, because its location changes every year. And just like everything that has occurred thus far, they are tested once more by the navigators. Considering they haven't even arrived at the exam hall, they have already been put through their paces. Their navigators end up being a family of magical beasts called Kiriko. After passing their trial, they praise each of them, and in particular Gon, firstly for his speed and his perception, as well as his ability to distinguish the differences between the two Kiriko, which demonstrates the close bond that he shares with animals, a skill that is vital for an 
up and coming hunter to have. I mentioned previously that the odds of passing the hunter exam is 1 in 100,000. We now learn that the odds of an applicant actually reaching the exam hall is 1 in 10,000. Many applicants end up resitting the exam as it is very unlikely that they are going to pass on their first run. Apparently, once in every three years, a talented rookie does appear and ends up passing on the first run. But for most of the rookies and amateurs, they mentally crack under the pressure of the test. Most of them are so overwhelmed by the older veteran applicants that they never try to take the exam again. I mean, up until this point, we have seen how difficult the preliminary phase was, how applicants who may have been applying for the wrong reasons were weeded out during the preliminary phase, through the creative and varied screening process that occurred. The reason why so many people put themselves through the hunter exam is because of the perks that come with the hunter license. You are given access to enter almost every country. As well as this, after becoming a hunter, all available public resources are available at your disposal. Becoming a hunter is also very lucrative. Of the top 100 richest people in the world, 60 of them are hunters. So the hunter license gives people fame and fortune. Even the cost of a hunter license if you were to sell one would bring you back a very large sum of money. Kripika explains to Gon that the job of a hunter is to maintain order. And this is order in both society and in nature. He explains how there are low-life hunters who pursue bagging animals and searching for treasures. He describes them as being amateurs because they are contrasted with pro hunters who desire to preserve and protect nature. They locate historical artifacts, preserve endangered species, as well as tracking down and hunting wanted criminals. But to partake in the activities of a pro hunter requires a lot of skill and experience. And it is for this reason that the hunter exam is so rigorous. Although acquiring a hunter license will lead to a rewarding career, it will not be easy. In chapter five, they finally arrive at the location of the exam and meet the other applicants who all pass the screening process. Not too long after arriving, they are introduced to Hisoka the magician. He severs the arms of another applicant after he had bumped into him and not apologized. We learned that he had applied the year before and was even expected to pass the exam, but he was disqualified after he had attacked an examiner that he had disagreed with. He is considered to be the main antagonist of the hunter exam arc, and rightfully so as we are told that he had killed 20 applicants the previous year. Gon Kurapika and Leorio are advised to stay away from him. Before the first phase of the hunter exam begins, we are introduced to another key character who becomes central to the story of Hunter Hunter. Of course, I am talking about Killua, who is introduced in chapter 6. The hunter exam finally begins with 404 applicants successfully passing the initial screening process. The first phase of the exam begins as they are tasked to keep up with the examiner called Satots. He is their examiner of the first phase of the exam and he will guide them to the second phase. The applicants simply have to follow him. In chapter 6, Killua and Gon meet for the first time, realizing that they are both the same age, 12 years old. The first phase appears to be an endurance test as they have been running for 3 hours and have nearly covered 40 kilometers. Not knowing when they will reach their destination and only being given a simple order to follow their examiner, this also shows how mentally taxing this first phase of the exam is, as well as being physically tiring. Even after having run 60 kilometers, none of the applicants have dropped out so far, proving that this 1 in 10,000 that have survived up until this point are the best of the best. After about 80 kilometers, they approach a set of stairs that they are forced to climb. Gradually, as time is elapsing, the examiner is picking up the pace, and he does so as they all start climbing up the stairs. As they approach the halfway mark of the stairs, 37 individuals have dropped out so far. During this climb, Gon and Kilwa begin to be acquainted with each other, as Gon asks Kilwa why he is applying for the hunter exam. So far, we have had reasons for each of the main characters in the series, and we finally learn that Kilwa doesn't have a particular reason for applying. He was just interested with the exam and he heard that it was really difficult. He tells Gon that all of the challenges that he has faced during this exam so far have not really been that difficult. In exchange, Gon tells him his reasons for wanting to become a hunter. He explains how he had met Kite, and how Kite had told him many stories about his father. He had told Gon about the status of a triple star hunter, and said that his father would have been classed as one if he had bothered applying for it. A triple star hunter is the highest class of hunter. There are less than 10 in the world. The requirements for someone to attain this title include undertaking multiple activities which result in a global change, or if that person has discovered something of historical significance. Despite how impressive and experienced Kite appeared to be. Gon noted as a child that Kite seemed to be prouder of his father's achievements than of his own, and this is what made Gon decide that he was going to follow in his father's footsteps. I guess he wanted to become a man who others could be proud of. We also learn more about Kuripika and his desire to track down the Phantom Troop during this portion of the Hunter exam. He explains that his clan was targeted because of their Scarlet Eyes. They are called Scarlet Eyes because his clan possesses a special trait. Their eyes turn into a deep scarlet colour when they are passionate or excited. Kuripika tells the that their eyes stay this scarlet colour when they die. He explains how this deep red colour is regarded as one of the most beautiful colours in the world. And this is the 
another reason why the Phantom Troop had targeted his clan and had stolen all of the eyes from all of their bodies. They were all killed for the byproduct of their death, the Scarlet Eyes. Kuropika clearly defines his motive to Leorio, telling him that he has sworn to capture the Phantom Troop, as well as recovering all of the eyes that were stolen from the dead bodies of his clan members. Becoming a hunter is one step of his plan. After he acquires his hunter license, doors will become open for him. He will be able to access the underworld where the wealthy and powerful exchange goods. We learn that Kuropika will sacrifice his own pride if it means that he can restore the dignity of his fallen clansmen. So far, out of all of the characters that I have seen, Kuropika's motive appears to be the most drawing element to the series. It pulls you into his quest for revenge, as well as looking forward to the introduction of the Phantom Troop later on in the series. As they approach the exit of the tunnel that the applicants have been running through for the past several hours, the examiner Satots explains that the next leg of the first phase will now begin. They will now be traversing through the Millsy wetlands. He warns them that this area is incredibly dangerous, because magical beasts inhabit this area, and they prey on humans in particular. All of the applicants that have made it this far acknowledge the dangers which lie ahead of them, and give their consent to proceed. They travel through a thick fog as several individuals are consumed by the magical beasts. During this segment of the first phase, Hisoka starts to develop a bloodlust. This causes him to take out several applicants. He declares that he is going to play examiner and decide who is worthy to proceed or not. Leorio challenges Hisoka head on and surprisingly Gon backs him up. He ends up knocking out Leorio and decides that he and Gon have passed his test. He does a complete 180 in mood. His face of sinister malice changes into a smile. As he squats down to Gon's eye level and tells him that he will grow up to become a fine hunter. This strange encounter occurs just before the ending of the first phase of the exam, as Hisoka carries a unconscious Leorio to the second phase. Sotots guides them to the location of the next phase. At this point, only 150 applicants remain. Sotots thinks to himself that this batch is exceptional, as he was expecting only 100 applicants to survive. He states that the next phase will be incredibly difficult, as he predicts that only 50 or less may survive at the end of it. The theme of the second phase of the hunter exam is cooking, as the applicants are introduced to their examiners who are gourmet hunters. They are considered to be world class chefs. They travel the world in order to search for rare cuisine, and to acquire exotic ingredients for their food. For the second phase, they are tasked with preparing a dish for each of the two gourmet hunters, Menchi and Buhara. The applicants are told that they will only pass the second phase if they are able to satisfy each of them. Once the two of them can no longer eat, the testing period will be over. So not only is this a test to make a appetizing dish, it is also under time conditions. They need to be quick to prepare their dishes before the other applicants satiate the hunger of the examiners. Buhara's dish of choice is roasted pig. They are unaware that the only pig around them is one of the most dangerous pigs in the world. They have been tasked to capture and cook this dangerous pig for the examiner. Gon and a few of the other applicants easily complete this task and satisfy the first examiner. But then the second phase becomes difficult when Menchi asks the applicants to make her sushi, which is a dish that none of them have heard of. This proves to be too difficult as all of the remaining applicants fail her test. Menchi is a single star hunter. She is one of the world's most famous chefs, and she is incredibly difficult to please. She also describes herself as a very harsh critic. For the final half of the second phase, only 70 individuals remain, and unfortunately Menchi decides that they have all failed. This is until the chairman of the Hunter Association intervenes. Chairman Netro convinces her to change the dish that she had selected, and he even advises for her to partake in the test, so that she can set an example for the applicants. So instead of making sushi, she has change the test to boiling an egg. They are tasked to locate an egg from a spider eagle, who lays the nests within deep ravines. By the end of this revised portion of the second phase, only 42 candidates remain. A lot of the applicants underestimated the skills that were required for a gourmet chef, but this portion of the exam serves to teach the applicants not to underestimate a gourmet chef. They certainly possess all of these skills and qualities that are required of a hunter, but the difference is that they specialize in cuisine. And through this portion of the exam, it is explained how difficult a gourmet hunter's job is, as they must traverse through unexplored, dangerous locations in the pursuit of exotic ingredients with undiscovered tastes. This phase of the hunter exam is considered one of the longer, more dragged out segments of the hunter exam arc. But personally, I didn't mind it, as it helped to explain the significance of all the different types of hunters, and in particular, focusing on gourmet hunters. The Examiners have all stated that this batch of applicants has some real contenders to pass. They note that a few candidates appear to possess powerful auras. Giving Hisoka as an example, 
because he is exuding an aura of bloodlust. During the downtime between the second phase and the third phase, we learn that Killua comes from a family of assassins. He opens up to Gon as a friendship begins to form between the two of them. His family appears to have high expectations of him, but he has no desire to live up to these expectations, as he would much rather decide on his own future, and make decisions based on himself rather than on their expectations. During the conversation between the two of them, Chairman Netero approaches the two of them. He offers to play a game with them, and if they win then he will issue their licenses immediately, without the need to partake in further phases of the Hunter exam. The rules to this game at midnight are simple. All Gon and Killua have to do is to take the ball away from Chairman Netero before the ship that they are on reaches its destination. While everybody else is resting, Gon and Killua are pushing their bodies to their very limits against the Chairman. Killua frustratingly tries his best but to no avail. Gon is then tagged in and attempts to take the ball away from Netero. During the entirety of this game, the Chairman is assessing the potential of both of them. He is impressed by their level of skill and even surprised by some of their manoeuvres, but he also mentally critiques them, as he says that despite their level of skill, they appear to still be immature. In Chapter 14, several hours of this game have already passed, as Gon and Killua now decide to attack the Chairman at once, displaying his level of skill and the room for growth and improvement that Gon and Killua have yet to undergo. He evades the two of them and prevents them from getting the ball. Killua appears to be getting frustrated, because every tactic that the two of them have applied doesn't seem to work against him. Even when it appears that they have outsmarted Netero and they are about to have the ball within their grasp, he demonstrates his incredible speed and agility by getting to the ball before the two of them. Killua ends up conceding, much to Gon's surprise, as he realises that Netero hasn't even used his right hand or his left leg, stating that even if the two of them played this game with Netero for a whole year, they would be no closer to getting the ball from him. During this scene, a difference is highlighted between the two boys. Killua assumes that Gon is also going to concede victory and leave with him, but Gon decides to stay. Killua of course thinks that it is pointless and he is angered by Gon's response, but Gon tells him that even if he cannot get the ball from him, then there is still every chance that Netero might use his right hand. It might not be a complete victory, but it is a small victory, which is enough motive for Gon to continue without giving up. It is this bright-eyed optimism that Killua is always surprised by, and this is the first in several occasions where Killua looks at Gon wide-eyed and surprised. During the series, we realise that Gon's positivity and optimism is essential to the growth of Killua's character, as we learn that there are darker aspects to his life. As he spends more time with Gon and is exposed to his attitude more, he begins to change as a character himself, distancing himself from his roots as an assassin. But as of this moment, during the Hunter exam arc, this character growth is far from being actualised, because after Killua had left Gon and Netro to continue their game, out of frustration he killed two other applicants. This 12 year old, who acts like an unassuming child with Gon, seems to have a devilish alter ego. He admits to himself that if he had continued playing with Netro, then he would have wanted that ball bad enough to kill for it. Meanwhile, Gon continues use the game with Netero, as he utilises feints and misdirection in order to make Netero use his right hand. Through his persistence, Gon eventually succeeds in making Netero use his right hand. He is overjoyed but his celebrations are cut short as he collapses. Of course, he does all of this after partaking in the preliminaries, the first phase and the second phase of the Hunter exam. After resting, they eventually arrive at their destination where the third phase of the Hunter exam will take place. They have landed on top of a tall structure called Trick Tower, and for the third phase of the exam, they are tasked to reach the bottom of the tower alive, and they have 72 hours to do this in. At the beginning of the third phase, only 40 candidates remain. Gon teams up with Killua, Kurapika, Leorio and Tompa. They form a five-person group. The examiner for this phase of the exam is called Lippo. He is a blacklist hunter. He is also a prison warden, and he has offered to shorten the sentences of criminals by one year for every hour that they are able to stall the contestants. He aims to examine the candidates in group situations. He wants to see how they react while working with others. The first test that they encounter during this phase is to battle as a group. In order to pass, they have to win three out of the five battles that they are going to face against different tower prisoners. They are allowed to battle in whatever way suits them best. During these battles, there can be no draws. The only way to win is to either defeat the opponent or make your opponent admit defeat. Tompa goes first, but he immediately gives up. Tompa is of course making it very difficult for the group, and Leorio is losing his patience with him. During this phase of the test, they are being tested on how well they can work together as a group. Tompa is of course purposefully sabotaging their efforts and holding them back, but they have to remember to work as a team even if one of them is not a team player. Gon is up next and he is challenged by his opponent to see whose candle can burn the longest. When he realises that the prisoner had cheated and gave Gon a candle that would burn quicker, Gon uses his initiative and blows out his opponent's candle, and thus winning his match. Kurapika is up next, but he 
easily defeats his opponent who pretends to be a member of the Phantom Troop with a fake tattoo on his back. During this battle, we see Kuropika's scarlet eyes for the first time. He defeats his opponent in one strike and proves that his feelings of anger towards the Phantom Troop are still very fresh. One thing to note about Kuropika's battle is that it was a fight to the death. According to the rules, the only way to win is to either kill your opponent or to make them admit defeat. Kuropika technically hadn't won yet after that first strike, since his opponent wasn't killed and he hadn't admitted defeat. Kuropika refuses to kill his opponent or to attack him any further. He says that his opponent had received enough of a beating, and to attack him any more would have been senseless brutality. During this moment, we can see that Kuropika has a strong sense of right and wrong. His sense of morality prevents him from behaving in a dishonourable way, but we do see a glimpse of the anger that he holds towards the Phantom Troop during this encounter. It makes you wonder how he will react if you were to come across a member of the Phantom Troop. We also learn that Kuropika isn't afraid of killing anyone, but at this moment in time he hasn't ever killed in his life. While Gon and his group wait for Kuropika's opponent to revive himself, Hisoka is declared as the first person to pass the third phase of the exam, and he had done so within 6 hours and 17 minutes. Kuropika's opponent eventually admits defeat while Leorio is placing bets with his opponent. Leorio loses his match and he loses all of their betting hours on her. Because of Leorio's terrible betting, 50 hours have now been deducted from the group. Because of this, they have less than 10 hours to pass the third phase of the Hunter exam. Killua is up next and it is revealed that he is fighting against John S, the Dissector. He is revealed as being a terrible mass murderer. He had apparently killed 146 people. He had dissected his victims to such an extent that it was difficult to clear the murder scene of all of the small pieces. He had even killed children as young as 11. He was given the name Dissector because all of his victims were cut up in no less than 50 pieces. He had apparently done all of this with his bare hands. Killua's opponent is hyped up as this evil, unstoppable force. Leorio even tells Killua not to fight him, and that he won't be angry with Killua if they fail the third phase of the exam. Killua ignores these warnings and fearlessly approaches his opponent. He asks John S if there are any conditions for their battle, but the criminal is only concerned with tearing Killua's body up into pieces with his bare hands. Killua gathers that he wants a fight to the death. He immediately demonstrates his skills as an assassin as he rips out the heart of his opponent. For the first time, everybody sees how violent Killua really is, while he crushes the heart of his opponent while he begs for it back. Everybody, including the prisoners, appear to be shocked by this. They all wonder who Killua really is, but Gon explains that he is a member of an elite assassin family. What's funny is that Gon doesn't say anything to Killua about the brutal way that he had killed his opponent. He just simply moves on unfazed by what just happened. The final test of the third phase, they meet a fork in the road, where they have to decide between two paths. One path is incredibly long and the other is incredibly short, but the short path will only allow three of the five to pass. The group only have one hour remaining in their time. They are told that the long path will take at least 45 hours to complete, while the short path will take about three minutes. This difficult choice is decided by Gon when he tells everybody to choose the long path. They then break the wall between the two paths and take the shorter path, leading them to victory and thus completing the third phase of the Hunter exam. Gon's quick thinking and intuition has helped him to get through a lot of situations during the Hunter exam, so at the end of the third phase, only 25 applicants remain. They are told that they have yet to face another two phases of the Hunter exam before it is concluded. The fourth phase involves a manhunt which is taking place on Zevil Island. The 25 applicants are all given plates with numbers on them. These plates with numbers on them will decide who will hunt who. In chapter 24, we learn that Gon has been ordered to hunt Hisoka and to steal his badge. He spends most of his time following Hisoka and coming up with a strategy to steal his badge. The candidates have to remember that while they are hunting, someone else is hunting them. The remaining 20 25 who are partaking in the fourth phase have been whittled down to the best who have the closest chances of becoming a hunter. None of them are to be underestimated. Gon uses his time to think of a way to use his fishing rod to take Hisoka's badge. The issue is Hisoka has a lot of speed and power that Gon has to find a way to overcome. He tries to perfect his aim before he confronts his target. What I like about this phase compared to the last one is that all of the candidates have to work on their own. Gon could have easily teamed up with Leorio, Kuropika and Killua and they could have got their badges working as a team, but they proved themselves by working alone trying to accomplish the task that's been given to them. The task is also set up in a way that it is difficult to work as a group, because one of the members who you've been working in a group with may now have become your target during this phase. Gon figures out that the best way to take Hisoka's badge is to wait for him to be distracted.
distracted. He needs to time his attack perfectly so that he can successfully steal the badge. During this phase, we learn that Hisoka only kills individuals that he deems worthy. He doesn't like to kill individuals who he feels are yet to reach their full potential. He feels that it is wasteful to kill them so prematurely, and this is why he doesn't kill Kurapika and Leorio when he confronts them. His encounter with Leorio and Kurapika causes him to develop an intense bloodlust. His aura is so strong that it scares away all of the animals around him, and it is enough for even Gon to notice, which causes him to tremble in fear. When Hisoka is lost in his own bloodlust while he attacks an unassuming applicant, Gon takes advantage of Hisoka being distracted as he quickly snipes his badge. But while Gon is trying to escape from Hisoka, he is targeted himself by Gareta, who is after his badge. He ends up paralyzing Gon to take his badge, but Hisoka intervenes and kills Gareta. He explains to Gon that the effects of the poison that was used to immobilize him takes about 10 days to relieve. Hisoka returns Gon's badge to him, but Gon refuses to take it. Despite having a toxin in his blood, which should have him paralyzed for 10 days, Gon gets up determined not to accept Hisoka's charity. He doesn't want to owe Hisoka anything, and for this reason he tries to return his badge back to Hisoka. He tells Gon that he didn't kill him because he wanted to see him grow up and to become stronger. He desires to battle Gon once he is a worthy opponent, not right now while he is still growing and developing. To knock the stubbornness out of Gon, Hisoka punches him and tells him that if he can return a punch like that back to him, only then will he take Gon's badge back. This is a very interesting interaction between the two of them. Hisoka forces Gon to take his badge back and awaits for the day that Gon can return the punch back to him. We can assume that this is a hanging plot thread which is setting up another encounter between the two of them in the future. Despite how talented and gifted Gon is, and how far he has made it through the hunter exam, his talents and skills are no match for a hunter like Hisoka. He still has a very long way to go. It is humbling to see him being beat down despite all of the victories that he has had up until this point. Gon eventually meets with Kurapika and Leorio and helps Leorio to acquire the badge from his target. At the end of the fourth phase, it appears that only nine candidates remain, and out of the nine, it appears that six of them are newcomers who are sitting the exam for the first time. During the time between the fourth phase and the fifth phase, Gon reveals to Kurapika that he was upset that he wasn't able to repay Hisoka by punching him back. Gon says that he was feeling alone and that he wanted someone next to him, and it is for this reason that he went looking for Kurapika and Leorio, but he thanks Gon because if it wasn't for him then they wouldn't be here. His help was invaluable to them during the final moment moments of the fourth phase. Kuripika reassures Gon that he does indeed have the strength to go on, despite him not being able to repay Hisoka by punching him back. Before the final phase of the hunter exam begins, Chairman Netero holds a conversation with each of the remaining applicants. He asks each of them among the other candidates who holds the most of their attention, as well as asking who is it that they would want to fight the least. These questions help to summarize the relationships that are formed between the different characters. It also helps to solidify any ideas of friendships or rivalries which have been formed between them. Hisoka is asked first, and he responds by saying of all of the contestants he is most interested in Gon and Killua, and at the same time he is least interested in fighting the both of them. And this is because he doesn't want to fight them just yet, but rather at a time in the future when they are stronger and become worthy opponents. And going over the other characters of interest, Killua says that Gon interests him the most. Gon responds by saying that Hisoka interests him the most, while also saying that the people he would least want to fight are Killua, Kurapika, and Leorio, proving that a friendship or a bond is formed between the four of them. A lot of the contestants appear to be fearful or not desiring to fight Hisoka. Kurapika is among them, and he says that the candidate who holds most of his attention is Gon. And lastly, Leorio adds a lot of meaningful commentary behind why Gon has held most of his attention, and he says that it is because he respects him, and he would like for Gon to make it all the way to the end of the exam and to finally become a hunter. And he says that the person he would least want to fight is Gon, because of the feelings of respect that he has for him. So in chapter 33, three days after the end of the fourth round, the final phase of the hunter exam begins. This final phase will involve one-on-one -on -one duels between all of the contestants. The difference with this one-on-one -on -one duel system is that if you have one victory then you will have passed the exam. This is an inversion of the regular tournament system when typically a winner moves on to the next round, eventually until there is only one person remaining. With the way that this pyramid system is organized there will only be one loser while all of the others will have won. Netero must have been impressed with this batch of candidates as he didn't want to get rid of a lot of them as he felt that most of them were worthy enough to become hunters. Netro had decided that the people who were favoured the most from his round of questioning had the most chances of winning. Killua compares his position in the brackets to Gon, as he wonders what is it that he is lacking that made him place lower than Gon. There appears to be only one rule, that you are not allowed to kill your opponent, and if this is to occur then the person who has killed their opponent will be disqualified, and in this case the exam will be over, causing the remaining applicants to automatically pass the exam. In chapter 33 the first battle begins between Hanzo and Gon. Hanzo appears 
appears to have the upper hand as he is beating down Gon, trying to get an admission of defeat from him. Gon is completely outmatched, but he is unwilling to quit. For three hours, he beats down and tortures Gon, trying to make him give up. But despite how badly he is being beaten, he continues to get back up, and this shocks Hanzo. Even after Hanzo threatens to break Gon's arm, he still does not admit defeat. Hanzo's actions have infuriated Yorio and even Kurapika, who is usually reserved. During this battle, Gon is made to face the difference between him and Hanzo. Even Killua acknowledges the difference between Hanzo and Gon. In a typical shonen, the protagonist would have found a way to overcome their obstacle. But in this moment, Gon is made to realize that no matter what he does during this battle, he will not close the gap between him and Hanzo. But despite the difference in their experience and their strength, Gon does not give up and he is determined in the face of death. He is not willing to say I quit, and he would rather fearlessly die than to say it. The reason why Gon is so stubborn is because he says that he wants to meet his father. He truly believes that one day he will be able to meet him, but if he loses here, he believes that he won't be able to see him, and it is for this reason that he will not go back on his word. This demonstrates that whatever decision you make, big or small, will either lead you towards or take you away from your goal. It would be easy for Gon to just give up here, as he has plenty of chances to redeem himself in the upcoming fights, but he does not want to admit defeat because that is not the way that he wants to present himself in front of his father. Gon's stubborn determination leads to Hanzo forfeiting the match and automatically making Gon the first person to pass the 287th Hunter exam. And this is because he can't kill Gon and he can't find a way of making him admit defeat. So instead, he just decides to wait for his next match in the bracket. Gon is knocked out by Hanzo for continuing to be stubborn and he doesn't wake up until after the final phase of the exam is over. He learns of some upsetting news that Killua didn't pass the exam and this is because he had killed his opponent. Another notable event that occurs is when Hisoka is matched up with Kurapika. He whispers something into Kurapika's ear and then he voluntarily quits. We can assume that whatever he tells him is related to his desire for revenge. During Killua's battle with his opponent, it is revealed that one of the candidates had been disguised and he was in fact Killua's older brother. After he reveals his true identity, it shocks him. His brother reveals to him that he should have no desire of his own as he is a puppet. He wasn't born to be a hunter, but instead he was born to be a killer. Killua reveals that he didn't come here to become a hunter and like he had mentioned previously, Previously, he took the exam because he thought it was difficult, but after going through the exam, he decides that there is something that he wants. He wants to become friends with Gon. He is fed up with killing and he just desires a friendship. He doesn't want to be an assassin, he desires to be a normal child. Illumi tries to convince him that if he spends enough time with Gon, then he will kill him. Once again, trying to convince him that he was born as a killer, Illumi decides that after he passes the exam, he is going to kill Gon. Killua is left with no choice but to fight his brother. If he doesn't defeat him, then Gon's life is in danger. It appears that Killua has instant of survival instilled within him. His cautiousness that was instilled within him from his brother results in him not facing off against very powerful opponents. Killua is so afraid of fighting his brother that he admits defeat and as a result of not confronting his brother, puts Gon's life in danger. Illumi continues to make Killua lose all of his confidence, ordering that he will now continue to listen to him and his father. He restricts Killua by saying the only thing that he has to do in his life is to listen to his orders and the only way that he will pass the hunter exam is if his brother guides him. This encounter with his brother causes causes Killua to close up. After this encounter, he doesn't speak to Leorio or Kurapika, despite how hard they are trying to talk to him. We learn later, during Leorio's battle with Bordoro, Killua intervened and killed Bordoro. Killua was disqualified as these events lead to the end of the exam. Out of anger, Gon confronts Alumi, and this is the first time that we've seen this side to his character. It is an intense, unforgiving anger. He demands that Alumi apologizes to Killua. His anger causes him to grab Killua's older brother by the wrist and pull him out of his seat. He intensely grips his wrist to the point that he breaks it. Gon is determined to bring Killua back, so he finds out his home address from Illumi. He even ends up threatening him. If Illumi has been manipulating Killua this whole time to kill people not of his own choice, then he will not forgive him. We can see that Gon is very protective over his friends, as he demands Illumi to tell him where Killua's home is. We learn that Killua has returned to his family home in Kukuru Mountain. The hunter exam ends with Gon learning that the hunter license that Kite had left behind had belonged to his father. We also learn that Gon's father is considered to be an exceptional person, someone who has been registered as a top secret individual, preventing other hunters from digging up information about him. People who are of equivalent importance who are registered in the top secret files are considered to be presidents and people with incredible fortunes, and Jin Freaks is among these people. There is plenty of mystery to be revealed, and Gon's hunt for his father is just beginning. But for now, he is accompanied by Kurapika and Leorio, leading on to the next arc of the series, where they must find Killua and bring him back. What I loved about the hunter exam arc is that characters were facing off against opponents who are far stronger than them. And typically in shonen series, the solution is usually to overcome the opponent by becoming stronger or relying on the power of friendship to cause a surge in power. But in Hunter x Hunter, instead characters figure out a way to overcome their obstacles. I mentioned this previously.
previously, and I can use Gon as an example. How his determination with Hanzo led to his opponent giving up, or how he strategically came up with a way to steal Hisoka's badge. And that is something that I have to praise about Hunter x Hunter, and especially during this arc. Throughout this arc, you are rooting for the newcomers and the rookies to succeed. And indeed, the rookies are some of the best applicants to have entered in the exam. At the beginning of the arc, it is hard to interpret this ratio of 1 in 100,000 succeed to become a hunter. But by the end of the arc, you truly understand how hard it is. Even before you get to the exam hall, there is a rigorous screening process. And then not to mention the exam itself, which has five phases, which appear to be never ending. Each task serving to push the candidates to their absolute limits. I loved that this arc didn't have a typical tournament. Each phase felt very creative. I felt that each phase served to introduce to you an aspect of a hunter through the various different examiners who were overseeing their phases. I loved seeing the applicant numbers decrease with each passing phase, wondering how many are going to be left after this phase. What made the drop in applicants between each phase feel realistic was that during the phase we see applicants either being killed or being eliminated. I mentioned this because the hunter exam was hyped up to be a difficult exam, and through all of these different aspects it proved to be a difficult exam. During this arc I felt that the exam served its purpose, to push the characters to their very limits. Through this difficult and arduous trial we see some friendships that have been formed, in particular between Kurapika, Leorio, Gon and Killua. It's great to see how they are first introduced to each other, how Leorio and Kurapika were fighting with each other, and then during the fourth phase we see Kurapika actively helping Leorio to find his target badge. In other instances we see the bond that is formed between the characters when an injustice occurs to one of their friends. In particular when Hanzo is beating down Gon, Kurapika and Leorio are both very angered by this. We also see Killua refer to Gon as his friend, clearly highlighting the impact that Gon has had on all of their lives. When Chairman Netro plays that game with Killua and Gon, you can see that he sees a lot of potential in two of them. Now if this was a typical shonen, Netro would have ended up training Gon and Killua, but instead of relying on him to train them, they are left to their own devices to grow and develop. There is this promise of them growing to become very strong. We see it hinted at here and we see it blatantly told to us by Hisoka, as he doesn't want to kill either Gon or Killua because he thinks that they are going to grow up to become incredibly strong, and he only wants to fight them once they become worthy opponents. So when it comes to discussing the characters in this arc, I love Gon's introduction. His bright-eyed optimism and his desire feels well established. I believe in his dream to meet his father and I love the early interactions that he has with Kite. We are aware that he is incredibly gifted and talented, but through his encounters with strong individuals, we clearly see that he has a long way yet to go. I mentioned this at the start of the video, that there is more to Gon than his bright-eyed positivity. We see hints of this darker side to his character when his anger overwhelms him after he learns what had happened to Killua, when he grabs hold of Illumi in search for an apology and for Killua's whereabouts. Another aspect of his character that I had fallen in love with was his determination. Maybe it's because I love shonen stories, but I loved how realistic his portrayal of stubbornness was, how he didn't want to accept charity from Hisoka, how he was beaten for three hours by Hanzo and still didn't admit defeat, and how at the end of the hunter exam arc he doesn't want to accept his hunter license. Despite everybody telling him that he had earned it fair and square, he still refuses to use it. Moving on to Gon's counterpart in this arc, Killua. When you see the two of them hanging around and behaving like children, you would not expect that Killua is the complete opposite to Gon, the way that he mercilessly kills people. And when you learn that he comes from a family of assassins, Killua is incredibly scary and he is a great contrast to Gon's character. There is still a lot of mystery to him and his family background. He clearly wants to disassociate himself with his family in order to pursue his own passions and dreams. Some of the mystery behind him and his family is revealed in the next arc, as we understand more about how he is being manipulated by his older brother, and his feelings of hesitation and anxiousness when he faces off against a strong opponent. Next up, Kurapika has easily become one of my favourite characters from this arc. He has a very reserved personality and he reminds me a lot of Kurama from Yu Yu Hakusho. His reasoning for partaking in the hunter exam for revenge feels very convincing, and I love the personality of his character, how he is kind to those that he considers his friends, but he immediately switches when the Phantom Troop are mentioned. Unlike all of the other characters that I have mentioned, he has a very strong and distinctive personality. What I noticed is that he is a very capable individual, and he is strong enough to hold his own during the hunter exam arc, but instead he chooses to hang around with Leorio, Gon and Killua, clearly showing that he enjoys their company. There is more to his character than this obsession with revenge, and seeing him reveal his scarlet eyes is one of the most memorable moments during this arc. And lastly I'm mentioning Leorio, who serves as some comedic relief. He is very reactionary and is easily angered. I still wonder how on earth he made it all the way to the end of the exam and became a hunter. He isn't the coolest character to feature within this arc, but he is definitely the most outspoken. And I liked his reasoning for wanting to become a hunter. He had initially tried to convince us that it was for the money, but we quickly learned that he needs the money for the right reasons. It's interesting that everybody has a different reason for wanting to become a hunter. Some 
something that is unique to their own character. Not only this, the whole concept of a hunter is thoroughly fleshed out during this arc. There are so many mentions of the different types of hunters, as well as explaining what the successful candidates will be able to do with their hunter licenses. We get a little bit of world building and we get to understand how the world of Hunter Hunter works. We don't understand everything entirely, but it is definitely a great start. I feel like there is so much about the Hunter exam arc that I missed during my first run through of the series. I can now appreciate it as one of the best introductory arcs to any shonen. It succeeded in subverting my expectations. I quickly learned that strength and power isn't the most defining element during a battle in Hunter x Hunter. A lot of importance is given to strategy, utilizing your skill set in a creative manner to take down your opponent. As well as this, we learned that the series doesn't pull its punches. If a character is determined and faces off against an opponent, then they will feel their full wrath. There are consequences to punching above your height. This is seen through Gon being beat down by Hisoka and Hanzo. Because of the protagonist being a child, you might assume that Hunter x Hunter is childish or light-hearted. But from my read-through of the Hunter exam arc, I believe that it is anything but light-hearted. This arc makes me question the morality of the Hunter Association. How on earth are they able to run an exam which allows applicants to be killed? And how are they okay with people passing the exam who have killed others? I know that Killua was disqualified right at the end of the exam, but I always think to myself, how was he not disqualified earlier between phases 3 to 4, when he had killed those two applicants randomly, because he was frustrated that he wasn't able to get that ball from Netero. To give my final thoughts of the Hunter exam arc, the second phase of the exam was probably my least favourite aspect of the arc, while the fourth phase of the exam was my favourite. This is because of the tension that was building while Gon was following Hisoka, and how it all built up to him successfully stealing Hisoka's badge. I've said it before, the Hunter exam arc is a really good introductory arc. It does well to introduce and flesh out characters, and it serves its purpose to introduce us to the world of Hunter x Hunter while also explaining to us the concept of hunters. In this video, I'll be going over the very short second arc of the series, called the Zoldic Family Arc, while taking the opportunity to really understand Killua's family who are introduced to us during this arc. So like the first video of this series, I'll be aiming to break down the story events and see the character progression and try to understand the new concepts that are introduced to us by Togashi. So let's get into it, my breakdown, analysis and review of the Zoldic Family Arc. The Zordic family arc begins in chapter 39 and ends in chapter 43. It picks up from the end of the Hunter exam arc with Gon, Kurpika and Yorio deciding to go on a new adventure to rescue their friend Killua. He has returned to his family home in Kukuru Mountain after failing the Hunter exam for killing his opponent during the final phase of the exam. During this arc, we see the trio of characters, Yorio, Kurapika and Gon, build upon their friendships that they had formed during the first arc and see how they work together to overcome their obstacles in order to see their friend Killua. It is made aware to us that not many people would call someone from the Zordic family a friend. Understandably, because they are a family of assassins, over the years they have built a reputation for themselves. Killua, who is supposed to be the next heir to the family, refuses to allow his family to decide how he should live his life and what he should become. He, of course, had no choice whether if he wanted to enter into the Hunter exam. He had attacked his sibling and his mother in order to escape from his family home. He does all of this just for the sake of making a decision on his own. He wanted to sit the exam because he thought it was difficult, and he wanted to experience this difficulty for himself, and to have the freedom of making a choice on his own. His decision to enter into the Hunter exam was probably the first ever choice that he had made for himself, without any outside input from his family. It is no secret that Killua is a very gifted child. His talent and his level of skill makes for him to be a very promising candidate for the future head of the Zordic family. But as we learn during this arc, the friendships that he has formed mean more to him than his destiny and the expectations of his parents to be the next heir to the Zordic family. So now let's start by breaking down the story with chapter 39, where we see Gon, Kurapika and Leorio travel towards Kukuru Mountain. We see them use various different forms of travel, the first being a mixture between a blimp and a plane, and we even see them commuting on a train later. On this train they have their first glimpse of the mountain where Killua's family resides. It appears to have a foreboding and creepy aura, which is to be expected from the headquarters of a famous assassin family. We can see that Leorio and Kurapika are strategizing and fearing for the worst, but Gon is pretty carefree and he assumes that they are only going to see their friend, it's no big deal. Despite being told some history about Killua's past from Killua himself, I don't think Gon appreciates Killua's situation until the end of this arc. We will see later on in this video how Gon's determination is put to the test, through the various trials that he faces in order to prove himself as a true friend to Killua. As well as this, he is tested to see if he is worthy enough to be around Killua. The people around Killua are very protective over him and don't want him to be associated with anyone weak or someone who will bring him down or not look out for his best interests. After arriving 
at their destination and asking about the Zordic family's residence, they go on a bus tour which will take them to Kukuru Mountain. We learn that Kukuru Mountain is in fact a dormant volcano. It reaches 12,000 feet in height and is surrounded by a very thick forest. This is where Killua and his family live. The Zordic family is made up of Killua and his five siblings, his parents and his grandparents and his great grandfather. All of them aside from Killua are assassins. The entrance to the Zordic residence is closed off by a gate called the Door to Hades. It is called this because people who tend to go in never come back out. Gon and the others meet the gatekeeper who works for the Zordic family. His name is Zebro and he is employed by the Zordic family to clean up after a monstrous guard dog called Mike, who devours trespassers who dare to go near the Zordic residence. Zebro reveals that there are two gates which lead to the Zordic family's front yard. Don't confuse this front yard as a patch of grass. The Zordic family's front yard is acres upon acres of forest. The main passageway into this forest is through the testing gate, where the strength of an individual is put to the test, as they must push open a total of four tons to even enter into the estate. Most arrogant individuals who are looking to claim the bounty of the Zordic family harass the gatekeeper for a key, which will allow them entrance to the side door. But this is where the Zordic family's guard dog devours the people. Mike the guard dog has been trained not to devour individuals who have passed through the testing gate. Zebro isn't really a gatekeeper. His real job is to clean up the mess that Mike makes after he eats trespassers. The testing gate serves a purpose to keep out those who are unworthy to enter. If you are unable to push open the level 1 door to the testing gate, which weighs 4 tons, then you have no business going to the Zordic residence. I love Hunter x Hunter for the way that it humbles the characters within the series, through these various different situations. Even after passing the Hunter exam, they are unable to open this gate. It is the first crash back down to reality after passing the Hunter exam that the characters face. Even after acquiring their Hunter license, their journey of growth is far from being over. Thankfully, Zebro is able to open the first level of the testing gate. We learn that as the level of the gate increases, the weight doubles. When Killua had returned, he was able to open up to the third level of the testing gate, which weighed a total of 16 tons, proving that Killua, who is just a 12-year-old boy, has far more to him than meets the eye, while also demonstrating that his strength at least far exceeds that of Gon and the others. Gon is pretty simplistic, and he doesn't like the way that the Zordic family conducts themselves. He doesn't want to go through all of these tests just so that he could see his friend. Understandably, this is far from the warm welcome that anyone would expect from visiting their friend. For the sake of seeing Killua, he doesn't mind entering through the side door, where he risks being eaten by Mike. He would rather be an intruder than to be tested to see his friend. The others disagree with Gon because taking a test is much better than committing suicide. As well as this, Zebro refuses to give Killua's friends the key to the side door. Gon eventually loses his patience and, using his fishing rod, tries to climb the wall. This pushes Zebro to be left with no choice. He offers to accompany the three of them through the testing gate. After seeing Gon's determination for himself, he decides that he is passionate and steadfast in his own desires. Gon is the type of person who will remain loyal to his friends. His kind-hearted nature allows him to sacrifice a lot for the sake of others. Zebro is confident that Gon, Kurapika and Yorio working together can handle just about anything, and it is for this reason that he allows them to enter through the testing gate, and he accompanies them also. After entering, they immediately meet Mike, and they understand that he is a highly trained animal. He is unlike any of the animals that Gon would have encountered during his childhood in the wild. After looking into Mike's eyes, Gon realizes that he is unable to communicate with him. He only follows the orders from the Zordic family. He is like a machine. Mike shows little to no interest in anything but following his orders. Gon concludes that Mike is indeed terrifying, and he would prefer not to get on the animal's bad side. Zebro, who is continuing to evaluate Gon's personality, also notes that he is honest from this response. He takes the trio to the servants' quarters, where they discover that everything from the doors to the slippers and cups are all weighted. They have been purposefully designed that way so that individuals constantly work out while they stay there. Zebro recommends for the three of them to train while they stay in the servants' quarters. He doesn't recommend that they climb Kukuru Mountain until they are able to open the testing gate themselves. He suggests that if they were to train there for one month, then they would be able to open up the first level of the testing gate. The three of them agree to this proposal. Despite Gon saying that he doesn't like tests, they don't see any other alternative or any other fair way with continuing to progress up Kukuru Mountain. They have to at least meet the minimum requirements that the Zordic family require. They are honouring this benchmark as they begin their training with weighted vests. At the end of chapter 40, we appear to have a two-week time skip, where we see Gon, Kurepika and Niorio all open up the testing gate after only two weeks of training. This of course impresses Zebro, as he considers them to be real contenders who are worthy of meeting the Zordic family. In chapter 41, Zebro sees them off as they leave the servants' quarters, and they head towards the Zordic residence, hoping to meet Killua. Shortly after they set off, they meet a butler who works for the Zordic family. It appears that the family of assassins and the people who work for them are very powerful. The butlers who work 
stake for the Zordic family are not to be underestimated, as Gon, Kurapika and Leorio encounter a butler who requests for them to leave, telling them that trespassers are not welcome despite all three of them having successfully passed through the testing gate. But despite going through all of these lengths, the butlers didn't give them permission to enter, so they are deemed as trespassers on private property. Gon continues to be blunt and simple-minded and wonders how on earth are they able to get permission if, even after saying they were friends, they were not allowed to enter. The butler has no idea and has no way to properly answer Gon, and continues to define the three of them as trespassers, who must leave immediately. The butler draws a line across the ground and states that if any of them were to cross this line, then she will forcibly remove them from the property herself. Gon ignores this warning and, determined to see his friend, continues to walk on forward until he crosses the line. The butler keeps to a word and attacks Gon, pushing him back, but Gon gets back up, refusing help from Kurapika and Leorio, and he himself refuses to fight with the butler, because he didn't come here to fight anyone. He simply came to see his friend. The butler has no sympathy for Gon's ordeal, as she is simply following her orders. This is the next trial that the trio must overcome in order to progress up Kukuru Mountain. He repeatedly gets back up and walks across the line and gets attacked again and again. It appears that he's been doing this for hours on end. Once again, he shows his determination to meet Killua, as we see that his face has become very swollen after being repeatedly attacked. He refuses to fight back and he sticks to his word that he hasn't come here to fight. The butler sees the determination in Gon's face and sees the injuries that he has sustained for his purpose. She even begins to plead for him to leave, as it is even becoming too much for her to continue attacking her already beaten Gon. What I love about this scene is that Gon is displaying his monstrous determination that we've seen several times before. He knows that this approach would not have worked with Mike, as the animal has become a soulless killing machine. We see that Gon's tactic appears to be working, as the resolve of the butler is wavering. She even begins to plead with Kurapika and Leorio, telling them to stop their friend before he continues to get hurt. But Kurapika and Leorio honour Gon's determination by standing steadfast. The stern expressions on the faces of the two of them show that they do not want to dishonour Gon. As true friends and companions of Gon, they are here to back up Gon's determination and his resolve to see Killua. They have no intention of intervening and belittling Gon's efforts. Gon even asks her why is it that they have to go through all of this just for the sake of seeing their friend. Eventually, when Gon crosses the line, the butler stops attacking him, because she even knows that it is senseless to continue to beat him, because he isn't going to stop. She already sees how bloodied, bruised and swollen his face is. She understands through Gon's actions how much of a loyal friend he is to Killua, that he would go through all of this just for the sake of seeing him. We learn that her name is Canary and that she is a butler's apprentice, and Killua had tried to befriend her when they were children, and it is for this reason that her resolve wavers, and she requests for Gon to please save Killua, as it appears that he is in some form of danger. Just as she says this, the butler is blindsided and taken out by Killua's mother. She appears and tells Gon that Killua is aware that the three of them have been here for the past three weeks, but she tells them that Killua is currently too busy to meet them at the moment. We learn that Killua is chained up from all four of his limbs, with cuts and bruises all over his body. Within the Zordic mansion, we see that Killua's older brother Miluki has been torturing him, but it appears that his whipping has little to no effect on Killua. Even when he puts out his cigarette on Killua's body, he hardly even reacts. He just describes the feeling as a stinging sensation, highlighting his incredibly high pain threshold. We see that Killua has been voluntarily chained up as he could have escaped at any time, as he breaks free of his shackles. After hearing Miluki ask his mother if he should order the butlers to kill Killua's three friends, he warns Miluki not to do this with this very sadistic look that we've seen before during the Hunter exam arc. The two of them are then interrupted by the introduction of Killua's grandfather called Zeno. He gives Killua permission to leave, which leads to Killua very easily breaking free of the rest of his shackles, proving that he was imprisoned out of his own choice. It is really impressive that even after weeks of torturing, he appears to be unfazed. The attitude that he is expressing tells a completely different story to the blood and cuts that are all over his body. He tells Miluki that he doesn't regret running away from the Zordic residence in order to enter into the Hunter exam, but he knows that he deserved the punishment for attacking his brother and his mother. His grandfather Zeno tells Killua that his father would like to have a word with him, and excitedly we are now introduced to Killua's father. After Killua leaves, his grandfather describes him as special, as someone who has a lot of potential. It is known that Killua is one of the most talented children to have come from the Zordic family. Because of his talents, his mother is incredibly proud of him, but all of them agree that his actions are too unpredictable for him to be a good assassin as of yet. What assassin runs away from his family and desires to live the life of a normal boy, wanting to make friendships with people who care about him and who he cares for? These aren't the traits of someone who belongs to a world-famous assassin family. In chapter 42, we are introduced to Killua's father, Silva Zodic. He asks about Killua's friends and wants to know everything about his experiences during the Hunter exam arc. It's nice to see this father and son relationship, as I was expecting his father to be very dismissive and controlling, but it appears that he is understanding and wants to learn more about Killua and what he wants. He offers him an open platform, allowing 
allowing him to discuss anything and everything. He just wants him to talk to him. Cutting back to Gon and the others, Kilwa's mother eventually leaves after she learns that Kilwa has been freed. For the time being, Gon and the others take the butler's apprentice Canary to the butler's quarters, where her injuries can be tended to. She suggests that from the butler's quarters, they will be able to directly get in touch with the mansion, and if they get a hold of Kilwa's grandfather, then he may be able to help them to see Kilwa. After Kilwa explains everything to his father, he asks him if he wants to meet Gon, and he asks for him to be honest. From what he tells Kilwa, it appears that his father appreciates that he shouldn't just raise his son as an assassin. Kilwa is not an extension of his father, nor was he born to live up to the expectations of his family. He is his own person. He wants him to pursue his own path and hopes that maybe it will lead him back to his family one day. He asks Kilwa one more time if he wants to see his friends, to which Kilwa says yes. Before he leaves, his father makes him promise to him that he will never betray his friends. Gon and Kilwa have a very pure friendship. Kilwa has no idea about all of the various different things that Gon has endured in order to prove his friendship. Kilwa, without thinking, appears to reciprocate the same feelings as Gon, as he swears to never betray his friends, giving his friendship equally as much importance as Gon, Kurapika, and Yorio have been, who went out of their way and sacrificed several weeks in order to train and eventually meet Kilwa again. An important detail to note is when Kilwa's father explains to his wife about why he had let Kilwa go. She states that it is an important time in his development as the future head of the Zordic family. Silver states that it is for this reason that they need to give him his freedom and to allow him to do this. He is very confident that Kilwa will be back one day. Before Kilwa is reunited with his friends, the three of them arrive at the butler's quarters, and it is here that they meet the head butler called Goto. He tells them that Kilwa is on his way and that they should wait for him here. Since they have some time to spare, he suggests that they play a game with him. He offers to play a simple coin toss game with them, where he tosses a coin up in the air and the three of them have to guess which hand the coin is in. But the game doesn't appear to be as easy as it sounds, as as Goto utilizes incredibly fast and distracting hand movements in order to distract them from finding out which hand the coin is in. Before the game begins seriously, he clarifies something to the three of them. He tells them that he has known Killua since he was a baby, and he cares about him as if he were his own son. He is against the idea of the three of them taking Killua away from the Zordic family. Goto decides to test the three of them, to see if they are worthy enough to accompany Killua. The rules of the test are simple. The three of them have to decide which hand the coin is in. It will get progressively harder with each coin toss. If a wrong guess is made, then that individual is out, and this will continue until all three of them are out. If all three of them are to be eliminated, then they have to leave Kilwa alone, and when Kilwa arrives, he will just tell him that his friends are left without him. Even after going through all of these several different tests, it appears that their friendship is being put to the test once more. For the sake of Kilwa's freedom, they have to win this game. They cannot afford to lose and leave their friend behind, living an unhappy existence. Just before the game begins, Goto makes it very clear that he dislikes all three of them. After the first coin toss, the Oreo is eliminated, and Kurapika and Gon remain. The second coin toss was so incredibly fast that neither Gon or Killua were able to see it. The two of them decide that one will choose the right hand and the other will choose the left hand. Gon's guess of the left hand is correct and Kurapika is now eliminated. Before Gon continues, he takes off his eye patch and he cuts across his eyelid. He does this to reduce the inflammation which will prevent his left eye from closing. Once again, Gon continues to prove his friendship to Killua by going through with this very extreme measure of cutting across his eyelid. He is determined to see his friend, and he isn't going to let this little game ruin his chances of that, especially after he has come so far. I think so far, this is definitely one of Gon's most badass moments. Just how carefree he is, and how he cuts himself with little to no hesitation for the sake of his friend. With the use of his eyes, Gon is able to successfully pass another two coin tosses before Kilwa arrives and interrupts them. It appears that after this, Gon has earned the approval of Goto, who apologizes for taking his game a little too far. Before they leave, Goto tells Gon that the world is full of tricks and tricksters, and he advises him to be careful, as well as this, he asks Gon to look after Killua before they leave. When Killua is reunited with the others, it's like he had never left. They immediately pick up from where they had left off, and it highlights the strength of his friendship, especially with Gon. In such a short amount of time during the Hunter exam arc, the two boys had formed a very strong friendship with each other, something pure and unconditional which you can only find through the innocence of childhood. The Zordic family arc ends with the four of them leaving Kukuru Mountain. Killua questions Gon why he is being so stubborn by not using his Hunter license, despite having past the hunter exam, but Gon explains that there are a few things that he must do before he can use it. He feels that there are several people that he needs to see before he feels like he is a hunter himself. Firstly, he says something of importance which I completely overlooked during my first watch of the series. He says that he wants to return his father's hunter's license back to Kite, who had left it behind with Gon when they met when he was just a child. And second, he wants to become strong enough to punch Hisoka in the face, and to return his badge to him from the fourth phase of the hunter exam. He says that until he does these two things, he won't be satisfied to call himself a hunter and to use his hunter license, but it appears
appears that Gon has no idea where to find Hisoka. Kuripika interrupts and reveals what Hisoka had whispered into his ear during the final phase of the Hunter exam. We learn that Hisoka had told Kuripika that he knows something interesting about the spiders. By spiders, he is referring to the Phantom Troop, the very criminal organization that Kuripika is hunting for the slaughter of his clan. He tells Kuripika that he is going to be in York New City on the 1st of September, where he will explain what exactly he knows about the Phantom Troop. In six months from now, on the 1st of September, York New City will be hosting the world's largest auction. It will last for 10 days, and during this auction, rare and unusual objects from all over the world will be sold. There is every possibility that the Phantom Troop will be in attendance, but one thing is for certain, Hisoka will certainly be there. Kuripika tells Gon that he will find Hisoka there and he will call him to update him, but for now he states that he must split up and leave them behind in order to earn enough money to attend the auction. Unlike Gon, he is going to put his hunter license to use. Leorio also decides to head back home in order to study for his medical school entrance exams. Now that he has his hunter's license, he'll be able to cover his tuition costs and actually attend a public medical school. So Kuripika and Leorio leave the party with every intention to meet back up again on the 1st of September in York New City, while Gon and Killua decide that they need to train in order to get stronger. As Killua breaks down the strength difference between Gon, Hanzo and Hisoka, he states that they have just 6 months in order to get stronger, especially if Gon aims to return the punch back to Hisoka. Killua tells him even with 6 months of training, he will be nowhere near as strong enough to beat Hisoka. So the two of them decide to go to Heaven's Arena, where they'll be able to train and earn money at the same time, thus concluding the Zordic family arc and leading into the Heaven's Arena arc. This arc was completely different to the first arc. It truly tested the bonds that had formed between the characters in the first arc, especially through all of the trials and tests that Gon and the others had to undergo, through having the strength to push open the testing gate, or Gon encountering the butler, and lastly how Gon, Kuripika, and Leorio accepted Goto's coin toss game. Through all of these several different tests, Gon and the others were earning their acceptance from several different people who are very protective over Killua and the Zordic family. First, they earned the acceptance of Zebro, and then the acceptance of the apprentice butler Canary, and lastly, the acceptance of the head butler Goto. Through all of these different trials, they prove that they are worthy enough to be Killua's companions. But speaking of the people who are holding Killua back, it appears that Killua's older brother Miluki and Killua's mother are opposed to the idea of him having his own freedom. But his grandfather Zeno and his father Silver appear to be more understanding and lenient on Killua. Through this arc, we see that they allow him to have his own freedom and don't always act like they know what's best for him. We see that his brother and his mother and all of the butlers so far appear to act like they know what's best for Killua, but ultimately Killua just wants to live an ordinary life. He really couldn't care less about being an assassin or being the future head of the Zordic family. This incredibly talented boy just wants to travel with his friend Gon. At the end of this arc, we see Killua finally being granted his freedom, and in the process, we learn more about his family and the environment in which he was raised in. In every sense, Killua had his childhood robbed from him. Now at the age of 12, he is no longer going to sit by and allow others to make decisions for him. After forming his first real friendship with Gon, he doesn't want to take this opportunity for granted. So after repenting for attacking his mother and his brother, he leaves with Gon and the others. And one thing that I have continued to mention throughout this video, and I feel like I did mention quite a lot in the first Hunter Hunter video that I did, is the level of determination that Gon has, and how this plays into the dynamic that he shares with Killua. We see Killua who blatantly displays his devilish alter ego, with the ice cold glare that he gives to people who aggravate him. You can feel the killer intent in his aura and through his cold eyes. This is an obvious display of the monster within his character, but what we see through the determination that Gon displays is that he is a monster in his own right. The level of persistence that he displays by continually getting beaten and standing back up to receive a further beating from the butler's apprentice, and how he wouldn't take no for an answer throughout this whole arc, and how he was very vocal about how he felt about the Zordic family and their practices. His persistence and his determination did indeed pay off. Seeing this very frightening determination that Gon has behind his innocent smile is very telling, and I really can't wait for this dynamic to be played up upon more between Killua and Gon, as we continue the series and begin to explore the more darker aspects to each of their characters. Another aspect that I really liked about this arc is the way that it concluded, with the characters going their separate ways. In a typical shonen, it is usually normal for the cast of characters to stick together, but when all four characters have very differing motivations and desires that they want to pursue. It is a breath of fresh air to see characters actually follow through with their pursuits and make active decisions to work towards them, like Leorio returning home to enter into medical school, or Kuripika leaving to earn money to enter into the auction in York New City, all four of them going their separate ways but promising to be reunited at a future arc. I believe it is a great setup, and it only makes you look forward to the arc after the Heaven's Arena arc. But for now, Killua makes a really great point at the end of the arc that the two of them need to train and get stronger. Despite being incredibly gifted young boys, 
bodies, the two of them are far from reaching the level of the hunters that they have encountered so far, like Hanzo and Hisoka. I'm really looking forward to re-experiencing the Heavens Arena arc in my next video, and I hope that you are too. In this video, I'll be going over the Heavens Arena arc. This arc is once again a change of pace from what we have seen up until this point. It is the first arc within this series, which is heavily centred around fighting. In addition to this, we are introduced to a new concept which is essential to the fighting mechanics of Hunter x Hunter. I am talking about the technique referred to as Nen, which involves a living sentient being manipulating their life force energy, turning it into an aura which they can use in battle or various other situations. As well as this, we learn more about the Phantom Troop through the introduction of one of its members. We also see Gon and Killua being introduced to their first mentor, who just so happens to teach them about Nen, and how to utilise their life force energy during battle. During my first run through of Hunter x Hunter, I really enjoyed the Heavens Arena arc, but that was almost 7 years ago, so I definitely want to see if this arc holds up after all of this time, and especially after experiencing so many other anime and manga after watching Hunter x Hunter. So let's get into it, my breakdown and analysis of the Heavens Arena arc. The Heavens Arena arc runs from chapter 44 to chapter 63. It serves to build upon the world of Hunter x Hunter that we have come to appreciate so far. Through this action packed arc, we learn that the battles in Hunter x Hunter are not won by brute strength or force. Instead, individuals have to apply cunning strategies in order to overwhelm their opponents. And a key aspect of this strategy is by implementing Nen. The ability to effectively utilise Nen is a very important part of being a hunter. It's what separates a normal hunter from a professional hunter. After acquiring a hunter licence and putting yourself through the rigorous hunter exam. When you have officially qualified as a hunter, you have yet to complete the secret portion of the hunter exam. The hidden portion of the hunter exam begins immediately after one acquires their hunter license. Only after you pass the secret hunter exam can you be worthy of the title of a professional hunter. This unspecified portion of the exam requires each hunter to go out into the world and to learn the basic principles of Nen. Other hunters will only recognise you as a professional hunter once you have learnt Nen. Without knowing the basics of Nen, it is difficult to accept any job as a hunter, since it is a requirement under most job listings. Nen isn't usually taught to most hunters who sit the formal part of the hunter exam, because it is assumed that each person who acquires a hunter licence will eventually come across a mentor, who will be able to teach that person Nen in a way that best suits that individual, because this training process is very specific and personalised for each individual. So the hunter association assumes that once someone qualifies, they will eventually find a suitable mentor, who will be able to teach them the basic principles of Nen. And in essence, this is what occurs here with Gon and Killua as they meet a mentor who teaches them the basics of Nen, while also seeing them practice what they have learnt through their participation in Heaven's Arena. Their intention to take part in Heaven's Arena was not only to train, but also to earn money. This is to earn a living for themselves, so that they can afford the airfare to York New City to meet up with Kurapika and Leorio on September 1st, like they had agreed. So the arc begins in Chapter 44 as we are introduced to the Heaven's Arena building. It has 251 stories, and it holds the title of the fourth tallest building in the world. There aren't many rules in Heaven's Arena. The only one is to knock your opponent out, and as you progress up each of the 251 levels, the potential to earn money increases. Anybody who is obsessed or interested with fighting gathers here, in order to push their abilities to their very limits against opponents who are equally as passionate about fighting. We quickly find out that this isn't the first time that Killua has come here. When he was only 6 years old, his father had left him here penniless. At this young age, he ordered Killua to stay in Heaven's Arena until he reached the 200th floor. It took Killua 2 years to accomplish this task. He tells Gon that after the 200th floor, people of Hisoka's calibre are found there. It takes a lot of skill to battle with the opponents at the higher levels. We immediately know from the get-go that this isn't going to be a walk in the park for either of them, despite them being very talented and gifted children. This background information is enough to make Gon feel nervous for what he is about to get himself in for. Unlike with any typical shonen tournament arc, the children are underestimated, but Gon makes quick work of his opponent. The invigilator of the fight, after watching Gon battle, deems him worthy enough to advance onto the 50th level. When Killua defeats his opponent, the Invigilator realises that he has already reached the 200th level and offers him to progress to the 180th level, but Killua wants to stick with Gon, so volunteers to go to the 50th floor alongside with him. The two of them are referred to as monsters, as they make quick work of progressing up the tower. Along with them, another boy who appears to be their same height and age makes quick work of his opponent, and he is given permission to advance onto the 50th floor also. We learn that the boy is called Zushi, and he faces off against Killua later on. In 
In chapter 45, we learn more about how progression works in Heaven's Arena. We learn that the building is divided into 20 floors, with 10 divisions on each floor. So if someone was to win a battle on the 50th floor, then they immediately progress onto the 60th floor. We also learn that Heaven's Arena attracts millions of audience members to watch the fights. Because of the large number of spectators in attendance, the building has facilities for them to stay overnight, to shop or to even dine in restaurants. Everything is on site for their convenience. It's a nice piece of information which helps to bring the tower to life, because Killua later explains to Gon that once an individual reaches the 100th floor, they are given a room to stay in. We can understand that they are being compensated because of the attendance numbers, and a fighter's ability to attract spectators to watch their fights. We can understand that all of this helps to compensate for the fighter's service costs while they stay in Heaven's Arena. Gon and Killua eventually meet Zushi and his mentor Wing on the 50th floor. They all state their purpose for coming to Heaven's Arena. Zushi desires to improve himself by fighting strong opponents, while Killua and Gon also state their purpose for coming here. Our first impression of Wing is not that impressive, as he has very messy hair and an untucked shirt. But one thing to note, he is impressed that the two of them are able to keep up with Zushi. On the 50th floor, Killua faces off against Zushi, but unlike the first floor, this match is taking place in front of an audience of spectators. The odds are in favour for Zushi to win, but Killua makes quick work of him by assessing his stance, and then dodging his attack to strike him from behind. He confidently says that he will be repeating this same lightning chop technique until he reaches the 150th floor. He knows exactly what he is getting himself in for. He did, after all, spend two years in Heaven's Arena. Through all of this background information that we learn about Killua, we do get to appreciate how incredibly powerful he is, and you can only hope that Gon somehow manages to keep up with him. Otherwise, he's going to be left behind very quickly. During this fight, we are introduced to how battles are won in Heaven's Arena. The fights are scored on a points-based system, points being earned from hits, critical hits, and knockdowns. A clean strike is worth one point, a critical hit is worth two points, and knocking down your opponent is worth one point. And if, like Killua, you were to totally knock out your opponent, then you are awarded 10 points in total, and thus being crowned as the winner. Zushi isn't knocked out by Killua just yet, as he gets up after the strike. But after taking another strike from Killua, he is immediately back on his feet. Killua is surprised by his opponent, because in theory he should be out cold. But Zushi, realising that he is cornered and has no other way of defeating Killua, begins to change his stance. It appears that he is about to use a technique which angers his mentor from the audience. Wing yells his name out in anger, which ends up startling Zushi. It is almost like Wing had created an aura of his own in order to terrify his student. After this, we learn that Killua eventually defeated Zushi, but Killua was disappointed because he wasn't able to knock out his opponent. Killua learns that the technique that Zushi was prevented from using by Wing is referred to as Ren. After learning about this ability called Ren, it appears that it has interested both Killua and Gon, and it seems like it is essential to learn, especially if they want to go all the way to the top of Heaven's Arena. The two of them, within the span of three days, win six fights, and eventually reach the 100th level. They are finally given a room to stay in and no longer have concerns about money. All of the battles that they are having don't seem to be challenging at all, as the two of them are defeating their opponents with just one hit. After fearing that they will eventually come across someone who will be able to use Ren, they decide to ask Zushi what Ren actually is, and how he had learnt to use it. He does a poor job of explaining it to Gon and Killua, which leads to Wing intervening. He agrees to teach them about Nen. After Killua expresses his desire to learn about Nen, as he feels like it's the secret behind his brother's powers of manipulation, Wing through speaking to Gon and Killua introduces us to the concept of Nen, which is the power that ignites one's soul. An individual's Nen is expressed by the level of willpower that that person has. And if you've been following these videos and you've seen how determined Gon is, you can only assume that once he learns how to control this Nen, he will have incredible power. Because we have seen him demonstrate his level of willpower, which appears to be the strongest out of everybody we have seen. There are four exercises that one must practice in order to harness the power of Nen. The first is referred to as Ten, which is about focusing the mind and reflecting upon yourself, while also reaffirming or defining your goal. The next is Zetsu. So after someone has determined their goal, the exercise of Zetsu commands that person to put their goal into words. The third exercise, Ren, which we saw Zushi use during his battle against Killua, refers to intensifying your willpower after you have put your goal into words. And the final exercise is Hatsu, which is to assimilate all of the previous exercises and to put them into action. It is like a release. During his battle with Killua, when Zushi used his Ren, he was intensifying his will to win, and this is what was causing Killua to feel intimidated or flustered. Wing demonstrates these four exercises as he determines a will to kill both Gon and Killua, in order to show them the power of intensifying one's will through Ren. He affirms his will and he says it out loud that he is going to kill the two of them, and then through Ren he intensifies his will. Wing proves that he has mastered these four exercises. Of course, he doesn't utilize the final exercise, Hatsu, to put his will into action, but his will to kill is successfully intensified as it leaves Gon and Killua 
unnerved. Because the two of them are not his students, he hasn't told them everything about Nen. Wing states that he only teaches Nen to those who are his students. Anybody else, he just gives a simple explanation. And this is because Nen can be easily misused if it's learnt by the wrong person. Wing demonstrates that by using Nen, even a plain piece of paper can become a blade. So it is very important to be selective of who Nen is taught to. By chapter 47, Gon and Killua have already reached the 200th level, which inspires Wing to consider if he is going to teach them Nen. As they walk towards the hallway to the 200th floor, they are stopped by a menacing aura. Unexpectedly, it is revealed that Hisoka is here, and he stands across the hallway of the 200th floor, preventing Gon and Killua from progressing forward. The two of them have until midnight to register to fight on the floor, but the intensity of Hisoka's bloodlust prevents them from moving forward. We learn that Hisoka is also in Heaven's Arena because of his passion for fighting. He had also been waiting for the two of them after learning that they were heading towards Heaven's Arena. If his reintroduction wasn't unexpected and strange enough, he acts like a mentor here. He warns the two of them that they are not ready to progress onto the 200th floor. He tells them to leave and to come back when they are ready. The only way that the two boys are able to progress forward is if they were to overcome Hisoka's Nen, which is virtually impossible for the two of them since they know hardly anything about Nen at the moment. And this is when Wing appears behind them and advises them to listen to Hisoka's advice. Gon and Killua have until midnight to register on the 200th floor. They have until then to learn about Nen, otherwise they will have to start again from the first floor. They are relying on Wing to teach them how to overcome Hisoka's Nen. In chapter 47, after officially becoming students of Wing, he explains to them more about Nen, revealing some truth behind some of his selective wording from earlier. Here we learn the true definitions of the four exercises which serve to cultivate one's Nen. He explains that everybody has Nen within their body. It is their life energy. Most people who haven't noticed or controlled their Nen leak it away, but through the exercise of Ten, they are able to hold their Nen within their body, strengthening this energy. The technique Zetsu means to suppress one's life force energy, like in Dragon Ball when individuals lower their ki in order to hide from their opponents. The next technique Ren serves to refine one's life energy. It enables their user to produce more of an aura. Wing demonstrates Ren by producing an aura. He is surprised that Gon and Killua can feel it, and is impressed by how sensitive they are to it. He even states that it is rare to come across individuals who pick it up this quickly. Wing concludes that the environments that Gon and Killua were raised in makes it perfect for them to learn Nen. As well as this, he deduces that they were born with innate talents which makes it easier for them to learn and utilize Nen. Wing begins to explain the significance of an aura. He says that an individual's aura can be intensified to such an extent that it can even kill a defenseless person. That is, if that aura has a malicious intent associated with it. The only way to protect yourself against a malicious aura is by using Nen. By effectively using the first exercise, Ten, an individual can develop a defense against someone else's malicious aura. Wing explains that through a Ten defense, you can use your own aura to block an opponent's attack. This explains why Gon and Killua were prevented from walking across the hallway, which was riddled with Hisoka's malicious intent. Without a proper defense, if they found themselves in the middle of his evil aura, then their bodies would have shattered. This is why Hisoka prevents them from moving forward. He is kind of nudging them in the right direction because he wants them to get stronger so that he can fight them at their best one day. Hisoka is a good judge of character, and his assessment skills are second to none. His assessment of Gon and Killua and their innate talents and gifts leads him to believe that once they are older and more experienced, they will be formidable opponents. Something for him to really look forward to. But in the meantime, he has to focus on not getting too excited and holding himself back from killing them. There are two ways to activate Nen. You can either do it very slowly and carefully, or by force. Killua and Gon don't have the luxury of time, so they have to do it by force, as they have only until midnight to master the first exercise of Nen. It took Zushi six months to master Ten, but the speed of mastering Ten depends entirely on the boys. They need to learn how to contain their aura in a very short amount of time. Through transmitting his own aura by using Hatsu, he is going to force open the aura nodes of Killua and Gon. An analogy of jumpstarting a battery is used for this exercise. Wing explains that he decided to teach Gon and Killua Nen because he quickly realized how talented they are. He also notes that they are untrained to be entering onto the 200th floor, because everyone beyond the 200th level uses Nen. He warns them about the upcoming battles that they will encounter going upwards from the 200th floor, but he reassures them that they will awaken their Nen. And this is because he has assessed that they have the talent and capability to do so. Wing is impressed by their determination and will to progress. After awakening their aura nodes, their life force energy begins leaking out, but they begin focusing on containing their aura. Eventually, the two of them, by remaining calm, slow the leaking of their aura, and they contain their life force energy around their body. Almost instantly, they were able to master Ten. Wing notes that they achieved this without any instructions. They innately knew how to control their Ten. They took the position which was the best for controlling their life force energy, and they mastered the flow of their aura within mere moments. Gon and Killua are described as amazing, but at the same time terrifying. 
flying. At the very young age of 12, they continue to surprise the adults around them by surpassing heights which no ordinary child should be able to reach. After this very brief training with Wing, they return to the 200th floor. They are able to successfully walk through Hisoka's sinister aura. Hisoka knows that the two of them have come to Heaven's Arena to train themselves in order to fight him, but he isn't going to entertain either of them unless they have won at least one battle from the 200th floor. Hisoka walks away from them for now as we are introduced to three new opponents who we can only assume know how to use Nen, and through training and fighting them, they will continue to learn more about the various different aspects to Nen. The three fighters are called Guido, Sadaso, and Revelt. We learn that after registering to fight on the 200th floor, they have 90 days to prepare for their fight. Of course, they can request for a fight any time that they want, but their deadline to actually battle someone is 90 days. If they don't do so, then their registration for the 200th floor will be revoked. For each battle that is won, they get another 90 days to prepare. On this floor, they need to win 10 battles in order to challenge what is known as the Floor Master. There are 21 Floor Masters. Each of them are in charge of their own floor. After defeating a Floor Master, you inherit that title and get that person's floor. Through this explanation, it feels like we have unlocked a completely new world. Gon and Killua only know the basics of Nen, but all of the Floor Masters and the opponents from the 200th floor onwards are all utilizing Nen effectively in battle. The roles are completely reversed. Gon and Killua most likely won't be doing any one-hit knockouts. After hearing about the Floor Masters and the introduction of Nen, it feels like it is Gon and Killua who are in danger of being knocked out by one strike. Gon and Killua do indeed get plenty of praise, and the fact that they are talented is focused upon. But what I really appreciate is that the difference between where they are and where they need to be in order to become a professional hunter or to actualize their full potential is always highlighted. Hisoka is an example of a character which helps us to understand the true lengths that Gon and Killua have yet to overcome. Indeed, they are far from reaching the heights of Hisoka, and this arc heavily focuses on this. It isn't just Gon and Killua having successful win after successful win. Up until this point, they have found it very easy to work their way up Heaven's Arena, but the battles which take place from the 200th floor onwards appear to be unpredictable, and this is because Nen has become a vital element of the battle mechanics from now on. After registering for the 200th floor, they are challenged by the trio. Gon registers to battle with one of them called Guido. His fight is scheduled for the next day. Gon doesn't expect to win the battle. He just wants to test out his 10 in order to get a feel of it during battle. Wing had told him not to participate in any matches for the first two months. Gon, who is too impatient to wait, disobeys his mentor. Guido tells Gon that he is fortunate that he is going up against him, because in comparison, he isn't as strong as the other Nen users. He uses dancing tops, which seem to be powered by his aura. Gon is unaware of what they can do, resulting in him being repeatedly attacked by them. Each hit feels as heavy as a sledgehammer. Gon realizes that the dancing tops must be charged with Nen, so he tries to feel their presence. But because he hasn't trained enough in utilizing Nen, he isn't able to sense their presence for long, which results in him being hit again by a dancing top. Gon realizes that the dancing tops are not really attacking him. They are just spinning around and attacking whatever they encounter. Equipped with this knowledge, he ignores the dancing tops. While he tries to land a direct hit on Guido, his opponent uses a technique called Tornado Top, turning himself into a dancing top. In his first official battle against someone who knows how to use Nen, Gon is being utterly bested. Wing even comments on his inexperience and states that he is five years too early to be fighting Guido, but then realizing that he only has one point left until he is defeated, Gon releases his 10. Without being taught it, he uses Zetsu. By using Zetsu, he is able to focus all of his senses on the dancing tops. Wing deduces that Gon must have been able to utilize Zetsu out of instinct. It came naturally to him, using the analogy of how animals naturally pick up hunting. He realizes that Gon must have grown up close to animals, which explains why he has so much potential. One specific rule about Nen which is drilled into our heads is that the only way to defeat a Nen user is by using Nen yourself. By utilizing Zetsu, Gon has depleted all of his 10, so he has nothing to defend himself against Guido's dancing tops. By using Zetsu, Gon successfully dodges an attack for the first time during this match. He continues as it is evident that Gon is enjoying the thrill of the battle. He dodges Guido's dancing tops for over an hour. He has even released 50 dancing tops into the ring, and Gon is keeping up with all of them by using Zetsu. But after Gon is cornered and he has nowhere left to go, he is attacked by one of the dancing tops, which results in him having multiple fractures to his arms and cracks to his ribs. He has lost the battle and it will take him four months to recover from his injuries. After the fight, Wing checks up on Gon and slaps him for disobeying him and being reckless. Killua being cheeky lies to Wing and tells him that it will take two months for Gon to recover. He then proceeds to forbid Gon from participating in any matches for two whole months. He also forbids him from 
from training or studying Nen during this time. He wants to see if Gon can keep this promise. If he can't, then there is nothing that Wing can teach him. Killua and Wing reprimand Gon because he genuinely could have lost his life during that fight. But Wing is surprised that Gon was risking his life, but he was enjoying it at the same time. Some foreshadowing for the events in the Kimura Antarctic occur here, as Killua states that he is usually level-headed and he knows what fights to pick. But he states that Gon is very different in this regard. He doesn't think as logically as Killua does. Once he has decided to battle someone, he gets very absorbed within it. Like his obsession with battling against Hisoka and returning the favour to him, Wing begins to question himself whether if he did the right thing to force open Gon's life energy pause so that he could use Nen. Killua, who remains the ever-loyal friend, decides to stick by Gon. He wants to learn Nen at the same time as Gon, so he decides to wait with him. Wing has a change of heart and tells them that they can practice releasing their Nen and focusing on the Ten exercise every day. When Killua returns, he sees Gon meditating. He smiles and begins to meditate with him. They have only known each other for a very short amount of time, but Killua really does enjoy Gon's company. And this brief but subtle smile on Killua's face clearly indicates this here. When Wing returns to his room, he continues to question what he has done. One of the panels is a complete foreshadowing for the events that occur later on. He asks himself if he has awoken a terrible monster. And this is well before the events of the Chimera Antarch. It is small, subtle details like this which hint at the darker aspects of Gon's character. It is something that I didn't even notice during my first read-through, but while rereading the series, this one panel is hard to ignore, especially after knowing the events which occur later on. I think Wing was fully aware of the consequences of his actions by beginning to teach Gon Nen. But the thing is, if he hadn't taught Gon Nen, then Killua and Gon would have found someone to eventually learn it from. Since they are on a journey of progression and growth and want to reach the levels of Hisoka and Killua's brother, they would have had to learn Nen sooner or later. It is just unfortunate that this task has fallen upon Wing to teach the two of them Nen, because it is ultimately Wing who will have to shoulder the burden and the consequences of them having learnt Nen, and if they use it in any way to harm themselves in the future, which as we've seen during Gon's battle with Guido, he is very susceptible to doing. In chapter 51, we also get an update on Kurepika's whereabouts, as we see that he tries to join an agency, but he has refused membership because he doesn't know how to use Nen. He is told to come back once he is able to utilise Nen, since it is a minimum requirement for joining the agency. In chapter 52, one month has passed since Gon was injured, and he is now completely healed, which is slightly terrifying since it should have taken him four months to completely heal. Killua presents Gon with tickets to Hisoka's next match. He is going to be fighting an opponent called Castro. This is someone who he had defeated two years ago, but he spared his life because of the potential that Hisoka saw within him. This rematch, in a way, is Hisoka evaluating how well Castro has used these last two years to live up to the potential that Hisoka sees within him. While Gon and Killua are making their way over to spectate the fight. They are interrupted by Wing. He tells Gon that through watching the fight, he will be analysing their techniques, and thus he will be learning Nen through observation. He forbids Gon from watching the battle, since it would be breaking the promise that he made to Wing not to study or practice Nen for two whole months. Killua is left to go watch the fight on his own. Through this brief encounter, Wing notes that they have been practicing their Nen exercises every day, since he did give them permission to practice releasing their Ten. He can tell this because he can see that their auras are not leaking as much as before. Their life force energy is contained around their body. He describes their aura flowing around their body like a calm river. I think Wing is definitely surprised and unnerved about how quick Gon and Killua are picking up their Nen training. He definitely isn't used to his students mastering the different exercises of Nen this quickly. Like I said before, what's concerning Wing is not where the boys are now, but it's where they will be in the future. If they are already doing so well, it is frightening to think about how much skill and power they will have once they reach their full potential. Moving on to the battle between Castro and Hisoka, Castro states that he is undergone intense training for the last two years. He initially appears to have the advantage over Hisoka, as he even knocks Hisoka down. While it seems like Hisoka is being bested, in fact he is actually analysing his opponent and trying to understand the extent of his fighting ability. Castro doesn't take his opponent lightly, as he ends up severing Hisoka's right arm. But Hisoka goes through all of this in order to understand how Castro's ability works. He realises that he is using a doppelganger against him. As the battle nears its conclusion, Castro ends up severing Hisoka's left arm also but in a strange turn of events, it appears that Hisoka has reattached his right arm. He ends up taking out Castro's doppelganger. Then he throws several cards towards Castro's body, which end up defeating and killing him. Hisoka is declared the winner. He is disappointed that his opponent has squandered the remaining time that he had left, because in the end, he didn't end up living up to Hisoka's expectations of him. So instead of sparing his life this time, he ends up killing his opponent. Hisoka is bored by him and no longer sees any potential for growth within him. Because of this, he has no desire to fight him at a future 
future time. And this is why he ends up killing him. In chapter 55, Hisoka walks towards a woman who is waiting for him. She asks to see his arms. It appears that she has the ability to stitch back his severed arms together, restoring the muscles, blood flow, and nerves to both of his arms. Through her Nen ability, she successfully reattaches Hisoka's arms. To hide these stitches, which indicate that his arms have been reattached, Hisoka reveals and uses his own Nen ability. Firstly, he uses Bungigum to attach a material around the scene, and then uses another Nen ability called Texture Surprise to alter the surface of the material so that it appears as skin. This woman who helps Hisoka is revealed as the first member of the Phantom Troop that we are introduced to. Her name is Machi. She informs Hisoka, who we also learn is a member of the Phantom Troop, that every member of the Phantom Troop is now required to meet in York New City by noon on August 30th. Before it was anyone who was free, but now everybody is required to meet up at this location. Considering the build-up and all of the characters who are meeting in one location at the exact same time, a big story event is definitely going to be taking place in York New City. We know from Kurapika describing the Phantom Troop earlier in the series that all of its members have a tattoo of a spider with a number on it. In chapter 55, we learn that the tattoo that Hisoka has on his back of the spider is a complete fake. Through using his Nen ability, he is able to pass this off as a real tattoo. After he takes it off, he says that it is time to hunt down the spiders. So it appears that Kurapika and Hisoka have very similar goals here. Hisoka did ask Machi if Krolo will also be there at the meetup in York New City, to which she presumes that he will be. Trying to understand Hisoka's motives for wanting to take down the spiders, we can only presume that it is because he wants to be the most powerful, and he clearly has some interest in this character called Krolo who has just been introduced. Of course, we later learn that Krolo Lucifer is the leader of the Phantom Troop, and Hisoka has a very obsessive desire to fight and defeat him, presumably to prove that he is the most powerful. In chapter 56, two months are finally passed, and Wing allows Khan and Killua to study with Zushi. The first thing that they do is to watch Hisoka's battle with Castro, in order to understand how Hisoka was manipulating his aura during the fight. Wing then tells Gon to register and to fight in 26 days, while asking Killua to fight the day after Gon does. In this time, they will be mastering Gyo, which is an advanced type of Ren. This is where a Nen user concentrates a large amount of aura into one part of the body. The application of Gyo is most likely used to enhance someone's eyesight, focusing their aura onto their eyes. It allows someone to see their opponent's aura and the Nen that they have manipulated and concealed. While Gyo is being activated, an individual can pick up and sense very faint auras. It is this technique which Wing wants them to master before their next fight. Gon and Killua are training along with Zushi, as they visualize their energy building up in their body. This energy stemming from every cell within their body. They project all of this outward as they try to perfect the timing of their 10 release. Understandably, Zushi is shocked because they are improving at an incredibly fast rate. They are progressing in certain aspects of their training within mere moments. In comparison, Zushi states that it took him weeks to accomplish the things that Gon and Killua are doing. This fast rate of progression doesn't stop as Killua proves to Wing that he has mastered Gyo in one evening. He is able to visually see Hisoka's aura and describes it as stretchy, adding that it is because of his sticky rubber aura that he is able to do most of his magic tricks. Wing acknowledges Killua's assessments and agrees with him entirely. Once again, both of them have exceeded Wing's expectations, as he didn't expect either of them to have learnt Gyo in one night, as it appears that Gon has already demonstrated Gyo to Wing before Killua arrived. Wing allows Killua to fight early. He decides to fight Sadaso, one of the members of the trio that they encountered earlier. They tried to kidnap Zushi and have been doing really underhanded things in order to get a fight with Gon and Killua. They must assume that they are still rookies who don't know how to properly use Nen, but in the time that has elapsed since Gon and Guido's battle, the two of them have made immense progress. Killua defeats his opponent, Sadaso, even before the match begins, as he breaks into his room and threatens him, demonstrating the threatening and sadistic side to his character. His warning induces enough fear into Sadaso to make him forfeit his match with Killua. This ability to instill fear into his opponent is credited to the training that he has acquired from his family as an assassin. Killua also threatens Revelt and Guido, as the two of them agree to fight fair and square against both Gon and Killua in their upcoming fights. The day of their fights finally begin as Gon is scheduled to fight Guido, and Killua is scheduled to fight Revelt, both on the same day. During this rematch, Gon demonstrates how far he has come, as he easily eliminates all of Guido's dancing tops. This is because Gon's Nen defenses have improved considerably. He uses his father's fishing rod to flip the floor tile that Guido is spinning on. Wanting some payback for the defeat that he suffered earlier, Gon is merciless, as he punches Guido, who is lying defenseless on the floor. Guido is punched before he can even say that he gives up. Gon is furious because Guido and his friends had threatened Zushi. In a similar manner to how Killua had threatened Sadaso earlier, Gon too shows that he has this threatening side of his character, as he warns Guido to never touch Zushi again. If this is how threatening they are at the age of 12, just imagine how terrifying they will be once they are older. And this is 
exactly what Wing is afraid of while he was teaching them Nen. Killua is up next as he battles against Revelt. He uses his abilities against him as it results in his opponent being electrocuted. A few days later, Killua was supposed to have fought Guido, but Guido forfeits the match. During Gon's battle with Revelt, he wins the fight by making his opponent pass out out of fear. At the end of chapter 59, Hisoka now agrees to battle against Gon, saying that he qualifies now for a battle against him, and he will fight him any time. Before Gon battles Hisoka, Wing decides that it is time for them to learn about Hatsu. After having mastered the basics of Nen, it is now about building upon their own unique expression of Nen. Wing states that all Nen users fall into six broad categories. He lists them as emitter, enhancer, transmuter, manipulator, conjurer, and specialist. It is essential now to find out which category Gon, Killua, and Azushi fall under. The Nen abilities that someone ends up expressing are shaped by how they were brought up and the environment that they were brought up in. We learn from Wing that Hisoka is a transmuter, as he can change his aura into rubber-like substances. Wing now presents them with a way to find out what type of Nen user they are. This method is called water divination. Wing demonstrates that he is a enhancer type, as he changes the volume of water in the glass, resulting in it pouring over. Gon is the first to find out what type of Nen user he is, as we learn that he is a enhancer. Azushi is a manipulator, and Killua tries but no visible change appears to the water. But then Wing asks him to taste the water, stating that it doesn't taste like water anymore because it's a little sweet. Wing then states that Killua is a transmuter because he has changed the taste of the water. So for the next four weeks, Wing orders them to pay attention to this practice, and tells them to continually practice water divination until they can make more of a pronounced change. During this time, Gon has signed up for his next fight with Hisoka. But the day before his fight with Hisoka, the three boys present to Wing the results of their training. Gon and Killua are now able to influence the water with their Nen type to a stronger degree than the first time they did it. When Gon tries, the water is gushing out of the glass. When Killua tries, the water now tastes as sweet as honey. Wing declares that they have successfully graduated his training, and even states that Gon has passed the hidden aspect of the hunter exam. He can now be declared as a fully-fledged hunter. It is revealed during their training, Wing had been in touch with Chairman Netero, who had shared with him information about Gon and Killua. Wing even advises Killua to reset the exam, and he tells Gon how Kurapika and Hanzo are doing, stating that they have already learnt Nen under other teachers, and other candidates who had passed the exam like Illumi and Hisoka had already known Nen to begin with. In Chapter 61, the highly anticipated battle against Gon and Hisoka begins. Gon begins the fight by charging at Hisoka, but Hisoka stands still at the same spot, while Gon frantically tries to land a point against him. Repeatedly, after being knocked back and then charging back towards Hisoka, Gon attacks but then gets on the defensive as Hisoka also begins to attack him. The first point is scored by Hisoka as he catches Gon off guard. He soon begins to find some glaring openings in Gon's offensive strategy. It results in him successfully attacking Gon. Killua notes that it appears that Hisoka is having a lot of fun during this fight, but there is a world of difference between the two of them. The only chance that Gon has is to take advantage of Hisoka's feelings of superiority, but even then it is a very slim chance. Like his previous fight on the 200th floor, Gon uses the floor tiles to his advantage. He flips one of the tiles and punches it, breaking it into pieces. Amongst the rubble, he is able to find cover, where he sneaks into Hisoka's blind spot and is able to land a clean hit against him. This very powerful punch is enough for Gon to have repaid his favour back to Hisoka, and to fulfil his goal of punching him back in the face from the Hunter exam arc. The ref declares it a critical hit, scoring two points to Gon. After this attack, Hisoka finally moves from the spot that he has been standing in throughout the entirety of this fight. Gon too fearlessly walks towards Hisoka and returns to him his number 44 badge from the fourth phase of the Hunter exam. This whole goal that Gon had had some excellent setup. The build-up was really interesting, and the payoff is very satisfactory. Accomplishing this task feels well-earned for Gon, as we get to see how much he has progressed since he first encountered Hisoka. Hisoka tells Gon that as a transmuter he is very fickle, so it is up to Gon to maintain his interest, because to Hisoka something of value can become instantly meaningless to him as soon as he feels bored. And this is exactly the change of emotions that occurred with Castro, which resulted in him being bored with him and killing him. Hisoka tells him not to disappoint him as he starts to fight against him seriously. Here we get to see the world of difference between Gon and Hisoka. Despite him being incredibly talented and having learnt Nen in such a short period of time, all of this success is nothing in comparison to a monster like Hisoka. Ultimately, during this fight, Hisoka is being used as an example of how far Gon has yet to go. After Hisoka goes on the offensive, he scores a critical hit. It results in Gon being more cautious as he tries to think above a strategy against him, but his opponent has no patience, as he says that he will force Gon to come to him. Gon, by using Gyo, can see that Hisoka has attached a piece of his bungee gum to his cheek. He uses it to pull Gon towards him and to attack him. It is a very harsh lesson that he is teaching Gon here, making him come to realise how foolish he was to actually challenge Hisoka fearlessly. Gon realising that he is trapped and he has no 
way to escape from Hisoka's bungee gum. He becomes determined to move forward in the face of this adversity. Gon's determination is enough for Hisoka to start losing his mind, as he has to restrain himself from completely killing Gon. He has to wait until Gon is older and has actualized his full potential, so that he may have a fight with a very worthy adversary. All of the attacks that Gon is landing on Hisoka have no effect on him. Hisoka once again lands another two-point critical hit. Gon argues with the ref that he immediately got back up and it should have been counted as a critical hit, but the judge ignores him. But while he was talking to the judge, Hisoka had attached a piece of rubble to his bungee gum. He uses this piece of rubble to score the match point, thus declaring Hisoka as the winner. After this fight, Hisoka analyzes that if they were to have fought 10 more times, then Gon may have stood a chance. But he states that this is the end to their exhibition fights, as their next battle will be their last. There will be no rules and it will be a fight to the death. Hisoka has now won 10 matches and he goes on to become a floor master. The judge of the fight goes on to admit that he was scoring the fight in favor of Hisoka winning, because he was well aware of the world of difference between the two fighters. In a way, because of his lenient scoring with Hisoka, it resulted in the battle ending prematurely, but he did so with the intention of preventing Gon from dying during the fight. At the end of chapter 63, Killua says that they have accomplished everything they have needed to do in Heaven's Arena, stating that they have no need to be here anymore. Together they decide to visit Gon's home on Whale Island, as he has been away from there for seven months. And thus, after saying goodbye to Wing and Zushi, the Heaven's Arena arc concludes. After re-experiencing this arc, it still holds up as one of my favourite stories told within Hunter x Hunter. I loved the introduction of this new concept of Nen, and how it is implemented into the series. I think it is incredibly creative and well thought out, especially in regards to the various different exercises that one must master before they can start uniquely expressing their own Nen abilities. As well as this, I was impressed by the way that water divination was explained to assess someone's Nen type. This arc has a clear divide. Everything that occurs below the 200th level is the fighting mechanics that we have seen up until this point, but everything above the 200th level is all Nen based fighting. It is a completely new world, and it is one that we are going to be diving deep into in the future arcs. Another welcoming surprise was to see Hisoka as the antagonist of this arc. We get to learn about his relationship with the Phantom Troop, realizing that he has ulterior motives, as well as being introduced to a member of the Phantom Troop through Machi. As of this point, we don't know what Hisoka is planning, but we do know that he is interested in this character called Krolo. But his character in this arc serves to motivate Gon to learn Nen, as Hisoka only decides to battle him once he has learned the absolute basics of Nen. Despite how evil and sinister his character is, in this arc he does appear to be nurturing both Gon and Killua. This is shown firsthand when he prevents them from progressing to the 200th level, by using his sinister aura to block them from entering. The magician shows off his skills and his Nen abilities during his battle with Castro, and then during his fight with Gon. With Castro, he shows no restraint and he kills his opponent. With Gon, he uses heavy restraint, trying not to prematurely end his life. He definitely is a very strange character, but one that I never get bored of seeing on screen. And when it comes to both Gon and Killua, in the space of seven months, their friendship has truly blossomed. They look out for each other and support each other through everything. And this is shown firsthand when Killua decides to stop learning Nen for 60 days, after Gon was told not to by Wing. He did not want to get ahead of Gon. As a true friend, he wants them to progress together and to become stronger at the same time. I've mentioned it throughout this video, the two boys are monsters in their own right. They have demonstrated how incredibly gifted and talented they are, but despite this, they are nowhere near the level of individuals like Hisoka. Gon has always been the type to be very strategic, and I love how in this arc he implements his strategy with his newfound Nen abilities. Through his talent for strategizing, he was able to land a clean hit on Hisoka, and when it comes to Killua, he continues to prove that he is one of the scariest characters in the series. He is very intimidating, and we see this when he makes Sadaso forfeit his match. It is very easy to forget that he is a assassin when he is being playful and childish with Gon, but I really do like that he has a softer and more gentle side, and he shows this to people that he truly cares about, like his friends. The dynamics that develop between the two characters really help to sell the friendship to us, and now moving our attention over to the individual who had taught them Nen, Wing. From his very lackluster introduction, we see that he is a very powerful individual himself. The true extent of his abilities is not really explored, but through his assessments and his analysis of all of the fighting that was going on in Heaven's Arena, we can understand and appreciate that he is a gifted fighter himself. When it is revealed that he has been in contact with Chairman Netro, we realize that he is not someone to be underestimated. For someone who appears to be disorganized and ordinary, his knowledge of Nen proves otherwise. In this arc, Gon and Killua meet a boy who is pretty much their same age. Zushi's character is a great way to understand how far removed Gon and Killua are from other 12 year olds who are also learning how to fight and utilize Nen. While Zushi's character serves to show us how talented Gon and Killua are, characters like Hisoka and other powerful individuals help us to realize that the two boys are still far from reaching their full potential. When it comes to this arc, 
I have to admit that the 2011 version does an excellent job of adapting the material from the manga, and I highly recommend experiencing the arc from that adaptation. In particular, the battle between Gon and Isoka has incredibly fluid animation, and it is one of my favourite battles to go and rewatch from the 2011 anime. Overall, I really enjoyed the Heavens Arena arc, and I am very interested about what is going to go down on September 1st in York New City. Now that we know the Phantom Troop will also be there, and Kuripika has now learnt Nen, these little plot points which are briefly mentioned in the Heavens Arena arc really do build up a sense of hype and excitement for the next arc. Revenge is the action of hurting or harming someone in return for an injury or wrong that was suffered at their hands. The York New City arc heavily explores Kuripika's desire for revenge, and incidentally, it becomes one of the most important story arcs within Hunter x Hunter. We experience a significant shift in tone, as the theme of the arc, the setting, and the story that is told becomes more mature. Through the tension that you feel and how the story becomes sinister and darker, you can see that Togashi raised the stakes and developed his writing for something very complex. This arc results in the development and maturity of several characters, especially Kurapika, as both the positive and negative aspects of his revenge are explored in depth. Some would say that the way that Togashi elevates his storytelling in this arc blurs the line between a shonen story which is predominantly aimed towards teenagers, with the senin demographic which is aimed towards young adults, and is known for darker and more mature stories. Prior to this arc, there were hints of Hunter x Hunter having a darker undertone, but during the York New City arc, these dark undertones are capitalised upon. So many different stories stories simultaneously occur during the York New City arc, each story being led by a group of characters with their own individual goals, like Gon who is continuing to search for his father. We get the introduction of concepts which foreshadow the Greed Island arc, as well as the mysterious group of antagonists the Phantom Troop finally being revealed, along with their incredibly popular fan favourite leader Crawler Lucifer. During this arc, we understand how Hunter x Hunter implements organised criminal networks through its own interpretation of the Mafia underworld, and how individuals fall into this criminal network through the way that they were nurtured, and through the environment which surrounded them and shaped their personalities. During the Heavens Arena arc, we were introduced to the new concept which is called Nen, and in this arc, more of this unique power system is explored. Togashi demonstrates during the York New City arc how different Nen users uniquely express their own Nen abilities, and how complex these abilities can actually become, and because of this, it easily makes Nen one of the most unique and well thought out power systems within shonen anime and manga. So without further ado, let's get into the York New City arc and understand how human greed results in bloodshed, scheming against one another, and losing sight of one's purpose. The York New City arc begins in chapter 64 and ends in chapter 119, spanning a total of 55 chapters. It picks up immediately after the Heavens Arena arc. We learn that Gon has been away from his home of Whale Island for six months, and he intends to return there with Killua. He receives a warm welcome from his aunt Mito and his grandmother. Killua is introduced to his family. After hearing Gon's intentions to begin searching for his father after a month's rest, Mito brings out a mysterious small box, which appears to have belonged to Jin, Gon's father. He had told to give this to Gon after he had passed the hunter exam. Once Gon uses Nen, the box immediately opens up and he discovers a message from his father on a cassette tape. Jin challenges Gon to find him, the very father who had left him behind in pursuit of his own desires. He also leaves a clue to his whereabouts in the form of a joystation console, along with a memory card and a ring. Of course, the joystation console and the memory card are shaped after the original PlayStation. Meanwhile, we learn that Kuripika has been hard at work. We discover that he has been learning Nen from a master for the past six months. He has also been looking for a job with someone who is connected to the auction which is taking place in York New City. He wants to work in close proximity to this auction because he has heard that his clan's scarlet eyes are being sold there. If the eyes are there, then there is every chance that the Phantom Troop will also be there, and it is the perfect opportunity for Kurapika to exact his revenge. After successfully passing a few tests during an interview, he becomes the bodyguard to a girl called Nostrad. She has a strange hobby of collecting body parts, as well as being the daughter of a mafia boss. Meanwhile, after Gon and Killua examine the memory card left behind by Jin, they discover a save file for a game called Greed Island. They begin to research and look for any information relating to this game. They find out that Greed Island is a rare game with only 100 copies ever being produced. The requirement to play it is to be able to utilise Nen. The boys discover that the game is being sold in the southern part of the auction which is being held in York New City. Since they are already going there to meet back up with Kurapika and Leorio on September 1st, they decide to purchase a copy there 
Upon reaching York New City and finding the Oreo, he decides to join them on their quest to find a copy of the game. During this time, we are also introduced to the Phantom Troop, who are planning to steal every item at the auction. They intend to do so by being disguised as members of the Mafia. Kuripika's first assignment as a bodyguard is to be stationed outside the auction building, while the auction is taking place. Eventually, the Phantom Troop attack the first auction. Inside the building, the people who are working alongside Kuripika are killed. After this unpredictable bloodshed that was unleashed by the Phantom Troop, they leave no traces behind of any stolen items or dead bodies, before they leave the auction room in a hot air balloon. They are discovered by the Mafia who follow the hot air balloon to a canyon outside the city. One of the Phantom Troop's members called Uvagin begins to easily slaughter the Mafia members who don't know how to use Nen. Kuripika and the rest of the bodyguards tasked to protect Nostrad watch the slaughter from afar. We then learn that the ten leaders of the Mafia, called the Ten Dons, have sent a elite group of Nen users, who are dubbed as the Shadow Beasts, to hunt and find the Phantom Troop. Uvagin fights these elite Nen users on his own. Despite being outmatched, he easily kills them with his superior Nen abilities and his brutality. However, the Shadow Beasts do manage to paralyze Uvagin. Kuripika, who is watching, is overwhelmed by his hatred for the Phantom Troop, and he wants to confront Uvagin alone. However, one of the bodyguards who is working alongside Kuripika called Melody ends up calming him down. Kuripika ends up thinking rationally and takes advantage of Uvagin, who is now paralyzed. They successfully capture him using Kuripika's Nen ability called Chain Jail. The other members of the Phantom Troop try to stop one of their own being kidnapped, but they are interrupted by the arrival of more members of the Shadow Beasts. After being captured, Uvagin is brought back to the Nostrad base for questioning. During this time, Kuripika temporarily leaves his post as a bodyguard in order to meet up with Hisoka. After the Phantom Troop defeat the remaining members of the Shadow Beasts, they eventually track down Uvagin's whereabouts, and they disguise themselves as Mafia members and kill Nostrad's bodyguards. After being freed, Uvagin swears that he is going to get his revenge on the Chain Dude, and he begins searching for him. Meanwhile, after gone, Killua and the Oreo realize that the Greed Island copies will be beginning their starting bid at 8.9 billion. They decide to come up with ways to make money. The Oreo offers to make money by hosting a arm wrestling contest with Gon. Many individuals partake in the arm wrestling contest, assuming that they would win against a 12 year old child, but Gon ends up surprising everybody, including Mafia members who realize how strong Gon is. The Mafia members eventually invite Gon and the others to a underground gathering where they are offering a reward to find the Phantom Troop members. While this is going on, another newly introduced member of the Phantom Troop called Shellnock tracks down the Chain Dude for Uvagin. He does so by using the internet and the exclusive Hunter website. When Kuripika finds out that he is being tracked, he waits for Uvagin's arrival, as they agree to fight outside the city. Kuripika and Uvagin eventually fight outside York New City. They exchange blows and Kuripika ends up using a ability called Chain Jail. He had designed this specifically for the Phantom Troop, because it allows him to suppress his opponent's strength and Nen. As well as this, we learn that when Kuripika's eyes become the scarlet colour, he can use all the Nen categories at 100%, and this ability is dubbed as Emperor Time. After Kuripika wins the battle, he questions Uvagin. After receiving little to no answers, and without Melody being there to calm him down, he is overwhelmed by his rage, and he murders Uvagin and buries him in the desert. Meanwhile, Gon, Killua, and the Oreo don't manage to get any information on the spiders. They decide to take out a loan by exchanging Gon's hunter license to pay for information on them. Gon and Killua eventually attend a street auction. They are able to discover by using their Gyo ability, they can see Nen that is being emitted from some of the items. Through this tactic, they are able to distinguish rare items from useless items, so they start bidding on items to make money. They eventually meet an expert at bidding called Zepile, who prevents them from getting ripped off. He is impressed by their ability to get rare items, and he decides to help them to make money. Back with the Phantom Troop, they suspect that Uvagin must have been killed by the Chain Dude. Nobunaga and Machi try to confirm this and find any trace of the Chain Dude. Gon and Killua follow them to their base after being tipped off by an informant. They are easily captured by the more experienced members of the Phantom Troop, and they are interrogated to see if they know anything about Kuripika. Nobunaga is impressed by their abilities and holds them as captives until Krolo arrives. Nobunaga is that impressed that he is willing to ask his leader for permission for Gon and Killua to join the spiders. Despite being trapped in a room with only one exit, Gon and Killua manage to escape from Nobunaga by breaking out through one of the walls. Killua eventually deduces that the chain dude that the spiders wanted information on is indeed Kuripika. Both Gon and Killua, who were impressed by Kuripika, decide to learn Nen from him in order to become stronger in a shorter amount of time. The underground auction then begins to go ahead as planned. The Mafia have hired professional help in the form of assassins who are able to use Nen. Among them is the Zordic family. They have been tasked to find and kill the Phantom Troop. Neon Nostrad, who Kuripika and the rest of the bodyguards were tasked to protect, ends up escaping from a 
bodyguards. She plans to attend the auction because she sees through her father's lies. Crawler ends up recognizing her and picks her up. She ends up predicting his fortune as we realize that a Nen ability is that of a fortune teller's. Upon reading the prophecy of Crawler, he begins to cry as it confirms Uvagin has died. He then ends up stealing Neon's ability and knocks her unconscious. He then tries to plan his escape from the auction building. After killing most of the assassins hired to take out the troop members, Crawler is confronted by Killua's father Silver and his grandfather Zeno. The other troop members begin killing Mafia members to avenge Uvagin. Meanwhile, Zeno and Silver fight Crawler in an intense high-level Nen battle. Crawler ends up being injured but he is still alive. They eventually stop fighting as it is revealed that the spiders hired Illumi to kill the Ten Dons. After they are killed, the Mafia can no longer make payment for the hit that they placed on the spiders. So Silver and Zeno immediately stop fighting Crawler and back out from the situation. The Phantom Troop manages to fake corpses using Cortopi's ability, and they also restart the auction pretending to be the Ten Dons. They end up auctioning off fake copies of real items using Cortopi's Nen. The Phantom Troop once again end up outsmarting the Mafia. Later, by using the stolen fortune telling ability, Crollo creates prophecies for all of the Phantom Troop members. It reveals that if they act normally and proceed as planned, then half of them will die in the coming weeks, at the hands of the Chain Dude. Crollo orders the spiders to leave York New City. However, Hisoka alters his fortune using his Nen ability text your surprise, so it ends up reading that Hisoka is being manipulated by the chain user, and if the troop leave York New City they will die. This ends up forcing the group to stay. We learn why Hisoka is being deceitful and helping Kurepeka behind the scenes. This is because he desires to fight the leader of the Phantom Troop, Krolo, on a one-on-one -on -one battle. Hisoka ends up texting Kurepeka that the dead bodies that were found were indeed fakes and the Phantom Troop are still alive. Eventually, Gon, Killua, Kurepeka and Leorio are reunited, and they decide to track down the Phantom Troop on their own. After the Mafia cancelled the battle, bounty that they placed on them. After learning that the spiders are from Meteor City, they end up finding the hideout of the Phantom Troop through using Melody's hearing ability. The group follow the spiders but Gon and Killua are captured again. Kuripika formulates a plan that he ends up relaying to the captured Gon and Killua. Kuripika ends up capturing Krolo and a ransom note is left for the Phantom Troop. The ransom note demands that the memories that Pakunoda extracted from Gon and Killua remain secret or else Krolo will be killed. They then arrange a hostage exchange over the phone. Kuripika allows Pakunoda to meet up with him first, to confirm that Krolo is still alive. During the meeting, Kuripika uses this opportunity to use his Judgment Chain ability in both Krolo and Pakunoda's heart. Each Judgment Chain has a specific condition placed onto each of their hearts. For Krolo, if he is to use Nen, then the chain will kill him, while the other that is placed on Pakunoda will kill her if she reveals Kuripika's abilities to the spiders. After the hostage exchange successfully occurs, Pakunoda ends up sacrificing herself by using her Nen ability called Memory Bomb to relay all of the information that she knows about Kuripika to the rest of the spiders. She hopes that her sacrifice will save the lives of the remaining members. The arc ends up concluding after Hisoka is disappointed when he learns that Krolo can no longer use Nen, and he decides to give up on his pursuit to fight him. This is a really brief, abridged summary of all of the events that occur in the York New City arc. Now we'll be going over the various different aspects of world building, which are conveyed to us during this arc by Togashi, examining any similarities to our own real world, as well as trying to understand any references to symbolism, which Togashi may have implemented in order to expand the world of Hunter x Hunter. Starting off, there are many parallels between the fictional York New City to the real world New York City. One of the most interesting ones is the Mafia. The Nostrad family which Kuripika ends up working for as a bodyguard is based on the real world Cosa Nostra Sicilian Mafia. Obviously having Italian roots, they successfully run their criminal organization in New York. The Tendons are also based on the infamous top five New York Mafia families. In Hunter x Hunter, the Mafia represents a hierarchical structure similar to the Hunter organization. However, the Mafia are underground players involved in organized crime. During this arc, Togashi highlights that even criminals follow a code and some sort of structure. They exist to meet human demand for distasteful taboo material objects, which are not available in the mainstream. An example of this is the selling of human body parts, like the Kurta clan's scarlet eyes. If the wealthy elite's hedonism and moral nihilism didn't exist, then there would be no demand for the Mafia to sell these taboo and unethical items. The Mafia also represent our ego and humanity's thirst for power. Some humans try to work to the top of whatever hierarchical structure, even if it is a criminal hierarchy. This is represented by Light Nostrad, as he uses his daughter's Nen ability to climb the Mafia ranks, and he does so for the sole purpose of gaining more power. This character is even willing to manipulate and use his daughter, his own flesh and blood. When he is confronted by Zenji, another mob boss, he highlights that the only reason Nostrad worked up the Mafia hierarchy so fast from a low rank is because of his daughter's prophecy ability. You can see that Zenji is a loudmouth and he doesn't have the best appearance, as opposed to the 
cool, calm, and collected light Nostrad. Togashi here clearly wants his audience to judge a character by their intentions and not their appearance. Nostrad intends to manipulate his daughter for more power, easily making him one of the most despisable mafia bosses, even more so than Zenji. So it is comic justice when Krollo steals her Nen ability, freeing her from her father's manipulation, and consequently putting a stop to his thirst for more power. Another real world parallel that Takashi draws upon is mainstream religion. We can speculate that Krollo represents the Antichrist with his upside down cross and his 12 disciples, which are the spider members. In mysticism and numerology, Jesus is represented as the number 8. Jesus rose on the 8th day after he was crucified. The 8th day marks the beginning of a new life. Krollo and Kuripika represent the number 8 as Krollo is 26 years old, 2 plus 6 which is 8, and Kuripika is 17 years old, 1 plus 7 which is 8. Krollo's last name is Lucifer, which is also 8 letters, and learning through a Hunter Hunter data book, Krollo is a Scorpio, which is the 8th zodiac sign. The Phantom Troop, which Krollo is the leader of, is also referred to as the Spiders, which we all know have 8 legs. The number 8 and its relation to the Antichrist symbolize Krollo's ideology. In Christianity and Islam, it is believed that the Antichrist will imitate the Messiah by deceiving the people and claiming to be Jesus himself. Instead of giving power to his disciples to cast out unclean spirits as Jesus did, Krollo seems to collect them through how he steals other people's Nen abilities. This is what his Nen represents, demonic spirits stolen and preserved by Krollo. He could then use these demons to overpower his opponents, rather than being gifted his powers from God like Jesus. In addition, there is also Krollo's view on death, which he relays to Kuripika while he is captured in the car with him. Krollo himself has accepted that his life is of no significance, and he has accepted his own death. Melody even comments that he is indeed telling the truth. He welcomes death as a liberating outcome from the suffering of the mortal world. This is how he justifies killing others. He believes that the people that he has killed should be thanking him, as they have left for a better place now. This is the opposite of Jesus, as he saved and preserved life, even being known to resurrect the dead, heal the blind, and bringing life to clay birds. Hisoka's character was even alluded to being a Judas, but unlike Judas, he doesn't want to betray Krollo for any monetary or material gain. His desire is to confront and fight Krollo as the leader of the Phantom Troop. This is to satisfy his bloodlust and to test his abilities. In the context of Krollo being an antichrist, his betrayal could be symbolized as heroic, if he did indeed manage to kill Krollo. And to add another point about Hisoka's character, when the other spider members become fatalistic when they read their prophecies, he uses his Nen ability Texture Surprise to change his own prophecy. He acts as a metaphor for humans making their own truths and being in charge of their own fate. And of course, I have to talk about Kuripika and his holy chain, which is in the shape of a cross, and he uses this to heal wounds. Kuripika uses limitations and conditions on himself, similar to a religious vow, and he does this in order to make his ability stronger. In many religions, you have to restrict yourself and control your desires and devote yourself to God in order to gain spiritual enlightenment. Also, Kuripika's Emperor Time ability is similar to the idea of enlightenment in Buddhism. Kuripika is able to break away from his Nen type of a conjurer and use all other types of Nen at 100% ability. He removes all restrictions and achieves enlightenment. In addition to this, the name of Kuripika's abilities also have religious symbolism. His Nen abilities are called Judgment Chain and Holy Chain. By getting vengeance for the murder of his clan, Kuripika believes he is bringing justice by killing his oppressors and restoring honour to his fallen clan. He is behaving like a vengeful god. By using his Judgment Chain, he is enacting divine justice onto the oppressors. I believe that Togashi has done all of this intentionally to give his story more depth and build a more detailed world, one that we can draw parallels from and to compare to our own world. Togashi also emphasises environmental and social factors which end up shaping his character's values. Whale Island is a wilderness with a very small human population, which reflects Gon's personality of being wild and free. This is a contrast to Killua, as he came from a structured environment, and he was trained as an assassin from a young age. Togashi purposefully juxtaposes the upbringing and the environment in which the characters were raised in. Like between Gon and Killua, there is a distinction between the two of them, and their family atmosphere. Gon's family is very caring and loving, while Killua had a very harsh, cold, and calculated upbringing. And this is because his whole life had been chosen for him. He is told that he will be the next head of the Zordic family, and it is imperative for him to learn the family business by learning assassin skills as effectively as possible. And this is compared to Gon, who is completely free and decides what he wants to do with his own life, which we know from his desire is to find his father and to become a professional hunter like his old man. In regards to the Phantom Troop, they are from Meteor City, which is a junkyard city inhabited by outcasts. People who live there do not exist in official records. Growing up in these conditions shapes the spiders, as they represent organised chaos and anarchy, as opposed to the mafia who represent structured criminality. Due to being abandoned by the outside world, people who are raised in Meteor City have a different concept of life and have 
have differing values. After Uvagin massacres the Mafia in the canyon, one of their mobsters survives and he threatens the spider's family members. Fatan mockingly asks him what a family is. This shows those who grow up in the environment of Meteor City have no concept of what we would consider normal. The inhabitants of Meteor City share a bond described as thinner than water and yet thicker than blood. This explains why the spiders mourn the loss of Uvagan, and their leader Krollo even ended up crying for him. The Phantom Troop have no issue with stealing and killing, because they were brought up in an environment where they didn't have anything, and they had no identity of their own. They did not grow up with normal moral values. This makes them moral nihilists. These environmental and social factors shaped the Phantom Troop. That's why even if Killua is successful in killing every member of the Phantom Troop, if he does not address the conditions of Meteor City, then more like them will appear. As the Phantom Troop are not a group of thieves or a collection of individuals. Their group represents an ideology, and this ideology was shaped and formed in Meteor City. Krollo represents this ideology when he says that his life holds no meaning, so he is useless as a hostage. Kudipika is faced with this ideology when he realizes that he may be able to kill the leader of the troop, but it will not stop them. This is why Uvagin refused to give up any information about the Phantom Troop before he died. His silence is credited to the indoctrination from the ideology that they believe in. You may be able to kill the Phantom Troop, but you cannot kill the idea behind it. The the same environmental factors which helped to shape the Phantom Troop are now shaping others in Meteor City. This helps to explain why the Mafia cancelled the hit on the spiders when they learnt where they were from, because most of the people who the Mafia hire as assassins or hitmen are maladjusted people from Meteor City. Meteor City is mentioned again in an upcoming arc where it is explored further, so it's definitely not the last time that I'll be bringing it up. Some people consider Gon and Killua's involvement in this arc to be shoehorned into a story which is really about Kudipika's revenge, but in my opinion, like the previous arcs, their involvement is very significant, because their innocence is contrasted against the human greed and dishonesty that they encounter. Through taking part in the auctions, they witness how people will do anything to minimise their losses and maximise their earnings. They will partake in a number of underhanded tactics in order to deceive one another, and this ultimately ends up complicating the very simple process of buying and selling goods. There really is no such thing as a honest transaction. We also learn during this portion of the arc that inanimate objects also emit aura. Through Gon and Killua using Gyo, they are able to easily find rare items. It is Gon who notices that someone else called Zepile is bidding on the exact same rare items that they are. Through using their tactic, they were able to secure 3 out of 4 items which were emitting a Nen aura. Because they can't sell these auctions at the classic auction, they are forced to go to an antiques dealer. The dealer offers to buy their items for 500,000, but Zepile steps in and tells the boys that the dealer isn't offering them a fair price, and he is taking advantage of their naivety and their inexperience, literally trying to take candy from a baby. For greed, humans are even willing to take advantage of children. Zepal teaches Gon and Killua how traders forge items by using techniques like welding, exposing, and sidestepping. We also learn how Zepal was able to identify the rare items which were emitting Nen aura, without himself being able to use Nen. He had been using a technique called sizing up. Gon and Killua themselves can learn to use this ability in order to intuitively detect the quality even within people. Gon and Killua use the sidestepping technique in order to escape from Nobunaga, and through their interactions with this newly introduced character Zepile, Togashi is able to implement maturity and growth for Gon and Killua in a story which isn't even centred around them. The two boys are in a very complicated world, and it isn't straightforward. They both have to be constantly stepping out of their comfort zones, and embracing new situations and concepts in the pursuit of constant progression. As a side note, Togashi during this arc also foreshadows how Nen emitting items are more durable and can be used in Nen battles. We see this through Krollo using Ben's knife in his fight against Silver and Xenozoldic. Now I want to turn my attention over to the individual characters who feature within this arc. I want to focus on understanding their motives and their reasoning behind their actions. Let's start off with none other than Kuripika, who I feel like this arc was written for. A quote from Star Wars that Yoda the Jedi Master states is very relevant to Kuripika's character. Yoda says that fear leads to anger, and anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. This quote perfectly encapsulates what Kuripika's character experiences during the York New City arc. His suffering is caused by his overwhelming hatred for the Phantom Troop. Togashi pays particular attention to this in the York New City arc, in order to make Kuripika the archetypal Avenger. However, you have to ask yourself, is Kuripika a simple Avenger, or has Togashi made a purposeful effort in this arc to make Kuripika's character more nuanced than just a Avenger? And this is exactly what I want to cover in this breakdown of Kuripika's character. The first thing to note is that there is a significant change that occurs between the Kuripika who we have seen up until 
until this point, and the character who we see six months later now knowing Nen and working for the Nostrad family. There is a pronounced shift in his personality and his psychology when it comes to Kuripika's character in the York New City arc. We get a brief glimpse of the anger and hatred that Kuripika holds for the Phantom Troop during the Hunter exam arc. When a prisoner during the third phase of the exam pretends to be a member of the Phantom Troop, you can see the change in Kuripika's mood and his personality whenever the Phantom Troop is mentioned. In some instances, his eyes even turn into the scarlet colour. The change in eye colour occurs to members of the Kurta clan when they are emotionally distressed. I feel that this change of eye colour is a great homage to the Kurta clan, because the Phantom Troop had killed all of the Kurta clan for their scarlet eyes. When their eyes turn this scarlet colour, they are described as being more beautiful than even the most precious diamond in the world, and for Kuripika there is so much hatred behind the beauty of his eyes. When these spiders are mentioned, it is like Kuripika is possessed by a raging demon. Because he is the last of his clan members, nobody else will truly be able to understand the pain and anguish that he is feeling. Typically, Kuripika is very intelligent and he is one of the more rational characters, so it is a striking contrast to see him give in to his emotions and his feelings of hatred to the extent that it becomes self-destructive. We see Kuripika who is about to act on his self-destructive urge to confront Uvagin and the Phantom Troop members on his own, until he is stopped by Melody when she uses her Nen ability to calm the enraged Kuripika. In this instance, if he continued to be overwhelmed by his emotions, he would have confronted the Phantom Troop and it would have led to his death. It is an effective way for Togashi to show us how affected Kuripika is by the tragic massacre of his clan. Sadly, we are forced to experience this change of this character who is usually intelligent and very compassionate, and someone who has a defined set of values and a strong moral compass, being broken down by his feelings of revenge and hatred because of the heartless actions of a criminal group. In the York New City arc, Kuripika is a far cry from the character who accompanied Leorio and Gon in order to rescue Killua from his family. In that short period of time, the character that we come to know is completely different to this character that we see here. At the end of the Zordic family arc, everybody innocently goes in their own way. Personally, I didn't think too into what Kuripika was doing, but upon further inspection, since the very beginning of the series, he was on a path of revenge. He had to get his hunter's license in order to gain more information about the Phantom Troop and to open more doors for himself so that he could get closer to the Phantom Troop and to make himself stronger in order to encounter them one day. By following this path of revenge, Kuripika puts at risk his humanity, as it is clearly stated that he has not killed anyone up until this point, and in the York New City arc, his revenge leads him to committing his first murder. Taking the life of another is a heavy burden to place upon your soul, and this clearly highlights that Kuripika is not this innocent, infallible character that we see at the start of the series. When he forms his friendships with Gon, Killua, and Leorio, the relationship that the four of them share together is deceptive, because when we explore each of the individual individual characters, they are all flawed in some way, and they all have a tendency to give in to their emotions and to even commit wrong, which completely subverted my expectations, as I thought they were a group of happy-go-lucky cheerful characters. Out of the four characters, Togashi decides to dissect and break down Kuripika's character and lay him bare for us all to see in this arc. In the subsequent arcs, we do get a similar treatment with Gon and Killua, and even Leorio to some extent. I am incredibly interested by the way that Togashi writes his characters, how after a first inspection, you typically apply typical storytelling tropes to them, and personality traits which you have seen so many times before to them. But as the story continues, Togashi betrays your expectations, and he leaves you feeling dumbfounded through the way that he exposes the darker sides of his characters, and how this darkness has always been there from the very beginning. We see the evil in the good, and we see the seeds of these character dissections planted well before they occur. Another example is how Wing was fearful of teaching Gon Nen. He even likened him to being a monster, and we see this very description of a monster being actualized during the Chimera Antark, after Gon can no longer contain his emotions through his anger and hatred that he feels towards Pito. Kuripika's revenge leads him to joining the Mafia and the despicable Nostrad family. Neo Nostrad, despite her cute appearance, has a disgusting taboo hobby. She collects human body parts. To describe her character, she is very self-centered, materialistic, and lacks empathy. An example of her twisted behavior is when she had ordered an actual dead body to be put on display inside her mansion. This body had belonged to a former bodyguard who had failed in his duties. She clearly had a elite and very sheltered upbringing. Every one of her desires was satisfied, and any of the wrongdoing that she had committed was masked with money. It is very easy to just judge the characters that Togashi illustrates and writes by their appearances or their first impressions, but these surface level inspections pale in comparison to the truth about the characters that Togashi writes. Neon's father, Light Nostrad, is no better than her, as he is using his daughter's Nen ability to climb up the Mafia ranks for power, like I had mentioned before. Kuripika stoops to the level of working for this Mafia family, and in doing so, he 
is taking part in a corrupt underworld system. From what we have seen up until this point, Kuropika is a compassionate person and someone who values the friendships and the bonds that he forms with others. However, while being a part of this mafia family, he is not able to form a bond with anyone except from Melody. He didn't really form any substantial relationships in the York New City arc with any of the new characters that were introduced. This is shown firsthand by his lack of empathy that he feels when the other bodyguards working for the Nostrad family are killed. Kuropika shows little to no compassion for them. He had even used the death of Daisoline as an advantage to become the head bodyguard of the Nostrad family. The only comment that he makes about the situation is that he didn't expect to become the head bodyguard in such a short amount of time. His desire for revenge and his feelings of hatred have turned him into someone who is very selfish and egotistical. He has adopted the philosophy that to confront evil, one must be able to do evil. At this point, you have to hope that he hasn't been consumed by his dark feelings, because the hatred that he feels will ultimately leave him with an empty void that he will find difficult to fill. This empty void will prevent him from finding inner peace and will ultimately result in his suffering. The hatred is matched by his motivation to bring justice to his fallen clan members. Togashi highlights this during Kuripika's flashback during his Nen training sequence with his master Izunavi. After his Nen training is completed, we learn that he is a conjurer type. He chooses to conjure chains because he believes that certain people need to be dragged to hell. At this point, we are convinced that he is a archetypal shonen avenger with a single-minded goal that he is narrowly fixated upon to the point that it is dangerous. The fire that burns within Kuripika gives him a fierce determination, which leads him to undertake extreme measures, which he justifies as being necessary. This is demonstrated when his master Izunavi explains that conjuring unbreakable chains is impossible. However, if Kuripika were to make a contract with himself in which he imposes strict conditions and swears to abide by stricter limitations, then the greater the power that he will gain. To explain the huge power surge that Kuripika has within six months, we learn that he had made such a contract with himself in order to gain a substantial amount of power in a short amount of time. He had done so by using his ability called Judgment Chain to wrap a blade around his heart to increase his Nen by setting conditions and limitations upon himself. He explains this to Gon when Gon wonders how on earth he has gained so much power and such powerful Nen abilities. This is like his religious vow to avenge his fallen brethren and to collect their eyes, even if he has to risk his own life to do so. He may have the typical trope of being on the path of revenge, but Togashi challenges certain shonen tropes, especially with the way that Kuripika becomes so powerful in such a short amount of time. I mean, quite simply, we are left surprised by his Nen mastery at the Nostrad mansion during his job interview. When you see quick power-ups, they are usually associated with the villain or antagonist. For example, Hody Jones when he uses energy steroids during the Fishman Island arc in One Piece. Or to counter Sasuke's Mangekyo Sharingan, Danzo uses Izanagi from the Uchiha eyes attached to his arm. In contrast, the Phantom Troop obtain their Nen powers through training or life and death situations, so their abilities and powers are explained through natural and organic progression. Even Killua's father notes that Krolo has gotten stronger from the last time that they fought. This is ultimately another example of Togashi subverting some well-established shonen tropes and cliches, while also giving his story a unique and natural flow to it, which doesn't feel forced. Because of Kuripika placing limits and conditions on himself, he has obtained greater Nen powers. Through making that religious vow, he has obtained the power in order to avenge his clan. However, through Kuripika obtaining these Nen abilities, this symbolizes that he needs to restrict his identity and who he once was. Through placing a chain on his own heart, it connotates that he needs to forcibly change his personality and restrain his conscience. He needs to become someone who lacks empathy and remorse and sympathy. When he says that he conjures chains to drag individuals to hell, the chain that he placed on his own heart is dragging himself to hell. Revenge indeed is a double-edged sword as it takes a huge emotional toll on a character, especially one that has a conscience. We see this emotional toll during Kuripika's fight against Uvagin. He is angered by his opponent when he realizes that he doesn't even remember the names of his victims and how loyal he is to the Phantom Troop and won't give up any information on them. The enemies that Kuripika holds so much hatred towards appear to have a code of honor as Uvagin demonstrates the loyalty that they have for each other. During this fight, Kuripika states that the smell of blood is throwing his senses into disarray. This is leading him to lose control of his psyche. Ultimately, Kuripika's actions are harming his own soul. When he uses the judgment chain on Uvagin and he is still persistent not to give up any information about the spiders, it proves how much of a close bond the members of the Phantom Troop share with each other. Like I mentioned previously, they are a group of thieves, but it is their ideology which gives them power. Because they were born from the environmental and social conditions of Meteor City, they are a force to be reckoned with. Kuripika cannot end what the Phantom Troop stand for, because if he kills the members of the Phantom Troop, then others will appear in their place with the exact same ideology to replace them. You may sympathize with Kuripika's quest for revenge, since his clan was massacred horrifically, but you have to ask yourself, is this quest for revenge justified? Typically in our world, and even in the world of Hunter x Hunter, 
justice is usually carried out by an impartial third party who follow the law and order of the society, relying on a judge to pass righteous judgment down onto a criminal. We rely on the criminal justice system to lay down its hammer on those who commit moral wrongdoings, both to individuals and society as a whole. This law and order that we rely upon gives society structure and meaning. Without it, there would be anarchy and chaos. Justice is rational and impartial. There is no bias. Vengeance, on the other hand, is emotional and personal, and filled with bias. When Kuripika meets with Hisoka, Hisoka tells him that he had killed and replaced the former fourth member of the Phantom Troop a few years ago. What this proves is that some of the current members of the Phantom Troop may not have even taken part in the Kurita clan massacre, but we know that Kuripika doesn't care about this fact. Ever since the beginning of the Hunter exam arc, when he is on the ship sailing to the exam location, he tells the ship's captain that his ultimate goal is to kill every last member of the Phantom Troop. Is Kuripika justified in killing members of the Phantom Troop who didn't even take part in the massacre of the Kurta clan? If he is killing people innocent of the crime he is accusing them of, then this isn't justified. Kuripika's feelings of revenge will not solve anything, and it will only lead to Kuripika feeling emptiness in the end. The protagonists that feature within Togashi's stories are usually morally grey. Togashi did indeed give Kuripika a very dark goal, as he is targeting villains or even characters who could be considered as anti-heroes. This adds complexity to his character, and we know that Kuripika doesn't take pleasure in killing. We can see this in his despondent look in his eyes after he has killed Uvagin. However, his hatred and his feelings of vengeance force him to continue on this path because he has already sacrificed so much to get to this point. He had developed his Nen and he had integrated himself within the underworld. He continues his suffering, but we know all too well that the path that he is on will never give him closure or inner peace. It may sound wishy-washy, but the only way that he will attain closure is through forgiveness and understanding. Like I mentioned before, upon first inspection, Kuripika appears to be intelligent and very caring, and you can see that he is like this because he has known what it feels like to be loved and to love another. The extent of the hatred that he feels proves that he had a strong and deep bond with the other members of his clan. He is ultimately suffering on this path of revenge because he can't let go of these bonds that he has formed. After the Phantom Troop end up faking their deaths and leaving replacement corpses using Kotopi's ability, Kuripika returns to the second family that he has formed. He goes to meet his friends Gon, Killua, and Leorio in the park. Gon mentions that the spiders are dead, and Kuripika can now focus on his other goal of collecting the clan's scarlet eyes. During this very rare and brief moment, we see Kuripika smile, and actually have a joyous moment during the York New City arc. In this scene, he had a moment of relief from his suffering. Even we as an audience can understand that it isn't healthy for Kuripika to go down this route, and he needs to surround himself with the company of people who value and love him, like his newfound friends do. He was able to build a deep connection with Gon and the others, despite not having known them for a long period of time. This proves that he still has that kind, gentle, and sympathetic nature within him. Later on, Krolo also notices Kuripika's ability to form deep bonds during the hostage exchange. During that hostage exchange situation, Kuripika is more concerned with the safety of his friends, rather than giving into his feelings of revenge by killing Krolo and thus endangering the lives of his friends. He clearly doesn't want to lose the connections that he has built again with these characters. The friendships that he has formed have served to fill a void within Kuripika's life. We can understand that the psychology of Kuripika is far more nuanced than the hateful, furious, and determined Avenger that Togashi tries to portray him as at the beginning of this arc. We discover the nuance in Kuripika's character through the weakness that he feels, through the bonds that he has formed with others. His relationships with Gon, Killua, and Leorio humanize Kuripika Kuripika's character. You also know that Kuripika hasn't entirely sold his soul for this quest of revenge. If he had, then he wouldn't have cared about the lives of his friends and he would have sacrificed them in order to kill the members of the Phantom Troop. Wrapping up my thoughts on Kuripika and his involvement in this arc, I ask myself if he will continue on this path of darkness, which will ultimately lead him to be consumed by his hate. Will he lose this moral compass that he has, and the compassion that he shows for others? I hope that Kuripika can see past his feelings of revenge, and allow the relationships that he has formed with his friends to bring him some closure, and some light to the the end of this tunnel. It remains to be seen whether or not Kuripika will have this enlightening moment, where he will reflect upon his actions and his feelings of revenge and hatred, which act as emotional shackles for his character. We have to see if he gives in to his revenge and kills the other members of the Phantom Troop, or learns to preserve his humanity by not stooping to their level. Let's now look at one of the main antagonists of this arc, and the leader of the Phantom Troop. Yes, I'm talking about Krolo Lucilva. Villains usually complement the heroes. Like the protagonist, they have an extensive backstory or an interesting motivation. When I think of a well-written villain within the shonen genre, I recall characters like Sosuke Aizen or Light Yagami. In order to write a complex and well-written villain, the author must go in-depth into their strengths and their vices, and how these two dynamics have a direct consequence on the villain's personality traits. Villains are incredibly interesting to analyse, because they can be written to be relatable or realistic. Despite not being able to agree with their sinister plans and their evil actions, you can somehow sympathise with them on a human level, when you understand their backstory, which explains 
explains how they became a villain. In the case of Crawler Lucilva, he is an enigma because whenever we see him, it is clear that he has detached himself from his emotions. He is difficult to read and he doesn't give off any form of aura which would give away his intentions. This results in him coming across as being very calm and unflinching as he has disassociated himself from his environment. This results in his character being very mysterious. There is a certain level of allure to a character like this. You begin to feel curious about the unknown nature of Crollo. What are his true intentions? What is the explanation of the mystery behind his character? I believe that Togashi made him like this on purpose so that we try to dig deeper and analyze the characteristics beyond the intense sinister eyes and the dark edgy appearance that he has. We are first introduced to Crollo during a group meeting with the other members of the Phantom Troop in an abandoned area outside of York New City. The Phantom Troop are awaiting orders and they contemplate what items that they are going to steal from the auction. This is when Crollo orders the spiders to steal everything and to eliminate anyone who gets in their way. Ubergin wonders if Crollo is serious as the auction is run by mafia gangs from around the world. Crollo is confident that the spiders have both the physical and mental endurance to overcome any obstacle that may come in their way. We quickly learn that Crollo values individuals who are skilled and strong above everyone else. This is shown when he is pleased with Ubergin's answer after he had asked him if he is afraid. Also, he allows Isoka to do as he pleases and even though Kurepika kills Ubergin, Machi mentions Crollo wants to recruit him. If you consider how the Phantom Troop is structured and how the individuals are recruited, you can become a member if you defeat and replace one of the spiders, once again proving how much he values the skilled and the strong. Another way to gain entry into the Phantom Troop is if Crollo is impressed by your capabilities and approves of your strength. Through his actions and his beliefs, we can assume that Crollo adheres to the survival of the fittest and social Darwinism philosophy. The strong are the only ones worthy of consideration and respect. If you want to survive in this cruel world, then you need to gain strength. Weakness is not an option. I am sure that a character like Crollo would go as far as to conclude that the weak deserve to be punished and the strong should be rewarded. Crollo defines an individual's strength and weaknesses through their nen abilities, as well as their mental and physical fortitude. We can appreciate that the beliefs that Crollo has adopted were formed through his environmental and social conditions, as he was raised in Meteor City, an abandoned junkyard where everyone is just trying to survive. This environment certainly sounds like it adheres to the principles of survival of the fittest. Morality can be seen as an arbitrary, vague social construct. In other words, it is a loosely defined concept that depends on the discretion of those using it in order to determine its definition. I believe that this definition of morality is what suits Crollo best. Through this belief, his perspective has been shaped. This explains why he must find it easy to order the other troop members to kill others so easily. Note how he wasn't afraid and didn't hesitate when he had ordered the phantom troop members to kill all those who got in the way when they were about to loot the auction. He had also commanded the spiders to go absolutely crazy in order to avenge Uvergen and to take their wrath out on the Mafia. Clearly, his sense of morality is defined by whatever action would benefit him the most in that particular moment, regardless of the consequences of this action. Each individual relies on their own sense of morality to guide their actions. There is no objective revelation like a holy book, a human rights charter, or constitution that defines morality completely. From the perspective of morality that Crollo adopts, any offensive violence isn't necessary, but it can be justified. In the same context, murder may be moral wrong but it is justified as long as it helps you to achieve your goals. The Mafia use violence in order to keep their underground criminal organizations profitable. The government uses violence in order to maintain law and order. Even the Hunter Association partakes in violence in order to achieve its own goals. The only difference is that they operate within a legitimate structure and work their way into the mainstream. However, the Phantom Troop's actions are considered villainous because they are outcasts and they operate on the edge of society. Krollo views the world from this perspective of moral nihilism and by extension the other members of the Phantom Troop to adopt this ideological perspective. Uvergin is the perfect example of this as he says that he has felt nothing for his victims while Kurapika interrogates him. Because he is not chained by a moral compass or bound by any values, he feels that there are no consequences for his actions. As long as his actions, no matter how evil they are, lead to him fulfilling his goal, then he doesn't care even if the other members of the Phantom Troop have to be sacrificed for this outcome. And this is where his morality and freedom can be compared to Kurapika's. Despite his feelings of hatred and revenge, Kurapika still adheres to moral principles. This is why he chooses to exchange hostages instead of allowing Gon and Killua to be killed if he had given in to his feelings of revenge by killing the leader of the Phantom Troop, the one who was behind the massacre of his clan. The freedom that Krollo has is taken away from him by Kuripika at the end of the York New City arc. Through his Nen ability judgment chain, he was able to put restrictions onto Krollo. Fittingly, through the justice chain, justice was enforced onto Krollo for all of his atrocities and morally questionable activities that he had partaken in, all for the sake 
sake of actualizing the goals of his criminal group. Trollo can also be described to adopt the philosophical view of pessimism, as he believes that there is no meaning or purpose to existence. This is why he accepts his death so easily when Kuripika captures him. He says that he feels at peace in a situation which would make an ordinary person tremble. Melody confirms that he is indeed telling the truth, and she is troubled by how unfazed he is by the situation. If he is indeed pessimistic, then he must believe that the best thing for a human to do is to not exist. If Kuripika kills him, then he is content as his suffering will end, and he won't need to maintain strength in order to survive in a cruel world. He hopes that the troop members would share this ideology. He reiterates that there is no value in keeping him as a hostage, because these spiders can survive without a head. He also advises Pakunoda to notice that Kuripika is more concerned about his friends than his feelings of vengeance. He shares this information with her so that she may be able to use Kuripika's weakness against him. Krolo believes that an attachment to anything or anyone is unnecessary. He believes that people are always striving for that which is out of reach. Even if they attain it, they are never fully satisfied, so it is best to detach yourself from relationships and material objects. This worldview is confirmed when the troop members don't find any items to steal at the auction house. Uvagin suspects that there might be a traitor amongst the spiders, but Krolo tells him that there isn't a traitor, because none of the phantom troop members care for money, glory, or prestige. Like I mentioned previously, the worldview that Krolo adopts stems from the environmental and social conditions of Meteor City. In this place, there are no laws and no moral code. Because there is no law and order in Meteor City, any action, good or evil, is considered to be legitimate. In an environment like this, the belief of nihilism is easily adopted. This completely gets rid of the need to become attached to relationships and materialisms. These concepts are considered to be unnecessary, because ultimately there is no meaning behind existence. The ideology of pessimism is born out of a lack of identity, and through having no family. And this is the opposite of Kuripika, who has lost everything. He was born with a purpose, and surrounded by people who loved him. But now having lost everything, his newfound purpose of revenge is justified by his moral belief that actions have consequences. Kuripika has indeed nothing to lose because he has lost everything. But it is Krolo and the other members of the Phantom Troop who have everything to lose, including their freedoms which they have adopted from their nihilistic worldview. It would be easy to come to the conclusion that Krolo is a cruel, apathetic psychopath, but his character is slightly more nuanced than this. We do get to appreciate a wry glimpse of the humanity within his character. He may be committed to his behaviour of detachment and his belief of pessimism, but he himself has formed an unorthodox bond with the other members of the Phantom Troop. And Togashi demonstrates this through Krolo shedding tears for Uvagin after he had heard Neon's prophecy confirming his death. We don't know if Uvagin was one of the founding members of the Phantom Troop, who had originated from Meteor City. Did he grow up with Krolo and experience suffering through their shared environment? Even if he doesn't believe in bonds, it is hard for Krolo to hide his emotions when it comes to the other spiders. He is affected to the point that he dedicates a requiem for Uvagin through deciding to kill the Mafia. Also, if you notice the wording of Neon's prophecy, it states that the calendar loses a precious component. The remaining months gather to mourn. The words precious and mourn were used. Through this prophecy, Krolo comes to the realization that the other members of the Phantom Troop may not strictly adhere to his ideology, and thus too will be affected emotionally by the death of Uvagin. And this is indeed proven when we see Nobunaga mourn for the death of Uvagin. Nobunaga is even willing to start a confrontation with Krolo after he had decided that they are leaving York New City. He confronts him because he wants vengeance for the death of Uvagin. Despite Krolo's decision to not continue to pursue the chain user, Pakunoda decides to take Gon and Killua for the hostage exchange. The other members of the Phantom Troop could have easily kill them and abandon their boss and replaced him. But Pakunoda ultimately sacrifices herself by using her memory bomb ability to give information on Kuripika to the rest of the members. When she is alone with Gon and Killua, she even asks them why is it that they are not trying to escape, since her injuries won't allow her to catch up with them. It would be an ideal situation because the Phantom Troop would lose their leverage and Kuripika would be able to kill Krolo, but the boys explain that they don't want Kuripika to give in to his hatred, because they know that it is making him suffer. Pakunoda was grateful for the decision that the boys had made, because because she doesn't want to lose the precious component of the Phantom Troop, which is their head, Krolo. Tagashi always shows the human side to his villains or antagonists, and he turns them into very sympathetic characters. We see this in particular with Meruem in the Chimera Antark, and we see this here with the Phantom Troop members. Ultimately, what is defined as good or evil is the character's intentions, and not the role that they are playing in the larger story. Krolo has the power to steal other people's Nen abilities, and I feel like this symbolizes the identity issues that he has. Because of his upbringing in Meteor City, we 
we can see that his Nen ability seems to fill a void of emptiness that he feels. Through stealing the abilities of others, he is indirectly stealing their identity, because each person has a unique expression of Nen. So by stealing their abilities, he is in a way stealing their identity. Having an identity is essential, as it shapes our personality and who we are. Did he realize that other people who had been raised in Meteor City were also searching for a meaning and purpose? And was it for this reason that he had formed the Phantom Troop, as a way to fill that feeling of emptiness that they may feel, through having no identity of their own. By being in the Phantom Troop, they have one more thing to define their identity with. In addition to this, when Gon asks him how he can kill people who haven't done anything to him, Krollo reflects on that question and ponders if it's the key to understanding himself. Hisoka mentions that other than killing and stealing, the Phantom Troop even engage in philanthropy. When I had first watched Hunter x Hunter, I thought that he was being sarcastic, but now I'm not so sure. Could it be that the Phantom Troop are Togashi's twisted version of the Robin Hood legend? A group of outcasts who are willing to steal from anyone and give back to Meteor City in order to maintain it. Robin Hood has a talent for disguising himself, and similar to the legend, Krollo also puts on different disguises because he doesn't have an identity. The Nen abilities in his book are just a collection of different personas. Also, his Nen ability is called Bandit's Secret. You have to wonder if the Bandit's Secret holds the answer to the mystery behind his character. But unlike Krollo, Robin Hood steals from the rich and gives to the poor because he is a generous person, whereas Krollo steals objects and Nen abilities in order to break down systems and to introduce anarchy into the world. We are able to confirm this through his actions in the York New City arc, but we cannot confirm any of the philanthropic activities that Hisoka claims that the Phantom Troop partake in. Krollo is surprised when the Zordics lose interest in the fight with him, when the Tendons are killed, ending their contractual obligations. He is fascinated by how the Assassins conduct themselves, and the code of conduct that the Zordic family live by. Silver states that he refuses to work for nothing or die for nothing. After they leave, Krollo is frustrated that he wasn't able to steal their powers. He was even contemplating to capture Silver Zordic. This highlights that Krollo isn't only after Nen abilities and stealing material possessions, he will even resort to kidnapping people. When it comes to the members of the Phantom Troop, Shalnak brings up the fact that Shizuku and Pakunoda have rare abilities, and that they cannot be replaced easily. It is also worth mentioning that each member within the Spiders has a different role, Nobunaga and Uvagin being the troop's attackers, Shizuku, Pakunoda, and Shalnak being information gatherers. The different members of the Phantom Troop are prizes worthy of stealing in their own right, as each of them have very different personas and identities. They all serve to fill a empty void within Krollo, giving himself a sense of identity by giving him a family to protect. Kuripika takes away a part of Krollo's identity when he seals his Nen. Krollo can no longer use the different Nen abilities that he has stolen, which represent different personas and different identities, which serve to add another layer of identity and meaning to Krollo's character, which has now been forcibly taken away from him. Togashi has the ability to subvert tropes and cliches without compromising the flow of his story. The way that he writes his characters in service of his narrative is exceptional in my opinion. During the York New City arc, Kuripika's character goes through a lot of change, and it is Krollo and the members of the Phantom Troop that are introduced into the narrative as the device to propel Kuripika through this change. And before you know it, by the end of the arc, Kuripika's character and the members of the Phantom Troop perfectly complement each other. Each of them stand out as unique, relatable, and realistic characters, who all appear to have strengths and weaknesses of their own that we can somewhat sympathize with. Now, understandably, in an arc which is focused around Kuripika's character, I have talked a lot about Kuripika and the Phantom Troop. But what about Gon and Killua, who we have been following very closely since the beginning of the story? It is no secret that they weren't given that much importance during this arc. Like I mentioned, the York New City arc was a story about Kuripika, but Togashi does indeed use Gon and Killua in order to foreshadow and set up the upcoming arc, which is the Greed Island arc. During this arc, Togashi demonstrates that Gon and Killua still need guidance in the form of their friends and other acquaintances that they meet. Without the help of Leorio, they wouldn't have come up with an effective way to earn money. Without Zeppel, they lacked the experience and knowledge and would have been taken advantage of by the other antique sellers. Gon and Killua each have their own different interactions with the members of the Phantom Troop. Togashi takes advantage of these interactions in order to demonstrate how weak Gon and Killua are when they are compared to other experienced Nen users. It is no secret, especially after the Heavens Arena arc where Gon was defeated by Hisoka, the two boys still have a lot to learn, especially about Nen. The gap in their combatability, strength, and intelligence is further emphasized when they are compared with the other members of the Phantom Troop. Gon and Killua, in a way, are effectively made useless in this arc. They had failed in their attempt to track Machi and Nobunaga to the Phantom Troop's base, and they could have been killed if Nobunaga didn't take a liking to Gon. We also get to see Illumi's influence on Killua, as we become aware that his first instinct is to run away whenever he comes across a powerful adversary. Togashi places this limitation onto Killua in order to make us curious as to how he will overcome it in the later arcs. Gon and Killua tried their best
best to be useful during this arc, even to the extent that Aya tried to contact Kuripika and asked how they could assist him. It is unfortunate, but during this arc, the two of them act as more of a burden to Kuripika than as a strength. Gon is well aware of this fact and it frustrates him. Gon is appalled by the actions of the Phantom Troop, but he is even more frustrated that he can do nothing to stop them. If you were to ask me, Togashi had purposefully diminished the role of Gon and Killua in this arc in order to develop them later on as the story progresses. I personally loved getting a break from the two of them and getting to experience Kuripika's story, especially considering that his intention to become a hunter during the Hunter Exam arc was one of the reasons why I was hooked onto the story of Hunter Hunter. I wanted to know more about Kuripika and his journey, and indeed, this arc delivered on all of the curiosity that I was feeling. On my last remarks on Gon and Killua, I loved how they were the silver lining for Kuripika, how they had diverted his attention away from his quest for revenge. They didn't want Kuripika to succumb to his hatred, and ultimately they did succeed, because Kuripika didn't give in to his darkness by the end of the arc. And now to wrap up my thoughts of the York New City arc. I believe that this arc really was Togashi flexing his skills as an excellent storyteller. The odds felt realistic, the story had excellent pacing, and there was a genuine feeling of tension during some of the moments in this arc. And through his storytelling and the way that he writes characters, we get to experience how the protagonists have hints of evil within them, and how even villains are able to be humanized, so that you may sympathize even with their ordeals. Togashi really does build a fantastical world, which anyone would love to isekai into and explore, through the various different complex, sophisticated mechanics that he introduces, and the nuanced characters that he has created. Whether if they are protagonists or antagonists, Togashi is always challenging and subverting tropes and cliches. The narrative that stitches all of these elements together always has a natural flow to it. In addition to this, he really does make us think about the themes, ideas, and ideologies that he conveys through his in-depth story, and he leaves us with plenty of breathing space in order to interpret Hunter Hunter the way that we want to, and this point in particular is one of the many reasons why I have truly come to love Hunter Hunter after re-experiencing it during these videos. There is such a healthy difference of opinion, with some people favouring the York New City arc as their favourite arc, or even others stating that the Greed Island arc is their favourite part of the story. Whatever the case, Togashi really has created an excellent world for us to dive into, one that introduces concepts and thoroughly explains them, and allows us to feel a world which feels like it is being lived in, with characters who are dealing with real life issues, and adopting differing ideologies and philosophies, which you can discuss for hours on end. In my next video, I'm going to be going over the next arc in the Hunter Hunter story, the Greed Island arc. Greed Island is a transitionary arc, which occurs between the York New City and Kamira Untox. It has a video game setting, which is inspired by Togashi's own love for RPG games, like Dragon Quest. This arc takes place immediately after the York New City arc, as Gon, Killua, and Leorio and Kuripika go their separate ways. The arc is heavily focused around Gon and Killua, in particular how they begin to develop their Nen abilities, and start to learn new techniques which are developed further thanks to a new mentor that they encounter during this arc. Upon entering into the game Greed Island, Gon and Killua are tasked with collecting 100 restricted cards. In addition to training, the two of them overcome various different obstacles, as well as facing off against new antagonists which are trying to steal the cards of other players, and they just so happen to come across a antagonist from the prior parts of the story. This character surprisingly ends up helping them and plays a more supportive role during this arc, which proves that Togashi can apply a wide range of roles to his different characters, without it feeling out of the ordinary or jarring. So without further delay, let's begin my analysis of the fifth story arc of Hunter Hunter, the Greed Island Arc. The Greed Island arc spans from chapters 120 to 185, running for a total of 65 chapters. It is also the final arc that was adapted by the 1999 Hunter Hunter anime. As with each arc that I've analysed so far, the Greed Island arc is different to anything that we have seen so far. The game called Greed Island is heavily fleshed out by Togashi. It is centred around a card game, and Togashi painstakingly gives details to each of the 100 restricted cards. A lot of people may find this boring, but without these details and the explanations that he gives us, it would really take away from the immersion that you feel while experiencing this arc. Similar to my other Hunter x Hunter videos that I've been doing, I'll be breaking this arc down into small portions which will be easy to understand. The story of the Greed Island arc begins in York New City, with Gon and Killua attending the Southern Peace auction in order to attempt to obtain the game called Greed Island. Gon and Killua, instead of trying to buy the game themselves, they're going to let someone else buy the game, and then try to enter into Greed Island on their behalf. A multi-millionaire called Mr. Batera will also be attending 
during the auction. It appears that this individual has fallen in love with the Greed Island game. He is willing to spend a large sum of money in order to obtain the game, but this money appears to be nothing in comparison to the money he will give to someone as a reward for completing the game. During the auction, Gon and Killua run into some of the members of the Phantom Troop. Fitan and Finks reassure them that they are not here to hurt them or to fight with them. They don't reveal to Gon and Killua the real reason as to why they are here, but apparently they are looking for a Nen Exorcist for Krollo. In an internal dialogue, we learn that a few people have the ability to exercise the Nen that has been placed onto individuals. The concept is known as exorcism. People who are unaware of Nen associate Nen abilities to ghosts or demons. So when they call upon an exorcist to conduct a ceremony, they usually refer to it as spirit banishment. But in actual fact, they are removing Nen which has been placed placed onto that individual, not a evil spirit. In addition to this, there are only a few people who know how to exercise Nen abilities. It is said that as few as 10 people in the world know how to remove a Nen curse from someone. Feitan and Finks tell Gon and Killua that they are not after killing Kurapika. Killing Kurapika will not remove the judgement chain that has been placed onto Krollo's heart. In some instances, if you kill the Nen user who has inflicted a Nen curse, then that Nen curse is intensified. So for that reason, they are searching for a Nen exorcist in order to remove the judgement chain. This exchange also serves to human humanize the members of the Phantom Troop. As through Pakunoda's memory bomb, Fetan and Finks learned about Gon and Killua. They even tell the two boys that Pakunoda was thankful to them in the end, after the events of the York New City arc. Eventually, the Southern Peace auction begins, and in chapter 121, the Greed Island game is on sale. It appears that when the Greed Island cartridge is placed into the Joy Station, the power light turns on without it even being plugged in. Another demonstration shows that when the Greed Island game is placed into a Joy Station, the console is protected by the game cartridge. As long as someone is in the Greed Island game, game, then nobody can destroy the console, which is shown by demonstrating a sledgehammer attempting to destroy it here. Individuals who choose to play the Greed Island game risk their own lives, because if you die within the game, you die in real life. It is described as a very dangerous game. Anybody considering to buy the game must be prepared to face the consequences of their purchase. When you decide to play the game, you are transported into the world of the cartridge. So you could say that Hunter x Hunter was one of the first ever manga to have ever done a isekai. During the auction, Gon accidentally ends up bidding 2.4 billion for one of the games, but he ends up being outbid by the multi-billionaire Batera, who bids 2.5 billion. During this chapter, Takashi even goes through the effort of explaining what the different hand signs mean, and what magnitude of bid each hand sign equates to. In the end, Batera ends up winning the auction for the Greed Island game for just over 3 billion. Gon and Kedawa approach him after the end of the auction. They state that they are hunters, and they can offer their assistance in order to clear the game. They prove that they know a lot about the game, and they are experienced by demonstrating their Ren. One of Batera's partners, called Sezgara, refuses the two of them, stating that their display of Ren is not good enough. If they were to enter into Greed Island at their current state, then they would end up dead. We learn that Batara owns 32 cartridges to Greed Island, including the one that he has won today. Thanks to the memory cards and the multiple slots that are on the memory cards, multiple individuals can go into the game at the same time. So Batara has 100 hunters currently playing the game for him, but he states that over half of them have given up. They have given up to the extent that they don't want to return to the real world, and they have decided to continue on their lives within the game. Batara states that he knows this because their stats on the screen haven't changed at all. They have remained the same for months or even years. They are taking up memory card space and they cannot replace them with new better players. That's why Batara is very careful in his selection of new players that he chooses to enter into Greed Island. He can only allow individuals who meet the minimum requirement, which is to return to the real world. Sezgara is qualified to state that Gon and Killua are not ready because he has already played the Greed Island game and he is 80% through it. In addition to this information, we learn that Batara intends to buy all of the 7 Greed Island and cartridges that are being sold at the Southern Peace auction at the moment. Batara states that he has advertised on the internet for hunters to come and try out, in order to win a spot to play the game. Gon and Killua now have to earn their right to play. They have four days to train themselves and to build their Nen, so that they can prove themselves strong enough in order to enter into the game. After the two boys return, Gon is pretty frustrated that he was treated like dirt. He wants to prove Sezgera wrong that he will not die if he enters into Greed Island, but Killua tells him to think rationally, because all the two of them have done is practice Ten and Ren every day. He states that it is time for them to take the next step, which is to practice their Hatsu, which is their special attack. They both try to come up with an ability that is practical and fits their Nen type, and such an ability should be able to have a wide range of applications. Gon of course struggles to come up with an idea. Killua already knows the special attack that he is going to be developing. He tells Gon that he is going to be working on developing this special attack from now on. He advises Gon to think up of a special ability that an enhancer could find useful. Later, we see Killua training, and he has a taser in his hand. We see that he has his Nen aura around his body. He infuses his aura with the electricity from the taser. He bends the electricity to his will and he stores it within his body, and then he next decides to discharge this electricity at will.
will. He does this through further refining his Nen, and he is able to discharge the electricity between his fingertips, hinting that his special ability has something to do with electric currents. While the two boys are training, we learn that Feitan and Finks have stolen a copy of Greed Island, so it appears that the Phantom Troop's quest for a Nen exorcist has led them to Greed Island. Gon tries to get advice from Kuripika and even asks him to be his mentor, but Kuripika refers him to his actual mentor, Wing, and Wing just continues to tell him to practice his Ten and Ren, because an enhancer doesn't need to have a special ability, since their Nen type is the most balanced in terms of offense and defense. Gon is desperate for more advice. It appears that Sesgara's undermining attitude has really bothered him and knocked his self-confidence. Wing tells him that since he only showed Sesgara his Ren, he advises him to show him everything that he has learnt at the same time. Taking on board Wing's advice, Gon immediately tries to understand how he can use Ten, Zetsu, Ren, and Hatsu together. While Gon is making slow and steady progress, Killua is advancing ahead. As the electricity that he is discharging between his hands has become significantly larger than what we had seen before, Gon finally gets a hint at his special ability when he thinks about Gyo and how he applied this during Heaven's Arena. Through using Gyo in the past, he had only focused his aura into his eyes, but he hadn't thought about using Gyo on the rest of his body. Looking at his fist, we see that it has a thin layer of aura around it, so he logically thinks if he can shut off the aura in the rest of his body and focus it all into his fist, then he will be able to come up with the perfect ability which will suit his Nen type, which is an enhancer. Through focusing his Nen into his fist, he is able to now throw explosive punches. This is the root of Gon's new ability that he begins to develop and form during this arc called Jang Ken Kun. Gon and Killua both have a healthy amount of competition between them, as not only do they encourage each other, they also want to be better than each other. During their training, Batara continues to buy the copies of Greed Island. It is said that he has spent half of his net worth in this auction just to buy this game. In chapter 125, the Greed Island tryouts begin. Nen is a requirement to play the game, so individuals who are trying out to play Greed Island will be assessed on their Nen ability. The pro hunter who refused Gon and Killua earlier says Gera will be their judge. Only 32 people will be accepted during these tryouts, so it is essential that Gon and Killua pass here. Gon and Killua both go to the tryouts. Killua is the first to be accepted when he demonstrates his new Nen ability. Gon is also accepted when he shows his Enhancer ability. He demonstrates his new Nen ability by punching a crater into the wall. Sesgara states that he is frightened, thinking about what Gon will grow up to become. At the end of the tryouts, only 21 people successfully passed and earned the right to play Greed Island. Sesgara reveals that the reward for completing the game is 50 billion. Gon and Killua leave York New City in order to head to Batara's mansion. When they arrive at the mansion, they find loads of Joy Station consoles connected to monitors, like a large LAN party is going on. Sesgara states that the games are not independent of each other and they are all interconnected. He describes Greed Island as a MMORPG, where players from all around the world interact and play within the same environment. Gon is the first one to enter into the game. He decides to use the memory card with the save file that is stored on it to go into the game. Using his Nen, he is teleported into Greed Island. When Gon first appears into the game, he is presented with a message from his father. It states that Jin along with his friends made this game. But unfortunately, if he came here thinking that he would find clues as to his father's whereabouts, about, then he is mistaken. The reason that he had led Gon to Greed Island was just to show off this game that he had made. His father's message to him is to enjoy the game, but Gon questions whether if his father really did want to just show off this game or if there is an alternative meaning to this. After this message, Gon has explained the rules of Greed Island. The ring that Gon is wearing that his father had left behind for him allows him to use two magic spells. The first is called Book and the second is called Gain. When Gon holds his hand out and says Book, a book appears in front of him. It is said that every item that Gon obtains within the game can be turned into a card, and that card can be stored within this card binder. The aim of Greed Island is to fill the card binder with all of the numbered cards. Only the correct numbered card will be accepted into the card binder. Gon is told that there are 100 cards that he needs to go and collect, and that is the only way that he will clear the game, thus winning Batara's 50 billion reward and possibly earning the respect of his father. It is not only about finding 100 cards, it is finding 100 items and then turning them into cards. When an item is obtained, it turns into a card, and then to utilize this card, an individual needs to say gain and it will turn back into that item. The only issue is that once a card has been gained and turned back into its original self, it can never be turned back into a card again. Togashi spares no details when it comes to the rules and the mechanics of the card game, which is utilized within Greed Island. At the end of chapter 127, Gon finally steps foot onto Greed Island. He finds himself in the middle of nowhere, as he is surrounded by grass as far as the eye can see. Killua eventually enters in the game and the two of them decide to find a town, so that they can learn more information about the game. Meanwhile, we return to the Phantom Troop as we learn that Phaetan and Finks have entered into the game, and the multi-tap accessory that they have will only allow two more of the spiders to enter along with Phaetan and Finks.
thinks. Meanwhile, Gon and Killua find their first town called Antokiba, which is dubbed the Town of Prizes. They decide to enter into multiple contests in order to win as many prizes as they can. The first of which is a challenge set by a chef where they have to finish their food within 30 minutes and it's on the house. They also win a card each for completing the challenge, but they quickly realize that the card that they were given is practically useless. They were expecting to win a weapon card, not a useless fish, which reminds me a lot of a Magikarp from Pokemon. They quickly learn that everything in Greed Island is traded with in card form. Money from the real world is useless here. Goods are exchanged for money which comes in the form of cards. Once again, Togashi goes through great lengths by explaining the little details, even going as far as to explaining how the real world money is converted into money which can be used within Greed Island. It is quite detailed and beyond the scope of this video to be going through every little detail that Togashi mentions during this arc, but you can appreciate that he goes through the effort of making Greed Island feel like a real world which is actually lived in. We also learn that money is earned in Greed Island after defeating monsters. Gon and Killua do question why monsters would be carrying around money, but anyone who's played an RPG game like Dragon Quest can understand the inspiration behind this. In chapter 131, we get some insight into what Gon thinks about the game that his father helped to make. Jin had told Gon to just enjoy playing the game, and he had initially assumed that the game wouldn't be that difficult. We also learned that Gon wasn't afraid when he had first arrived in Greed Island. He had thought that everyone else was enjoying playing the game too, but he quickly realizes that people are killed during this game, and that's the scariest aspect about it, how other players are willing to kill one another in order to gain more cards. Killua agrees with Gon that it's not right that players should be killed for their cards. He would much rather prefer if two players were to put forth a card each, and whoever wins a battle gets to keep both of the cards. After this exchange, Gon shows his appreciation for Killua accompanying him, as he thanks him, and he is glad that he has a friend like Killua beside him. On top of this, he is really appreciative that he got to meet Killua, but when you take the time to study their friendship, you quickly realize that Gon is the one who has impacted Killua's life. He even states this to himself after Gon shows his appreciation for him. He says that it is him who should be thankful that he has found a friend like Gon. Gon is someone who holds no expectations from Killua. His friendship is unconditional, and through being friends with Killua, Gon has shown him the innocence of childhood, and how not everything in the world is so dark and gloomy. Through Gon's carefree attitude and his simplistic approach to life, he has in a way enlightened Killua and is gradually changing Killua's perspective on the world. While they continue to explore the town, they are followed by a little girl. Also, as a side note, if you remember that I said that Togashi was really thorough with explaining the mechanics of Greed Island, well, in chapter 132, he takes up four whole pages explaining how 40 different spell cards work. It is great that we get all of this additional detail, but some of these 40 spell cards we never get to see being used. Meanwhile, Gon and Killua make it to the end of a rock, paper, scissors tournament. They are facing off against each other and Killua ends up winning. As a reward for winning the tournament, he earns the card Sword of Truth. After winning the card, it appears that several people have started to follow Gon and Killua. The two boys prevent anyone from stealing the card that they had just acquired by swapping the Sword of Truth card between each other, and even deciding to place it into a free slot instead of the specified slot for the card. This is to prevent another player from pickpocketing them, or to steal the card from its specified slot. It shows how sharp the two of them are despite not having any defensive spells to protect themselves. A lot of the people who are trying to steal the Sword of Truth from the two of them are individuals who have been trapped within Greed Island. The two of them decide that the best way to protect themselves is to acquire some defensive spell cards, so they decide to go to Masadora, which is dubbed the Town of Magic, in order to buy some spell cards. The girl who has been following them reveals herself and asks if she can accompany the two of them, but they refuse her company, stating that she will only slow them down. They judge her by her appearance and completely underestimate her, not knowing who she really is. During this, we catch up with the Phantom Troop, who begin to theorize that Greed Island is actually taking place in the real world. They begin to theorize this after realizing that they cannot use their Nen abilities within Greed Island. They recall how Phaeton and Finks were teleported into the game. Their soul didn't separate from the body and enter into the game, instead their entire body was teleported. Therefore, they conclude that Greed Island isn't actually a software to play the game. It serves its purpose to teleport an individual to an island in the real world, where Greed Island is taking place. The Phantom Troop also learn from another player that once someone clears the game, they are able to take back three item cards into the real world. So they conclude, if Greed Island is taking place on an island in the real world, then they don't need to waste their time by clearing the entire game. They may be able to take advantage of their situation and take all 100 restricted cards back with them, instead of just three. I really enjoy the moments when we get to cut away to the Phantom Troop and get to see what they are doing in Greed Island. Their approach is less cautious than Gon and Killua's. It is a very intriguing contrast, because the Phantom Troop have no intention of clearing the game. Their motive is entirely different to Gon and Killua's. As with all of their actions up until this, 
this point, whatever they do serves to be for the greater good of the Phantom Troop as a whole. While Gon and Killua are refraining from stealing cards from other players, the Phantom Troop don't think twice before doing this. Phaeton and Finks even state at the end of chapter 134 that they are trying to kill as many players as they can in order to take all of their cards. Whenever we see them, it is really entertaining and I wish that we saw more of the Phantom Troop during this arc. Meanwhile, while Gon and Killua are making their way to Masadora, they are still being followed by that girl. Despite them travelling at incredible speeds and displaying intense stamina, she is keeping up with them. She even observes and analyses the two of them while they are fighting a group of monsters. The girl who is following them proves that she is very knowledgeable and experienced, as she comments on Gon and Killua's movements, in particular their assessments of the giant monsters that they are encountering. But Gon and Killua continuously ignore her. They are judging her by her appearance and simply assume that she would be a nuisance if she joined their party. They encounter several different monsters and continue to run away or to avoid fighting them, and even when they do fight them, they are not doing it effectively, and this frustrates the girl who is following them. She states that they are wasting their talents. She is aware that Gon and Killua are very gifted, but they are very rough around the edges. She notes that their efforts will be in vain if they were to come across an evil player, because at their current level, they would not survive an encounter with a stronger player. When she has had enough, she tells the two boys to use Gyo, and with her advice, they are able to successfully take down a monster. After observing them long enough, the girl states that she will now train them, but she advises not to let her appearance deceive them, because she won't be going easy on them. Eventually, after defying her, the two of them realise that she is 57 years old, and she has 40 years of experience with Nen. They have judged her based on her appearance and haven't realised that she is superior to Gon and Killua in many ways. She finally introduces herself as Biscuit Kruger, or Biski for short. She is a pro hunter. We also learn that Biski was the one who taught Wing how to use Nen, so it appears after revealing this information, she proves herself to the two of them, and thus begins Gon and Killua's training with Biski. A blacklist hunter who is following them to try to kill them is defeated by Biski. She uses him as a tool to train Gon and Killua. We also learn that Biski came to Greed Island because she is looking for a jewel. It is called the Blue Planet and it has been assigned as card number 81 from the restricted cards list. Biski also reveals that Gon's father is among the top 5 Nen users in the whole world. Biski orders the blacklist hunter to evade Gon and Killua's attacks for two whole weeks. If he manages to do so, then she won't kill him. Immediately, we can see that Biski's training method is more practical than Wing's, and it involves a lot more risk. Where Wing was extremely cautious, Biski is not afraid to put Gon and Killua's lives on the line, as she pits them against a professional blacklist hunter. Even while he is wounded, he is still holding his own against Gon and Killua. During this encounter, Biski is assessing the two of them very closely. She assesses that within a day, the two boys are able to pressurise the blacklist hunter. She notes that Gon and Killua have brought forth their full efforts through realising that this is a life or death situation. Like she had said before, she describes Gon and Killua as two rough diamonds, but with enough polishing and refining, their talents can shine through. Gon is described as having intense resolve, which is noticed through his eyes, and when it comes to his potential, it is described as bottomless. While Killua is described as being the very embodiment of cold and intense desire, she states he can be unstable, but with a bit of refinement, he will be perfect. She is excited by the prospect of training both of them, and tells herself that she will not go easy on them. They fight with the Blacklist Hunter for up to 10 days. During that time, they have increased their speed and gained a lot of experience. The pressure of a life or death battle has accelerated the growth of both of them. Eventually, the Blacklist Hunter gives up. Considering he is a murderer, he just tells them to kill him, but Gon spares his life. After witnessing Gon's kind-hearted nature, he decides to turn himself in once he leaves Greed Island. Their training with Biski continues as she makes them walk to Masadora. Upon arriving there, she makes them walk all of the way back, much to their displeasure. Once they arrive back at their starting point, she makes them dig their way to Masadora this time. She gives them a shovel and a wheelbarrow to dig their way through to Masadora. If you recall, walking there is a 43 mile journey. On foot, it took them 3 hours to get there. Now that they have to dig their way through rocks, it may take them days to get there. While digging, the rocks become far too hard for them to shovel through, but Gon figures out that he can flow his aura into the shovel, and this way he will enhance his ability to dig through the rocks. He is able to do this by imagining the shovel as an extension of himself. The unconventional and very difficult training that Biski is making them undergo here will serve to improve them in several areas, including their strength, stamina, willpower, and their technique. She says that after they dig their way through all of the rocks and reach Masadora, they will have completed the first phase of her training. After they finally make it to Masadora, she tells them to go all of the way back again. But this time, she wants them to fight all of the monsters that she saw them having difficulty with when she first met them. This way, they will be able to collect the monster cards also. While Biski watches Gon fight with the monsters, she thinks to herself that she can understand why Jin had created this game. She assumes that he did so in order to train his son. She comes to this conclusion after analysing how the game is programmed. Anybody who enters into Greed Island 
Island is guaranteed to get stronger, as long as they play through the game in the correct order. Much like in an RPG where at the start you regularly encounter low level enemies, as you make progress in the game the level of the enemies gets stronger, but so do you by defeating monsters and levelling up, so that you can fight the next level of monster. Fighting these various different monsters is the second phase of Bisky's training. She states that this is an essential aspect of her training, because they must be able to take down a variety of different enemies with their Nen, and in doing so they need to be able to think quickly while in battle. She wants the two of them to be able to come up with various different tactics and apply them into battle like it's second nature to them. Bisky estimates that it will take Gon and Killua one month to complete the second phase of her training. After the second phase of their training is over, Bisky concludes that Gon is more focused and he recovers quicker, but Killua is stronger and he is better at analysing his opponents. They have different strengths but together they make a perfect team. Bisky now starts the third phase of her training. Her aim is to now develop their defence. She does so by training the boy's aura. She uses a Nen ability called Ko, which focuses all of her aura into one part of her body. She ends up focusing her aura into her fist. She wants them to defend themselves with a new ability called Ken. This is a combination of Ten with Ren. It serves to hold up a defensive barrier around their body. Gon is only able to hold up his Ken for about two minutes against Bisky. As with the other phases of her training, a quantitative measure is given as to when the boys will have completed this phase. She states that at minimum, if they decide to get into a fight, then they need to be able to hold Ken for at least 30 minutes, which is 15 times more than what Gon is able to do right now. After another month of training, they are finally able to hold up their Ken for 30 minutes. Bisky now states that they are finally ready to practice real combat now. She describes Ko as focusing all of your aura into one part of your body, but she states that a better distribution of their aura is required in order to fight effectively in battle. They can change the distribution of their aura by using Gyo. Through this, they are able to effectively change the ratio between their offense and their defense, so she gives them various different ratios of distribution for their aura. Some may say that these training segments go on for far too long, but I feel like it really fleshes out the Nen system. Through their training, we are able to learn about the intricate details about Nen, and like I've said before, it only convinces me further that Nen is one of the best power systems that's ever been implemented into a shonen series. Through the training with Bisky, you can see how well thought out this power system is. She wants them to practice these different ratios of aura distribution three times a day for half an hour. At the same time, she wants them to spar with each other. Initially, they spar really slowly as they are focusing on the distribution of their aura, but gradually their speed increases. As we get to understand and appreciate the growth that these two characters are undergoing here. The power-ups that they are experiencing during training are so well explained, and they feel like they are well earned. It definitely is a far cry from other shonen series which just have power-ups appearing from out of nowhere. If Gon and Killua are able to spar with each other and continue their training every day for two months, then they will be able to reach their peak speed. After completing this portion of their training, the final phase of their training will begin next. Meanwhile, in chapter 142, the antagonist of this arc reveals himself. He betrays an alliance that is called Nyx Group. They have together collected 90 of the restricted cards. For five years he has patiently waited and he reveals himself to be the bomber. He is one of the founding members of the Nyx group and he has planted bombs on everybody's body. He bribes the members of the Nyx group to give them their 81 restricted cards so that he and his two accomplices Sub and Bara have 90 restricted cards in total. Even after they hand over all of their cards he doesn't keep to his promise as he ends up killing all of the Nyx group. Meanwhile Gon and Killua have made phenomenal progress. Bisky assumed that they would have taken two months to be spotted at their top speed, but it has only taken them two weeks, so now the final phase of their training will begin. The final phase of their training will focus on developing their utilization of different Nen types, in particular Nen types which are different to their own. We know that Gon is a enhancer and Killua is a transmuter, so this final portion of Bisky's training will give the boys an understanding of the various different types of Nen. Meanwhile, the Phantom Troop, who I can't get enough of during this arc, have figured out the real world location of Greed Island, proving that their theory of Greed Island not being a real game is correct. Greed Island is indeed a private island which is not listed on any maps. Gon and Killua's final phase of their training begins, as Bisky makes them practice various different Nen abilities, ranging from enhancement, transmutation, and emission to name a few. In typical Gon and Killua style, they excel in their training, and what would take an ordinary person weeks to do, they do within days. Bisky explains to Gon the history behind the game Rock, Paper, Scissors. This ultimately inspires Gon to come up with a new Nen ability. Meanwhile, the Phantom Troop in encounter one of the craters of Greed Island, called Razor. This newly introduced character appears to be incredibly strong, as the Phantom Troop can even sense this. This character called Razor has a connection with Jin, and it is someone who the players of Greed Island must eventually face while playing the game. He sends the members of the Phantom Troop away by using his Eliminate card, a spell 
wild card that is exclusive to only the creators of the game. And at the same time, by using a dodgeball, he appears to destroy the boat that the Phantom Troop were using, confirming our assumptions that this is someone not to be underestimated. At the end of chapter 145, we see Gon's new ability called Janken. There are three aspects to his Janken ability. Rock is an enhancement Nen ability, Paper is a emission-based Nen ability, and lastly, Scissors is a transmutation ability. Since Gon's base Nen type is enhancement, he is most effective at using Janken Rock, but he appears to be struggling with the Paper and Scissors aspect, since both of these carry affinities for different Nen types which are not his own. Through practice, he will learn to master the Nen type of emission through Paper and the Nen type of transmutation through his Scissors. Since Gon and Killua have demonstrated initiative with developing their Nen abilities, Bisky decides for them to take a break. Gon recalls that it's almost been a year since they first sat the Hunter exam, and the next Hunter exam is actually coming up, so he advises Killua to go and apply for the exam. There are two ways to leave Greed Island, either through obtaining a leave card or by defeating the Master of the Harbour. They decide to go to the Harbour and Killua easily defeats the Master, and thus is able to enter into the 288th Hunter exam. While Killua is away, Gon continues his training with Bisky, as he practices Nen types that he doesn't have a natural affinity to. While Killua is away, Gon and Bisky learn about the betrayal of the Nyx Alliance, and how the identity of the bomber is revealed to be Genthru. Gon decides to honour the final request of the Nyx Alliance by avenging their deaths. He can only do this though by getting stronger. In chapter 148, the Hunter exam begins, and the first round is a elimination round, where the applicants are tasked to knock each other out so that the number of applicants is drastically reduced for the next round of the exam. But Killua intends to be the only person to pass this year. It takes Killua one hour and a half to defeat every single other applicant, thus making him the only person to pass into the second phase. Since he is the only person to have passed and all of the other applicants are knocked out and won't be waking up for another day or two, it is immediately declared that he has passed the hunter exam. Netero is surprised by the growth that he has had in the space of one year. He immediately returns back to Greed Island, but the only difference is he is now an official hunter. After this break, their training with Bisky continues. Killua also has the opportunity to go over all of the various different cards that Gon and Bisky have bought from Masadora. He comes across the spell card called contact and he tells Gon to use it. This card will list all of the individuals that Gon has encountered while he has been in Greed Island. Strangely enough, someone very familiar has come across Gon. This individual is revealed to be Krolo Lucilva. This is confusing and out of the blue since Krolo should not be able to use Nen, so he would have no way of entering into Greed Island. After hearing an explanation from Bisky, Gon and Killua assume that Krolo must have used a Nen Exorcist, but the Phantom Troop who also learn of Krolo's appearance within the game laugh it off and assume that someone is using his name as an alias. The real identity of the person who is using Krolo's name as an alias is Hisoka. He reveals himself to the members of the Phantom Troop. It appears that Krolo has hired Hisoka in order to find him a exorcist from Greed Island. In return for accomplishing this task for Krolo, he will be rewarded a battle with him after the restrictions placed upon his Nen are removed. Meanwhile, Genthru continues to ambush and steal the cards of other players. Most notably, he steals from Sesgera and his team. Sesgera, who is frustrated by Genthru and his underhanded tactics, begins to formulate a plan against him. It appears that most of the players who are committed to completing Greed Island have started to band together in teams. This occurs when Gon is contacted by Kazul. He, along with Killua and Bisky, meet Kazul in person, along with a few other teams who have banded together to discuss Genthru and his team. They share with each other information about the cards that Genthru lacks. They decide upon acquiring and monopolizing a card called Plot of Beach, but they must go to an area called Sofrabi in order to acquire it. Upon arriving at Sofrabi, they meet a NPC who tells them that pirates have taken over, and they will begin to kill players who share any information about the card Plot of Beach. Together, the several different teams decide to go up against these pirates. We learn from the NPC that the pirates are referred to as Razor and his 14 devils. After a brief encounter and a challenge which is easily overcome by Killua, they earn the right to meet the leader of the pirates, Razor. Razor decides that they will have a series of sports contests. It will be a best of 15. Each person is able to win one point, and the first team that reaches eight points is the victor. Razor states that he will decide what sports games that they will play, and if the players are able to win then the pirates will leave the island. Once the matches begin, the players end up losing the first three games. Among the participants are Bisky and even Killua, who both are unable to win their matches. It appears that Gon and the others had purposefully forfeited all of their matches. As a result, Razor's team ends up winning with eight points, but Gon and the others reassure them that they will be back, but only after regrouping and searching for stronger players to add to their party. This is what leads them to go and find Krolo, the individual that Gon had apparently bumped into earlier. When they teleport to Krolo's location, they discover that it is indeed Hisoka. When they ask what Hisoka is doing in Greed Island, he ends up lying
lying to them. He doesn't want to reveal to them that he is here in order to look for a exorcist. The only thing that Hisoka is focused upon is to remove the judgement chain from Krollo's heart. He doesn't want his battle against Krollo to be postponed any longer. So for this reason, he doesn't want God and Killua getting in their way. He instead tells them that he is here looking for Krollo. After Biski asks for Hisoka's assistance, he agrees to join their party. In a strange turn of events, Hisoka has now become a supportive character, and the role that he begins to play from here on out results in a very entertaining few chapters or episodes with Hisoka tagging along. This portion of the Greed Island arc where we see more of his character is definitely a highlight for me, because it is, like I have said, we see Hisoka in a totally different light. He is assisting Gon and the others, but at the same time he is lying to them and concealing his true intentions. Although by lying to them he isn't really causing them any harm, but it leads to Killua and Biski paying very close attention to Hisoka's subtle nuances. Very shortly after joining their party, Killua is able to deduce that Hisoka is indeed looking for an exorcist. He even deduces that Hisoka has already met up with the other members of the Phantom Troop. Killua even tries to confirm his suspicions by looking through Hisoka's binder in order to see if he has met up with the other spiders. But cunningly, Hisoka conceals the names of the Phantom Troop members by using his ability Texture Surprise. While this is going on, Gon decides to recruit Sesgera into his team. So now that he is completely regrouped with Sesgera and his team members, and now even having the help of Hisoka on their side, they now decide to confront Razor and his pirates once more, with the hopes of defeating Razor and his pirates and acquiring the plot of Beach Card. The newly formed team is very successful against Razor's team. They easily win 4 points by defeating his team at various different sports matches. After 4 matches are over, Razor decides to take over, and instead of continuing to play different sports matches, he decides that they will all play dodgeball. There are 8 players on each side, with the game having 8 points up for grabs. The victor is decided by the first team who is able to obtain 8 points. During this exchange, Sesgara analyzes Razor's aura. He realizes that he has far more aura than any of his other team members, and this leads to a logical assumption that he is a Game Master, one of the founding members of Greed Island. In chapter 161, we learn that the other pirates within Razor's team are all death row inmates. Razor, as a professional hunter, has hired the convicts under a contract of absolute obedience. When one of his teammates, called Bopobo, refuses and plans a mutiny, Razor kills him immediately. Gon questions Razor why he had killed Bopobo, but his anger towards Razor quickly simmers down when he learns that Bopobo was convicted for rape, murder, and for torturing individuals. Also during this this chapter, Hisoka and Sesgera reveal to Gon and the others that Greed Island is indeed taking place in the real world. They are not in a virtual world like they had assumed. It is taboo to let other individuals know that they are not in a game. After Gon learns that Razor is a game master, he asks him if Jin is here too on Greed Island. After hearing this question, Razor immediately identifies Gon as the son of Jin. He tells Gon that his father had told him not to go easy on Gon. This does surprise Gon initially, but then we see his eyes of determination. As he smiles in the face of the difficult challenge which ahead of him. So the teams of eight are decided, and the rules of the dodgeball game are explained clearly to each team. After Gon's team initially takes out two of Razor's team members, Razor then serves up a shot after catching the dodgeball with just one of his hands. He fires the ball towards Gorenu. The serve is so incredibly fast and filled with so much power that it would kill an individual if it made contact with them. This proves to be true after Gorenu has no other way to avoid this attack but to swap with one of his apes. After the ball makes contact with the ape's head, it is destroyed. After this one serve, Gorenu is now able to understand the difference in power between himself and Razor. It results in him being afraid, and this is the type of fear that even Sesgera states won't be overcome in just one night, let alone during this match. And because of this, Gorenu probably won't be much more help during this dodgeball game. Then Razor and his team begin to pass the dodgeball around to each other at insane speeds. The ball is going so fast that it is almost impossible to follow the trajectory of it. This leads to Sesgera losing sight of the ball and being attacked by it from behind. He is able to avoid fatal injury by focusing all of his aura into his back. Despite this, it is evident that he has sustained broken bones and he may have even ruptured some of his organs after the ball had made contact with him. After Hisoka gets hold of the ball, he uses his ability bungee gum to the team's advantage. He launches the ball towards Razor's team members and lets it make contact before retracting the ball back to his hand. Hisoka is pretty confident that by using his bungee gum he can take out most or if not all of Razor's team, but it remains to be seen if Razor has anything else up his sleeve. During this dodgeball match, Gon and Killua demonstrate how much their utilization of their Nen 
aura has improved. Sesgera comments that their auras are incredibly smooth. Their training has clearly yielded results. Thanks to Bisky's harsh training, they are able to adjust their aura in situations which may require an offensive strategy or a defensive strategy. Razor fires the ball towards Gon and Gon blocks it by using his core. It sends him flying to the other end of the court, resulting in him being out. Thanks to Gon's efforts and his sacrifice, the ball is now in his team's possession. Now that Gon is out, he agrees that he will be the one to set back once his team has whittled down to a few members. He insists on continuing to take part. The next round continues as Granu is serving the ball. He throws the ball at Razor in order to avenge the ape that he had destroyed. He fires the ball at one of his apes and makes it switch position with Razor, resulting in the ball successfully making contact with him. But unfortunately, one of Razor's teammates is able to catch the ball, thus preventing Razor from being eliminated. Gorenu is the next person to be eliminated by one of Razor's devils. Next, Razor aims the ball towards Kilwa and fires it towards him, but at the last minute the ball changes trajectory. It curves and aims towards Bisky and Hisoka. Bisky avoids the ball and so does Hisoka, but at the last minute it changes trajectory once more and aims towards Hisoka's head. But by using his bungee gum ability, he is able to slow down the ball and catch it with his hand. Despite the skill level of Hisoka, he wasn't able to pull this off without injuring himself. We also learned that when Bisky had dodged the ball, it had grazed alongside her dress. The rules state that clothing is an extension of oneself, so because the ball had gone through her dress, it results in Bisky being eliminated. As soon as she is eliminated, Gon declares back, which results in him returning to the game. Gon has an insane level of determination as he returns to his team, to the extent that he is willing to kill himself in order to defeat Razor. Gon doesn't want to have a cheap victory against Razor's team. He wants to crush him and his team completely. Gon appears to have a strategy as he makes Killua hold the ball, and by using his enhancement Nen ability called Jankan, he generates force through his Nen ability and fires the ball towards one of Razor's devils. This attack easily eliminates Razor's teammate. The two of them try to attack one more time, but Gon wants to attempt it by focusing more of his aura. He focuses all of this built-up aura into his fist. This time, he targets Razor himself. Razor takes the ball head on. He is able to deflect it smoothly, but he does so at a price. The force of the ball pushes him out of bounds. Before any of Razor's teammates can catch the ball, Hisoka uses bungee gum to retrieve the ball, thus eliminating Razor. But he immediately declares back and is reinstated to the game. Gon's team appears to be in bad shape when compared to Razor. We get confirmation from this from Sesgera, who assesses that Hisoka probably can't throw anymore. As well as this, he won't be able to catch with his right hand after being injured. When it comes to Gon, Sesgera assesses that he has used up all of his aura in that last attack. Even if he hasn't, at this point in the game, Gon is close to exhaustion. There is no way that he will be able to launch another attack like the one that he just did. It may appear that Killua is the only one in good shape, but in fact, he is the one who is the most injured. This is because Killua is not using anything to protect his hands when Gon strikes the ball. It is like his hands are acting as the barrel of a cannon. Gon tells Killua that they will try to launch another attack just like the one that they had, and Killua agrees, but he thinks to himself that he is only able to withstand one more attempt at this. The reason why Killua isn't protecting his hands with his own aura is because it would prevent the energy transfer from Gon's punch to the ball. For the sake of making the attack as impactful as possible, he is leaving his hands unprotected. When Bisky receives the ball, she eliminates Razor's last teammate, leaving him on his own to face off against Hisoka, Gon, and Killua. Eventually, Sesgera addresses the concerns that he has about Killua's hands to Gon himself. Sesgera offers to hold the ball in place of Killua, but Killua insists that he is okay. As well as this, it is revealed that Gon knew from the very beginning that Killua's hands were being injured, but he stays stubborn and he refuses Sesgera's help, and he states that Killua has to be the one to hold the ball. This surprises Killua, possibly because nobody else has trusted him the way that Gon trusts him. He adamantly says that he isn't able to do this without Killua beside him. This moment is a testament to their friendship that has grown and developed to this point. He says that he wouldn't feel comfortable even if it was Hisoka holding the ball or even Bisky. Gon is only able to focus on hitting the ball because his friend Killua is the one who is holding it. Moments like this prove how endearing the relationship is between Gon and Killua. They have known each other for just over a year, and in that time they have formed a special bond, arguably one of the most memorable and meaningful friendships to have ever formed within any anime or manga. What makes moments like this feel so special is the faith and conviction that Gon has in his words. He has a unwavering belief and faith in Killua, and it's Killua's reaction of surprise which makes moments like this feel so much more impactful. You can tell that the two of them have a heartfelt connection, even one that surpasses friendship, as I sometimes see them like brothers. But before Gon is able to execute another Janken like before, they must first gain possession of the ball again from Razor. Razor, who is now on his own, absorbs the aura that he had dispersed into his teammates that he had conjured up. The aura that he had dispersed has now returned to him, and now we see him frighteningly with his maximum power. Razor tosses the ball 
ball high up into the air. He desires to spike the ball towards Gon and the others like a volleyball, in order to gain possession of the ball and to withstand Razor's strike. Gon, Killua, and Hisoka all form a three-man formation, in order to disperse the energy of the ball across the three of them. When I see moments like this, it is so hard to believe that Hisoka was one of the main antagonists in the prior arcs. Why I love his appearance in this arc and the entire concept of this dodgeball match is because of how cooperative he is. He is genuinely bored and has nothing better to do, so he totally transforms into this easygoing character who amusingly teases both Gon and Killua while agreeing to help them out, usually with any other series when an evil character switches sides. To be honest, this rarely occurs because not all writers are talented enough to execute this well, but when this does occur, there is always this doubt or this hint of suspicion that the character has something else up their sleeves. I'm not saying that Hisoka doesn't have ulterior motives, but I haven't sensed any sinister malice from his character throughout the entirety of this dodgeball game. I feel like he is genuinely helping Gon and Killua out and he isn't trying to sabotage their efforts. All of this is done so convincingly and once again I think it's a testament to the way that Togashi writes his characters. They are multi-layered and incredibly fascinating. They are not solely fixated upon one desire or one goal. They realistically adjust themselves according to the situation at hand, but all the while they remain true to their ultimate desire and their ultimate goal that they each want to fulfill. So in chapter 167, after Razor spikes the ball down, the three-man formation tries to intercept the ball, with Gon stopping the ball, Hisoka trapping it, and Killua who braces the impact. With bloodied hands and complete exhaustion, their tactic appears to have worked. Razor assesses that their strategy worked primarily because of Killua. The vital role that Killua played in this formation was as a cushion and support, and he did so by distributing his aura. He does this in a fine balance. If his aura distribution was skewed, then they would have been crushed by the impact of Razor's attack. At the same time as cushioning the impact of the ball, he had to distribute enough aura into his legs. This ensured that the three of them didn't lose balance, and as a result would have been sent flying out of bounds. Bisky even comments that Killua's current level she had reached when she was in her 20s. Undeterred by them gaining possession of the ball, Razor is still convinced that he can win the match. All he has to do is gain back possession of the ball after Gon strikes it, but he needs to do this without going out of bounds. Gon, who is determined to prove himself, summons more aura. They have thought that his prior strike was gone at its full potential, but he proves this not to be true. He unleashes an incredible amount of aura, which surprises both Razor and Sesgera. Just like Wing in the Heavens Arena arc, Razor describes Gon as a monster. He is convinced that Jin can be proud even at Gon's current level of power. It is evident that he is the son of one of the greatest hunters in history. His innate talent and his limitless potential is evident. He focuses all of his aura into his fist for one final strike. Killua holds the ball determined and knowing that Gon is going to strike the ball with everything that he has got. Putting all of his energy into this final strike, he fires the ball towards Razor. Razor braces the impact of the attack and bumps it back towards Gon's direction, but at the same time he is being pushed back by the force of Gon's strike. Before Gon can be hit by the rebounded ball, he collapses out of exhaustion. Hisoka, who wants to honor Gon's request of a flawless victory, decides to use his bungee gum. His bungee gum absorbs the force of the rebounded ball, which results in several of his fingers breaking. His bungee gum acts like a rubber slingshot as it fires the ball back towards Razor's direction. Razor tries to bump the ball back, but because of Hisoka's bungee gum, the ball sticks to him and he feels the full force of the strike. This results in him being pushed all the way back until he is out of bounds. Thanks to Hisoka's broken fingers, Gon's limitless aura, and Killua, who literally sacrifices his own hands, they are finally declared as the victors, as Razor has been completely eliminated, fulfilling Gon's wish of a flawless victory. At the end of the dodgeball match, Razor tells Gon that Jin is not on Greed Island and he doesn't know his location, but he wishes that he does find him one day. Hisoka ends up leaving them after the dodgeball match, and he reveals that he was lying to them and he did indeed know about spell cards. Not too long after, Genthru ends up calling Sesgera and demands that they hand over the plot of Beach Card. He also reveals that he has killed their former teammates, who had accompanied them during their first encounter with Razor, when they purposefully failed. This admission angers Gon. It results in Gon challenging Genthru to a battle. Genthru is more than happy to fight Gon, but he wants to after he takes down Sesgera because he believes he has the plot of Beach Card, but he doesn't know that Gon has the original while the others have copies. In order for Gon and the others to come up with a plan to defeat Genthru, Sesgera agrees to buy them some time. Sesgera reprimands Gon for being selfish and reckless. If Genthru and his team were to have come to Gon's location right now, then there is no doubt that Killua would have been easily defeated, as well as Gon himself since he has used up all of his aura during his dodgeball match with Razor. Sesgera tells him through his impulsive response, not only has he put his own life in danger, but the life of his friend Killua in danger too. Sesgera suggests that he is going to buy them as 
much time as he can in order for them to heal their injuries. For them to obtain all 100 restricted cards, they cannot avoid a fight with Genthru. He admits that Gon is the only one with a chance to defeat him. They come to an arrangement where Sesgaro will hold off Genthru for up to three weeks. In this short period of time, Killua will have to recover and heal his hands, as well as coming up with a surefire way to defeat Genthru and his team. Sesgaro reminds Gon that Genthru is not to be underestimated. He has killed over 50 players so far. The only way to defeat his father's game Greed Island is to defeat Genthru. So just as one challenge ends, another one begins. They have three weeks to prepare and train. Bisky orders that Killua is to focus on healing and to come up with a strategy, while Gon is to continue practicing and training with her. She tells Gon that he needs to practice to the point that he can avoid Genthru's ability called Little Flower. Meanwhile, Hisoka meets back up with the other members of the Phantom Troop as they have found the location of an exorcist. He also meets a new member of the Spiders, who just so happens to be Killua's sister. The members of the Phantom Troop leave Hisoka with negotiating with the exorcist. He is going through all of these lengths in order to fight with Krollo. The exorcist that they have found is Abengain, who had demonstrated his exorcism abilities by releasing himself of the countdown bomb that Genthru placed onto him. Says Gera and his team in order to buy time confront Genthru head on. At the same time, Gon is continuing his training with Bisky. In order to come up with a new Nen ability, she makes Gon practice his Nen emission. She makes him do a handstand and to propel his body off of the ground by using his Nen. Currently, the level that Bisky had taught Gon and Killua was only up to level 1, but Nen emission during a handstand is a level 5 training technique. It is a risk to make Gon learn this, because if he doesn't accomplish this within 3 weeks and their borrowed time will be wasted. She states that he needs to practice his Nen emission in order to stand a chance against Genthru. Through his training, he needs to be able to develop a strong enough weapon which can knock an enemy back by a few feet. Sesgera is using a hit and run strategy. He and his team are using magnetic force or a company to teleport to Genthru's location and to attack him and then teleport away. This leads to Genthru taking even more underhanded tactics as he starts to beat up other players and forces them to collect cards for him. And he even starts to murder other players for their cards. Meanwhile, 10 days have already passed and Gon has made no progress with his training. It appears that the level 5 training that he is undertaking is incredibly difficult. As long as Sesgera holds up to his end of the deal, then they have another 10 days to train. While he continues his training, Kithua along with Bisky begin to formulate their plan to defeat Genthru. After acquiring 48 company cards, Genthru and his team now have more than the 45 equivalents of a company return and magnetic force that Sesgera and his team have. Through now having more company cards, there is no way that Sesgera and his team can shake them off. They immediately teleport to Sesgara's location by using a company. It was only a matter of time before Genthru would go on the offensive. A back and forth occurs where Sesgara uses a company to transport to another location and Genthru uses a company to follow Sesgara. Back with Gon, he now only has 5 days left and he is still struggling with his Nen emission. Bisky tells him that this is something that he has to figure out on his own. In chapter 173, they tell him to stop and they inform Gon of a strategy that they have devised to defeat Genthru. And as a part of this strategy, they are relying on Gon's involvement. They reveal to Gon that they have come up with a way that he can practice 24-7 until he can perfect his Nen emission. After Sesgera's team runs out of cards to use to escape, their last resort is to use the card Leave in order to return to Batara's mansion. They discover that nobody is at the mansion anymore. Sesgera and his team learn that Batara has cancelled the Greed Island contract. Despite them getting so close to completing the game, Batara reveals that he doesn't care about it anymore. It appears that he's become so disheartened that he tells Sesgara to do what he wants with the cards. Gon and the others have continued to formulate their strategy, while Gon has continued his training. It appears that 10 days have passed since Sesgara and his team had left the game, and the 3 weeks that Sesgara had promised Gon and the others was up 5 days ago. Gorainu eventually contacts Gon and the others and informs them about what has gone on. Sesgara and his team have been away from Greed Island long enough that their save data has now been deleted completely. It appears that they won't be returned to Greed Island. Gorainu reveals that he has been carrying the 96 cards that Sesgera and his team have acquired. Genthru along with his team had been waiting for Sesgera to return to Greed Island at the entrance, but after their elapsed time is over and their game data is deleted, they now set their sights on Gon and the others. We learn why Sesgera has given up on Greed Island when he speaks with Batara. We learn that Batara was only interested in Greed Island because of the spell cards. He tells Sesgera and his team about his fiancée, who had unfortunately been in a severe accident 
accident. As a result of it, she was in a deep coma, and the only thing that could have brought her back was the Angel Breaths card from Greed Island. But Batara gives up on Greed Island after learning that his fiancée has recently died. In Chapter 175, Genthru and his team use a company to travel to Gon's location, in order to finally confront him. Genthru states that he will battle Gon, while Sub is ordered to face off against Killua and Barra is ordered to face off against Bisky. After trying to convince the three of them, Genthru reveals his true colours and orders them to shut up and hand over the cards. Gon and the others use a company to flee from Genthru and his group. They are continued to be followed until they reach Masadora. Gon, Killua and Bisky lead the three of them to a forest. It appears that Genthru, Sub and Barra want to fight them one on one. Killua and Bisky split up from Gon and lead away Genthru's teammates so Gon and Genthru can fight on their own. Bisky and Barra begin their battle on a beach. At first, she tries to come across as weaker than her opponent due to her smaller size, but later she transforms into a true form. As we see the true monster behind Bisky's character, she appears to be a big muscular woman and she easily defeats Barrow with one strike. Meanwhile, during Kilmar's battle, he treats it as an experiment because despite having a edge in physical strength, his opponent has far more aura than he does and since aura results in an individual having a more offensive and defensive ability, he will struggle to deal damage directly to his opponent. So Kilua has to try his best to avoid a direct hit during this fight. The concern about Kilua fighting is that his hands haven't properly healed. He is experiencing very painful nervous impulses from his injured hands. He begins the battle by releasing electric currents from the palm of his hands, which end up stunning his opponent, but it isn't enough to knock him out. So in Kilua's second attack, he uses his yo-yos. These yo-yos are weighted and make destructive damage upon making contact with their target. We learn that the yo-yos are made up of a custom alloy that was invented by his brother. Each one weighs about 50 kg, so through the lightning that is emitted from his palms, he has a close range stun gun, and through these yo-yos, he has a long range stun gun. Eventually, he defeats his opponent by revealing that he is using two yo-yos and strikes him with the second in his blind spot. The battle concludes by Killua electrocuting and restraining Sub. Now, the only person who remains to defeat his opponent is the stubborn and prideful Gon. Gon begins the battle by being very cautious. Genthru is after two cards that Gon possesses. They are Plot of Beach and Wild Luck Alexandrite. This is enough incentive for him to defeat Gon. Gon attacks Genthru by redistributing his aura into various limbs of his body and through channeling his aura into his fists or his legs, he's attacking Genthru. It is evident that Genthru has more combat experience and he can utilize more aura than Gon. So it's going to be very difficult for Gon to actually inflict any damage onto his opponent, but yet he still persistently tries to attack. That is until Genthru finally attacks Gon. He wonders through the way that Gon is cautiously avoiding his attacks who told him about his ability Little Flower, but he says that it doesn't matter because he doesn't need to use it against Gon. He is underestimating him, but this is precisely what Gon wants him to do. Gon is purposefully trying to appear weaker than what he is. This was a part of Killua and Bisky's strategy, because once their opponent feels like they are better than they are, then that's the time to execute their plan. Gon's pride overwhelms him, and he proves that he cannot stand appearing to be weaker than what he is. He is determined to make Genthru use his Nen ability. Because of Genthru deeming Gon not to be worthy enough to see his Nen ability, Gon's pride results in him putting a back burner onto Killua and Bisky's plan. He now is focused on making Genthru show him his Nen ability Little Flower, but it's not going to be easy. Despite Gon using more of his aura, he is still struggling against Genthru, especially when it comes to withstanding his powerful attacks, and it just highlights the difference in maturity and experience between the two of them. In chapter 176, Gon is trying to make him use Little Flower. He has a strategy where he wants his ability to backfire on him, but Genthru realizes that he's trying to make him use it, and he refuses to, as he continues to attack Gon who is withstanding a one-sided beating. He is asked why doesn't he give up, but he refuses to. Genthru realizes that he has slightly underestimated Gon, as he begins to understand how tough he is. He has a change of mindset, as he realizes that it's not enough to just defeat him by his physical strength alone. He has to break Gon's spirit entirely, because he is that stubborn. He is determined to make him admit defeat. He wants to show him that all of the effort that he has put in and the confidence that he has is meaningless. He now decides to use Little Flower surprisingly on Gon's left hand, but he is able to anticipate it and even defend himself against the attack. He does so by using Gyo to focus his aura onto the area where he was grabbed by Gen through. Genthru realizes that he must have been practicing this extensively in order to defend himself against his ability. He tries to use Little Flower again on Gon's hand, but only this time he punches him in his stomach instead of using the ability. He assumes that Gon would have focused all of his aura into the area that he was grabbed, which would have robbed the rest of his body of an adequate defense. But it seems that Bisky has prepared Gon for this type of attack. He tries to use this same strategy again, but only this time he attacks Gon's body with even more strength. But it appears that Gon is still able to defend himself and to 
minimize the damage that he receives effectively. And from the expression on Gon's face, it is evident that he was prepared for an attack like this. In a flashback, we see Biski teaching this to Gon. She explains that when Genthru is going to use his ability Little Flower, he uses Gyo in order to protect his own hand from the explosion. She advises Gon that when Genthru is going to be pretending to use Little Flower, he is going to attack him in another place of his body. And when he does this, he is going to not use Gyo on his hand. So by feeling whether or not if Genthru's hand is being protected by Gyo or not, Gon will be able to understand if he is using Little Flower as a feint in order to attack him somewhere else. After he is quickly able to deduce how Gon is defending himself, he decides to use Little Flower with both of his hands. He advises Gon that it's not worth continuing to fight, as he can see that he has a lot of talent and potential, and at the moment he is willing to throw it all away because of his pride. He is not backing down. He tries to convince Gon to give up. He explains to him how devastating Little Flower can be. If it is attacked on the extremities, it will blow them away. If he is attacked by Little Flower on his skull, then it will cause permanent brain damage. And if his body is attacked, then his bones will be crushed and his organs will be even ruptured. Now that he is using both of his hands, his risk of being attacked has doubled. Biski had even prepared for this eventuality. But because Gon hasn't stuck to the plan, Genthru has started using Little Flower with both of his hands a lot sooner than expected. During his training, she had even told Gon that it is a red flag if he decides to do this. And it is imperative that he follows the plan if this does happen. But it is strange seeing this side of his character. I knew that Gon was stubborn, but I didn't know that he had this much pride. He apologizes to both Killua and Biski, and he decides not to follow the plan, as instead he improvises. He is aware that it is selfish of him, but his gut feeling is reassuring him to improvise. Gon is continuing to be persistent because it appears that he has a plan of his own. Angered by Gon's unwillingness to back down, he decides now to use Little Flower on each of his limbs, until only his head remains. During these next few moments, we see the manifestation of the monster within Gon. It is nowhere near his transformation in the Chimera Ant arc, but his stubbornness and his desire not to give up allows us to witness a very different side to his character, one who totally disregards his own well-being for the sake of his desired outcome. In chapter 180, Genthru grabs both of his hands and uses Little Flower on each of them, but behaving very destructively, Gon sacrifices both of his arms, to the extent that his left hand has been completely destroyed. His left hand that was destroyed had no aura protecting it. The right hand that he decided not to sacrifice had only 30% of his aura protecting it, while he focused 70% of his aura into his foot, which he had used to kick Genthru in the jaw at the moment of the explosion. It is a completely insane strategy, and something that he did not expect Gon to use. Despite his injuries, he is still able to clench his right fist. After he had kicked his jaw, he had tried to use his ability Junken, but it misses when Genthru trips over a rock. He thinks to himself that Gon has to now give up. His left hand is completely gone and his right hand is severely injured. Surely his pride must now be satisfied after withstanding Genthru's attacks and even being able to successfully land an attack on him, but Gon is far from giving up. After Genthru crushes Gon's throat, Gon transforms one of his cards into gasoline and soaks Genthru with it. This will now prevent him from using Little Flower. In chapter 181, their battle finally concludes. He tries to use his ability called Countdown on Gon, but before he can, Gon uses his ability Junken in order to strike the ground. This results in the two of them falling into a pit. Gon then uses a card to summon a rock to fall onto Genthru. Genthru is able to avoid the rock, but he is trapped in a tight spot. Gon takes advantage of this situation in order to fire a Junken that Genthru cannot avoid. Understanding that he has no way to avoid this attack, he pleads to Gon that he gives up, but Gon is merciless and decides to attack him with it anyway. His stubbornness and his determination pulls through as he has now defeated Genthru. After Gon meets back up with Killua and Biski, they tie the three bombers up, and they take all of their cards. Biski uses the card Angel's Breath in order to heal Gon's hands and his throat, and anything else that's wrong with him. In chapter 182, Gon and his team finally have 99 cards but the card numbered 0 remains. After the 99 cards are obtained, an announcement is made that a quiz will be held, and the winner of the quiz will win card number 0. Gon ends up winning the quiz after scoring 87 out of 100. He has finally obtained all 100 cards. In chapter 183, we see Hisoka securing a deal with the Exorcist. Abengain releases himself from Genthru's countdown. He then travels to Hisoka's location. He desires to return with him to the real world in order to make a small fortune by performing an exorcism on Krollo. Meanwhile, Gon, Killua, and Biski arrive at Greed Island Castle, which is located in the town Limero. They meet two game makers called List and Duan. A lot of people draw the comparison between Duan and Togashi, especially after an image of Togashi playing Dragon Quest in a very messy room was circulated online, and it appears that he has reproduced this photograph in art form through Duan's character. Gon unfortunately learns that Jin isn't on the island, nor is he in the castle. It is revealed that after all 100 cards are obtained, an individual can return to the real world with with three cards of their choosing. It is revealed that Jin was the lead designer
designer of Greed Island. He had created the game with 11 of his other friends. After hearing a few stories about Jin, Gon and the others decide on the three cards that they want to return to the real world with. They decide on Blue Planet, Paladin's Necklace, and Plot of Beach. After a parade celebrating their success, they return to the real world. It appears that Gon and Killua had a strategy for picking Paladin's Necklace and Plot of Beach. Gon materializes the Paladin's Necklace and uses it to transform the Plot of Beach card into an Accompany card. Gon does this because when he first arrived on Greed Island, the first person that he had met in the game wasn't Gorainu. It was someone else that he hadn't seen before. The name as it appears in the book is spelt as N-I-double-G, but he realized this rearranged is his father's name, Jin. It is a clever anagram, so he assumes that his father must have brought him to Greed Island when he was just a baby. Gon and Killua thank Bisky for all of her training and bid her farewell, as they use the accompany card to travel to Gon's father's location. Upon arriving there, they see a mysterious silhouetted figure, which is shockingly revealed to be Kite, the first professional hunter that we briefly had seen in the series 185 chapters ago. It appears that Jin had tricked Gon to travel to Kite's location. Gon and Killua begin to share with Kite about their journey up until this point. While this is going on, we see a rare glimpse of Jin speaking to one of the game masters. He states that Gon has weakness because he has his friend Killua with him all of the time and he doesn't want to meet him like this. He would consider seeing him if he had come by himself. Jin had specifically requested that if Gon had used the card Magnetic Force, it would have come to his location. But if he had used the card Accompany and traveled with Killua, it would have transported him to Kite's location. After speaking with Kite, he reveals to Gon that he has already found Jin. He offers to tell Gon the location of his father, but Gon refuses because he wants to look for him himself. And thus, at the end of chapter 185, the Greed Island arc concludes, and the story immediately continues on to the Chimera Antarc. Like I mentioned at the start of this video, this arc has a totally different setting than any other arc that we have seen up until this point. I found it fascinating seeing the characters going through a video game setting. I found it interesting seeing Gon and Killua progress through the game, as well as seeing how much they have actually progressed and developed as characters from the beginning to the end of the game. There are a lot of highlights for me when it comes to the Greed Island arc. I'd spoken about how much I enjoyed Hisoka's involvement. In addition to him deciding to help Gon and the others, I loved that he had some interactions with the members of the Phantom Troop. It is always a treat to see his character. Without him, the dodgeball game that they play against Razor would not have felt the same. Speaking of which, the dodgeball game was one of my highlights of this arc. We get to see how close Gon and Killua are as friends, to the point that we see the lengths that Killua will go to in order to assist his friend Gon. In addition to this, we see how much Gon now relies upon Killua to be there for him. And what makes this even more memorable is seeing the two characters interacting and working together with Hisoka. In the previous arcs, the characters have been trained by Wing. In this arc, we see them being trained by Wing's teacher, Bisky. Bisky is another character who, upon first inspection, we don't really think much of, but she just so happens to be one of the strongest characters that we have come across up until this point. Evidently, Togashi enjoys deceiving us through the appearances of his characters. Who would have assumed that Bisky would have been this powerful, and she would easily take the title of the strongest female within Hunter x Hunter? I found that Greed Island and the whole concept of the game was very original. It is very clear that Togashi was heavily inspired by the RPG genre of games while he was writing this arc, but he was able to implement it successfully in this manga arc. This arc is very divisive, as some people believe that it went on for far too long, or it was just very different to what they have seen up until this point. But I don't really see these things as being weaknesses. I think that Togashi is just experimenting with his story and taking risks with it. I don't think that everything about the Greed Island arc is perfect, but I believe that it certainly holds up as an excellent story arc. However, there are some issues that I do have with it, and these problems stem from the antagonist of the arc, Genthru. When he is compared to the other antagonists of Hunter x Hunter, like Hisoka, Krollo, or even Meruem, it is clear that he is not as memorable in terms of his design or his motive. Now, it's not to say that his actions weren't deplorable, it's just I don't think that he came across as being as menacing as he could have been. Even before coming to this arc, it was very hard to remember who the villain of the Greed Island arc was. I do wish that Genthru and his team of bombers received more character development. I would have loved to learn more about their backstory, and seeing them fleshed out as individuals, this would have made Genthru and his team come across as more memorable. Instead, before I had gone through the entire Greed Island arc for this video, I had felt that Razor had played the role of an antagonist better than Genthru had. As an antagonistic force, he perfectly challenged Gon as a character. Genthru had challenged Gon in his own unique way, but I felt that the match with Razor was very unique. Their encounter fitted the unique setting of Greed Island. As they faced off against Razor during a dodgeball match which felt like a back and forth battle, I felt like that encounter was suitable for this arc because it is unlike anything that I have seen within Hunter x 
Monster Hunter or in any other shonen battle manga. Momentarily I thought that I was reading a sports manga. Another compliment for the Greed Island arc is watching Gon and Killua progress through their training. You can see them convincingly get stronger through each phase of their training. Despite them making immense progress, it is still evident that they have a long way to go. Because when it comes to pure strength and power, Genthru was stronger than Gon, but Gon was able to defeat him by outsmarting him through improvising his own strategy to defeat him. It is factors like that that make the series feel so unpredictable. Even if one character is vastly stronger than the other, the outcome is not guaranteed to favour the individual who is stronger. This arc once again builds upon the Nen power system, as we learn about aura distribution to different parts of the body, and how this can benefit an individual through an offensive or defensive strategy. It explains more about the power system but in a simplified way that doesn't make it feel complicated or contrived. Each additional point that we learn about Nen is implemented within the battles which occur later on. Like after Bisky teaches Gon and Killua about aura distribution, Gon perfectly implements this and solidifies the concept to us during his battle against Genthru, when he had distributed 70% of his aura into his foot and 30% of his aura into his right hand. Leaving his left hand unprotected it was blown off. This singular moment teaches us about the effectiveness of aura distribution in terms of defence by Gon protecting his right hand and the effectiveness of aura distribution in offence through Gon kicking Genthru in the jaw with his foot which has 70% of his aura distributed to it. And to wrap up my thoughts on this arc, I would have loved to have seen more of the Phantom Troop because their brief encounters were very memorable and enjoyable to see. But at the same time, this arc does wrap up with a few unanswered plot threads which entice you to continue the story. An example of these unanswered plot threads include Hisoka making a deal with the Nen Exorcist and taking him to the real world in order to exercise Kurapika's judgement chain that has been placed onto Krolo's heart. We learn that Hisoka is going through all of these lengths in order to battle against Krolo, so it remains to be seen if Krolo will be exercised of Kurapika's Nen. And if he is, then we have Krolo versus Hisoka to look forward to. In addition to this, during the Greed Island arc, we get the first ever glimpse of Jin during the present timeline of the Hunter x Hunter story. Gon's desire to find his father continues, as at the end of the Greed Island arc, he was incredibly close to achieving his goal, but for now it remains as an unanswered plot thread. And of course, the biggest unanswered plot thread at the end of the Greed Island arc is in regards to a mysterious creature which has washed up onto a beach, and how this coincides with the reintroduction of Kite into the series, a character who I'd personally wanted to see again ever since his first appearance in the first chapter. When I used to think about my favourite story told within the shonen genre, I recalled great sagas like the Chunin exams from Naruto, Marine Ford from One Piece, the Soul Society arc within Bleach, and the Cell Saga from Dragon Ball Z. My standards for what I expected from storytelling were never really elevated, they were constantly met with equally great stories, that is until I finally jumped onto the Hunter x Hunter bandwagon a few years after the 2011 anime concluded. I loved many things about the show, and honestly didn't expect it to change how I view shonen stories story arcs, but when I reached the Chimera Ant arc, it literally changed my whole perception of a great shonen story. In this video, I want to explain why the Chimera Ant arc is my favourite story told within Shonen Jump, and what exactly made it feel so different, unique and innovative. The Chimera Ant arc ran from episode 76 to 136 of the Hunter x Hunter 2011 anime. It did not receive an anime adaptation in the prior Hunter x Hunter 1999 series, due to the infamous nature of the manga author Yoshihiro Togashi going on hiatus. This arc was told from chapter 186 until 318. Togashi began this arc in October 2003 and finally concluded it in October 2011, a total of 8 long years. It really is no wonder that people have dubbed Hunter x Hunter as Hiatus x Hiatus. Despite this, it's an undisputed fact that the material that we do get from Togashi is some of the best examples of elevating shonen storytelling that we have seen. I want to share my experience of when I realised my expectations pulled beneath my feet. During my first watch of the Chimera Ant arc. Let's see what made this arc feel so innovative through the threat introduced by the villains, the stakes placed upon the world, and the effects on the characters we have come to know and love up until this point. And lastly, how all of these different elements culminate into one of the best character arcs I've seen unfold in anime. The best way to begin this analysis is with the characters that are introduced into this arc. A new species of dangerous insect is a threat that is posed here. They are assigned as a B-level threat by the Hunter Association. This newly introduced species is the Chimera ants. These humanoid creatures inflict grievous bodily harm upon their victims as they devour their prey and reproduce offspring which present with differing characteristics of the species that they have just consumed. This reproductive process is described as phagogenesis. What made me feel so intrigued by the world of Hunter x Hunter was how, despite the threat that the Chimera ants posed on the world, they were not a rank A level threat. The Chimera ants we later learn arrived from the Dark Continent, an unexplored forbidden area of the Hunter x Hunter world. To add to the 
intrigue of the Dark Continent, it is said that humanity encountered five great calamities during their different expeditions to this continent. All five are different species which pose a threat higher than the bee level that the Chimera Ants had been assigned. I illustrate this to show the world building and the feeling of utter mystery that Hunter x Hunter does so well to convey. It is similar to One Piece as it reminds me of how Ishiro Oda introduces and builds up the new world. During this arc in Hunter x Hunter, we have a teaser to the five great calamities. This appetizer comes in the form of the Chimera Ants. The queen of the Chimera Ants arrives from the Dark Continent and begins to crave human flesh after consuming them and through phagogenesis she produces offspring which inherit traits from their prior lives. It is a truly disturbing and sickening concept. I remember when Kite explained the threat of the Chimera Ants to Gon and Killua. I couldn't help but to feel a sensation of fear. This feeling remained with me throughout the entirety of this arc. The whole tone and mood of the series had shifted and felt like I was watching a different anime once the ants had been introduced. It is contrasted heavily with the previous Greed Island arc, which feels light-hearted in comparison to this arc. The aim of the Queen Chimera Ant is to give birth to her three royal guards and her king, so that they can dominate the world. For this goal to be accomplished, she requires her soldiers to source high-quality humans for her to feast upon. With each new generation of ants that the queen gives birth to, their intellect increases, and thus they realise that humans with Nen ability provide greater nourishment and will hasten the arrival of the king and his guards. I love the growth of the queen ant and her soldiers in the early episodes of this arc, as they quickly learn about Nen, demonstrating growth in strength, power and intellect. It felt like a race against time to stop this species before it was too late, as they were developing in my opinion at an alarming rate. Once the king called Meruem is born, he becomes the main antagonist of this arc. This powerful humanoid has a perfectly toned muscular structure, accompanied by a powerful tail which is topped off with a stinger, which he frequently uses as a weapon. Meruem is born as a cruel and brutal ruler, which is aligned with the queen's desire to give birth to a perfect king. He believes himself to be the greatest form of life, superseding all other life forms. His apathy is displayed firsthand when he pays no concern towards his mother, who appears to be dying after giving birth to him. Leading up to his introduction, we had been hyped to see him for the longest time. The expectations we come to have, in my opinion, are perfectly matched when Meruem is revealed. He oozes an aura of sinister malice. He also gives off this impression through his subtle nature to kill anyone disobedient to him, that he has an incredible strength and power which is laying dormant within him. The terror and threat that he posed to the world was exciting to witness. I believe him to be the most perfect shonen antagonist. Meruem is accompanied by his three royal guards called Poof, Yupi and Pito. They are given the responsibility to safeguard the king at all costs. The royal guards are stronger than any of the other ants and were born with the ability to use Nen. They require this great strength so that they can protect the king by fighting his enemies and fulfilling his every desire. They were born as a result of the Queen Chimera Ant devouring hundreds of humans, including those who could use Nen abilities, causing the birth of the three gifted royal guards. The three of them helped the king to fulfill the goal that the queen imprinted into their biological makeup, the goal to dominate the world. They are loyal to the plans laid out by the queen, but they show no empathy or consideration towards her when the queen Chimera Ant is dying. Despite having the power to heal her, they leave her to die. Carrying out the plan of world domination proves to become very difficult as Meruem eventually detours from the queen's original plans and begins to have a change of heart. This is one of the key story beats featured within this arc. I will cover this extensively later, as the growth of Meruem and his detachment from the goals of his mother and his royal guards is one of the many examples of great character development and storytelling within this arc. Each of the royal guards have their own distinct abilities, personality and appearance. Puff is the most calm and level-headed of the three royal guards. However, he does have an intense devotion to the king, which can cause his judgement to become clouded. He holds himself to a standard of ideals, and failing to not meet these ideals are never an option for Puff. As a character, he truly was limited by his own perfect imaginings of himself, the king and the world around him. He truly believes the king to be the peak of evolution, and the only being worthy of dominating the world. This mental image of the king is what Puff holds dear to. When the king himself fails to live up to this ideal mental version that Puff has constructed, it causes him to become irrational and behave of his own accord, believing that what he is doing is the best for the king. However, Puff becomes loyal to his own ideal version of the king, and not Meruem himself, who is the individual behind the royal label. Puff also becomes enraged in private when the king would not change to match his expectations, going as far as to act of his own accord out of devotion to preserve his mental image of the king, and to help this version of the king to come into fruition. Yupi is the most simple of the three royal guards. He possesses a great deal of strength with very little knowledge of self-identity or ego. This allows him to remain dedicated to his duty to save the king. Due to not letting his mind be preoccupied by unnecessary thoughts, he is able to focus on his instincts and react without any hesitation. In comparison to the 
the other two guards, Yupi refrained from partaking in eccentric personality defining behaviours, which would often leave him feeling confused after observing Pito and Puff exhibit such distinctive individual personalities. It was a great contrast, despite feeling like a blank slate, Yupi's naivety, lack of care for his own desires aided in him being the perfect controlled comparison to his fellow guards. Yupi does however begin to grow as a character while he battles with the other hunters during the palace invasion. He becomes more cunning, thankful to his enemies and even goes as far as to spare their lives, demonstrating his capacity to show mercy to his opponents. Pito is the final member of the royal guard. She is a cat-like Kimura ant. Her behaviours are very similar to a feline as she plays with her prey and she has a tendency to become distracted and curious, causing her to often get carried away while battling her opponents. Despite having a very playful nature, she has a terrifying counter personality, which results in her showing her cruelty through her evil, sinister acts. Her actions cause Gon and Killua to feel completely powerless and face the harsh reality of being unable to protect someone close to them. Pito was responsible for Gon's development, growth and even regression during this arc. In the Hunter x Hunter anime, we are introduced to Kite, who is the student of Gin Freaks, Gon's father. In the manga, Kite is one of the first characters that we meet during the introduction of the series, as we see him save a young Gon from an attack by a mother fox bear who was protecting her cub. We see Kite scold Gon, as his naivety has resulted in Kite being forced to kill the fox bear due to Gon's life being in danger. Kite recognises that this boy is Gin's son. He then informs him that his father is still alive, and states that the search to find his father would be an incredibly difficult one. Unfortunately, this key introduction and even beginning of the series is missed out in the 2011 anime. I think that this entire scene helps the audience to understand Gon's purpose, as well as understanding what a hunter actually is. As we see an example of a hunter via Kite, we understand the meaning behind this title and the concept through his introduction. We are also teased about the struggles that Gon may face in regards to how difficult it will be for him to find his father, and to fulfil his desire to become a great hunter. Sadly, instead of this flashback being shown in the first episode of the 2011 anime, we learn about these events via a flashback when Gon first meets Kite during the beginning of the Chimera Ant arc. It robs the excitement from the viewer who doesn't get to completely appreciate the relationship between Gon and Kite. It definitely would have been a more impactful reunion if the anime followed the manga more closely. The comparison between Kite and Shanks from One Piece has also been made previously and is even more glaring when you learn that they are voiced by the same voice actor. When you consider the impact of Kite's involvement on Gon's development, you can draw a similar comparison to the impact of Shanks on Luffy and his determination to become the Pirate King. Kite, similar to Shanks, also ends up losing a arm while he protects Gon from the royal guard Pito. The involvement of Kite during this arc drew me in from the very beginning as he is hunting down a lead to a supposed Queen Chimera Ant. While he describes their species, we learn about how much of a disturbing threat that they pose upon the world. Kite has a very stoic personality and upon first inspection, he appears to be apathetic and blunt with his words, causing him to come across as being rude or inconsiderate. But in fact, he is caring and compassionate towards his comrades and he values the gift of life greatly. We see his consideration for life when he scolds a young Gon for leaving him with no choice but to kill the fox bear who endangered his life. He even warns Killua and Gon multiple times before they embark on their journey to find the Chimera Ants about the dangers which lay up ahead. The situation was unprecedented, they had no idea what they would be up against. It caused Kite to obviously feel cautious and concerned for their safety. He even ends up underestimating just how talented and skilled Gon and Killua are, but they remind Kite that they are pro hunters after all and that they can handle what lays ahead. Kite's fate is incredibly tragic and I will go into it in further detail later on and how it impacts Gon and consequently even Killua. The protagonist of the series Gon is a cheerful, naive, adventure seeking young boy. Similar to other shonen protagonists, he is very simple and narrow minded. He desires to become a great hunter so that he can understand every aspect of the profession, allowing him to gain some understanding as to why his father chose to pursue being a great hunter rather than staying with and raising a son. Gon is incredibly talented and rises to any occasion when he is presented with a challenge or an adversary. However, his temperament and tendency to give in to his impulses cause him to come to terms with his limitations, which consequently lead to him feeling pain and sadness. During the Chimera Ant arc, Gon undergoes intense emotional pain, which transforms his personality, causing him to become cold-hearted and vengeful as he seeks to avenge the death of his mentor Kite. Killua, who is Gon's best friend, undergoes many changes during this arc, including overcoming his fear of opponents who are stronger than himself. We see Killua grow immensely in this arc as he suffers a great deal due to his attachment to Gon, how he silently helps him while feeling pain, due to his friend feeling troubled and upset. Killua shows a great deal of empathy and compassion. He learns to suppress his bloodthirsty, ruthless nature as he grows closer to Gon and spends more time with him, which consequently makes 
arcs and become more humanized, Killua is incredibly nuanced and his growth is displayed during this arc, as we see him mature a great deal through controlling his emotions and behaviours in response to several distressing situations which occur. His rational and logical thinking saved not only his life but even Gon's, who loses his senses and gives into his rage when Pito attacks Kite, causing him to lose his arm. This powerful scene shows the contrasting nature of the two friends, as Gon furiously gives into his anger while Killua is forced to knock him unconscious and flee for safety as per Kite's wishes. Kite chooses to face Pito while letting the boys get away. Kite even commends Killua for his quick rational thinking, as he determined very quickly the incredibly monstrous power of Pito. Realising the vast difference between their powers, he knew that if they were to have stayed with Kite then all three of them would have been killed. Hunter x Hunter features some of the most nuanced and rich characters within any shonen series. I could talk about several of the Chimera Ants, as well as the members of the Chimera Ant extermination team, which include Isaac Netero, Morel, Nov, Knuckle and Shoot. However, this video would go on for far too long, and I think I've covered enough characters to now begin to analyse the events which begin to unfold around them during this arc. After learning about reports of humans being attacked by Chimera Ants in the NGL area, Kite decides to investigate in an attempt to stop the spread of this dangerous species. By locating the Queen Chimera Ant, Kite displays his compassion for human life by stating that the Chimera Ants may well have begun hunting humans to feast upon. His priority is to save the people from being devoured. As a result, he may not be able to entirely help Gon and Killua if they were to get into danger. Out of concern for the well-being of Gon and Killua, he demands that they must be able to protect themselves if they wish to come with him to the NGL. The two of them understand and agree to this requirement, while Kite foreshadows that if anything were to happen to him, then they should prioritise their own safety by leaving him behind to escape. It is evident that Kite is fearing for the worst. As I said previously, it is an unprecedented situation. I initially thought that he was underestimating Gon and Killua, as even I thought that they would be more than capable to assist Kite even if he were to get into danger. Despite them being very young, they are pro hunters and have demonstrated their skills and talents throughout the series, but it would seem that in this situation they got in way over their head. The two of them are fairly confident in their own abilities and agree to help Kite, insisting that they can handle themselves, but we soon learn the harsh reality of failing to back up your words by your actions. Due to realisations of powerlessness which are coupled with terror inducing feelings of hopelessness. These two emotions are more than enough to silence anyone's spirit and confidence. Arriving in the NGL, they quickly discover disturbing evidence to suggest the Chimera ants have begun mauling and eating humans. Following the trail of dead bodies, they quickly discover their first Chimera ant soldier, called Ramot. Kite continuing to side with caution, suggests that the two boys defeat the Chimera ant while he observes them. With this being the first of many to come, Kite gives the boys an opportunity to prove themselves during this battle. Not just just taking their word for it, he wants to see them demonstrate that they can handle themselves. He continues to remind them that he will not always be there to help them, very evidently coming across as slightly condescending and making Gon and Killua even feel like they are being underestimated, as he continues to tell them if they cannot defeat this lone soldier then they will have to leave. Overconfidently, the two boys flaunt their title as pro hunters and demand that he does not treat them like little children, before totally defeating the Chimera Ant. I felt on the edge of my seat wondering when this threat that was causing Kite to feel so so cautious would emerge. During the battle, the Chimera Ant was gaining the upper hand and it wasn't until Gon and Killua used Nen, which turned the tables in their favour and caused them to defeat Ramot. During their journey to the Ant's Nest, they continue to face several Chimera Ants and defeat them with ease. The purpose of the Chimera Ants is to gather high quality humans to provide the Queen with nourishment so that she can give birth to the King as soon as possible. Now the Ants who were produced by Phagogenesis appear to have naturally adopted the human personality traits of egotism, individuality and greed. The ants begin to act of their own accord, wanting to gain more power, control and ultimately dominance. These traits first emerged when the ants began to compete with each other, comparing whose squadron had brought the most humans for the queen. They begin to deter from the queen's plans, instead wanting to eat humans for themselves and even some wanting to keep them as pets or for torture. It is interesting as the Chimera ants are a mixture of animals and humans. For the most part, humans have done a great deal to harm animals through destroying their habitats, keeping them in barbaric slaughterhouses and consuming their flesh, with little regard as to how the animal was treated before it died. Through this piece of fiction, we see these very animals gain sentient life, 
crossbreeded with the very traits which bring out the worst in people. Animals who in their past life who were tortured or forced to experience it are mixed with humans who have the capacity to inflict pain onto others, all for the constant thirst for more, so that they can try to fill a void of inadequacy which is amplified by their own egos. So it is no surprise when we see the ants want to dominate the world of humans and even go as far as to keep them chained up as pets. This arc comments on the human condition through the Chimera ants and we get more of this as the arc progresses. As Gon, Killua and Kite near the Queen's Nest, they trigger Neferpito's N, which allows her to feel their presence. She wastes little time by arriving and immediately cutting Kite's arm off, as he yells for Gon and Killua to escape. Gon reacts with fury and screams, building his power but Killua knocks him out cold, heeding Kite's plea for them to escape. Kite commends Killua for realising their limitations, and how little help they would be if they remained with him. So instead of being a hindrance, Killua carries the incapacitated Gon and flees, leaving Kite behind to battle Apito. I get such a chilling sensation when I see Killua running away carrying Gon, as he mutters to himself, we were overconfident repeatedly. Killua feeling Pito's incredibly malicious Nen, realised instantly that even Kite was utterly outmatched. We were fools is a quote that really stays with me from this portion of the story. To utterly know when you have been best how very little your efforts up until now meant, to taste the cold harsh reality of life. This series draws so many parallels to our own existence. This isn't a shonen story where the protagonist somehow wins through the power of friendship or a miraculous inconsequential power up. Hunter x Hunter literally just rendered Gon and Killua useless in this singular moment. You cannot help but to think back to when they reassured Kite by naively stating that they were pro-hunters and requested for him to not treat them like little kids. They foolishly had no idea of the threat that an experienced hunter like Kite was anticipating all along. Now Killua flees with regret, knowing that Kite has just sacrificed himself so that they could escape, knowing that if they weren't accompanying him then he may have been able to escape and avoided a confrontation with Pito. As the three pro-hunters Isaac Netero, Morel and Nov arrive. They order Killua to leave, while they go forward to destroy the ants. Killua however after feeding Pito's Nen claims that in terms of pure strength, the three of them would not be enough to defeat her. If this was a typical shonen, then that would have been the end of the conversation. However, by tactically applying your Nen and outsmarting your opponent, it results in a level of uncertainty which rules out strength and power as the only determining factors for victory. The three pro hunters remind Killua of this before they head to the NGL, an area gone on Killua are now no longer experienced enough to enter. Netero insists that the two of them must prove themselves to be worthy before returning to assist them. They are ordered to defeat Morel's two assassin apprentices within a time limit of a month if they are to be deemed worthy enough to assist in defeating the ants. When Gon finally regains consciousness, he thanks Killua for saving him. He agrees that if they stayed with Kite, then they would have only gotten in his way. Gon then displays his innocent, naive nature by stating with so much bright-eyed optimism that Kite is still alive, further elaborating that he managed to escape and is now in hiding. Gon sets his determination on gaining more strength so that he may be able to return to rescue Kite. The beauty of Killua and Gon is their contrasting personalities, experiences, and the most relevant for this situation is their contrasting maturity. Kite was killed by Pito, and Killua is all too aware of this fact, yet he watches the hopeful Gon state otherwise. He says it perfectly himself, sometimes Gon shines so brightly it is hard to look away. Killua doesn't have the heart to tell Gon otherwise. He cannot bring himself to speak the reality of the situation. He cannot shatter Gon's spirit. I am always hit with a heavy heart when I see the jaw-dropping Killua staring at Gon's innocence. He even questions whether it is selfish of him to stay with Gon, as Gon appears appears to retain so much of the childish innocence Killua was robbed of as a child. It is as though he is comforted by the cruel realities of the world by Gon's positivity, describing him as a light, which shines abundantly onto Killua's outlook of the world. When Gon finally confronts Pito later on in the arc, we see a vastly different version of himself. His resolve is to restore Kite, who we previously discovered as a lifeless training dummy, while also resolving to defeat Neferpito. Gon feels an incredible sense of regret and is unable to forgive himself for Kite's current physical state. It is an unimaginable scale of regret for not being able to prevent Pito from doing this to Kite. We can truly see the sadness, anger and guilt in Gon's words and actions. He is in a state of denial as he is refusing to accept Kite has died. He goes from we need to rescue Kite to we need to heal Kite after seeing his lifeless body. His change of mindset caused by his denial keeps his mind stable. When the palace invasion begins, Gon becomes narrow-minded, concentrated and merciless. He is totally focused on his desire to restore Kite and defeat Pito. 
Gon confronts her finally as she is using her Nen ability, Dr. Blythe, to heal Komugi. Gon furiously questions how she could be healing this girl when she murdered Kite without any remorse. Out of duty for Miroem, she is healing Komugi, but Gon is so enraged and blinded by his anger, it is Killua who reasons with him to not attack Pito while she is defenseless, as she is the only one who is able to restore Kite. He eventually orders Pito to come with him to heal Kite, after her one hour time limit to heal Komugi is up. When Pito receives a call from Puff stating that Komugi is safe, she then feels like she has nothing to lose. No longer in a situation where she is held hostage or being forced to follow orders, she reveals that Kite was indeed killed by her. In his current condition, there is nothing that can be done to restore him. Pito's Nen ability can only prevent a corpse from deteriorating. It does not have the power to bring the dead back to life. Gon utterly succumbs to his despair. We see this immediately as his eyes become hollow upon this revelation. The truth Gon didn't want to accept and refuse to consider is crushingly presented to him. The bright-eyed protagonist is devastated by Pito's words. He weeps for Kite. Pito confirms that his soul is no longer in this world, so consequently there is no way to heal him. The cold-hearted Pito apologises to Gon. She even feels for his loss due to Gon's helplessness, which is so evident it's unbearable to see. Guilt, grief and sadness is what Gon feels. Regret that he accompanied Kite to investigate NGL, feeling like it was his fault Kite was killed, due to him being distracted by protecting Gon and Killua. He is conflicted as he argues with himself who is responsible for Kite's death, switching between himself by feeling guilt and then anger as he directs that towards Pito for being the one who murdered Kite. Gon has lost his sanity and understandably cannot be reasoned with. He is so utterly lost in his emotions as we see a flashback of Gon reassuring Killua that there is no way that Kite will be defeated. Gon's breakdown is the result of shining too brightly, being too optimistic and ignoring the cruelty of the world. Most shonen series don't ever let the protagonist be utterly crushed. They protect their worldview and keep them safe from cruelty through unrealistic optimism and positive attitude. There is no hope in Gon's situation. The hope that remained is ripped from his heart. What is left is a broken character that is repeating to himself, Kite is dead. Realising his worst fear has come to be true, Gon had literally deluded himself into thinking Pito could heal Kite. He clung to this fantasy. Heartbreakingly, he asks for help for anyone to help him in his hopelessness, as he knows there is nothing he can do for Kite. Tears flowing down his face as Pito summons Dr. Blythe, he looks at her with his last shred of light that remains, as though it is his final piece of hope. Maybe Pito has summoned her Nen ability to try and assist Gon. She may attempt to indeed heal Kite. She may feel sorry for him, like we do after seeing his breakdown. He thinks Pito is going to help Kite. He begins to lie to himself again, falsely reassuring himself maybe Kite wasn't dead. This final bit of hope takes over his reasoning and logical thinking. The protagonist we begin this journey with, the character who came into this arc with so much innocence, happiness and positivity, is dismantled thoroughly here. What saddens me is for how long Gon is made to suffer, one blow after another. As we see Pito use her ability Dr. Blythe to heal herself, the level of heartlessness and cruelty she displays by doing this in front of a mourning Gon. Do sentient beings really possess the capacity to blatantly disregard others' feelings and emotions to this extent? I sometimes wonder if this even happens in our reality, but then I get reminded that of course the harsh truth of life is that there are such people who care so little for others' feelings. The truest depiction of a monster for me is someone who inflicts cruelty onto others while only caring for their own well-being, disregarding the feelings of others like they don't exist. Pito demonstrates how much of a monster she really is here. The only thing Gon feels he can do now is to defeat Pito. This is the only way he can deal with his emotions of sadness, anger, regret and grief. To gain the power to defeat Pito, Gon sacrifices everything. He doesn't care if he dies here. Gon gives up his life, his future, his potential, all to gain the power in this singular moment to defeat the one who has made him lose faith in the world. Gon's transformation grants him with power that is strong enough to rival Meruem. The cost to gain this strength was far more than what a boy, even as talented as Gon, could possibly handle. You have to understand the weight of this transformation. Gon gives up his desire to meet Gin, which was his life's dream, his bonds and friendships he has formed with Killua, Kurapika, Leorio and everyone, even sacrificing his very existence to gain this power. He does all of this within a split second. Pito is then brutally defeated by Gon as she realises that Gon sacrificed his entire life energy and thus his potential to grow up to become a threat to Meruem. She understands that Gon has given up his ability to use Nen. All of his talent and potential was exchanged to perform this miraculous feat. Killua who rushes to Gon witnesses his close friend distinguish all of his light and fall into utter darkness. Killua watches Gon who is covered in Pito's blood repeatedly crush his fist into her skull, attacking her already shattered body. He does this until nothing remains of her head. Killua comes to understand the extent of what Gon must have given up to transform. Pito's body strikes Gon even after death due to her intense devotion
promotion to the king. Her Nen controls her corpse to strike Gon. Having lost his arm, Gon quietly tells Killua that he isn't in any pain. He even feels glad that he could feel the same pain Kite did after losing his arm, feeling he has redeemed himself through having suffered slightly. What breaks my heart is how he tells a concerned Killua that he is okay, while having such a somber, sad expression on his face. It pains me to see Gon lie to himself and Killua like this. He then destroys Pito's corpse as Gon demonstrates how far he has drifted from his prior light description of himself. What must Killua be feeling to see the light of his world, his closest friend, sink into darkness, a feeling he knows all too well? Gon is the one who saved Killua from the torment and pain he suffered throughout his childhood. He showed him another side to life. What we witness at the conclusion of this battle is Killua unable to do the same for Gon. He wasn't able to save him from falling into darkness. I cannot recall if there is another shonen series which leaves you feeling anything but excited at the protagonist defeating the villain. Usually the hero powers up and heroically defeats the villain, as it is a moment of celebration and relief, but Pito's defeat is so empty. I feel so much regret for Gon due to everything he sacrificed. I even feel some remorse for Pito, who instinctively was serving the king until her dying breath. She was becoming ever so slightly humanised also, as she even apologised to Gon previously. Nobody deserves to be brutally killed the way that Pito was. Hunter x Hunter sets itself apart from other series by making you feel just how unrealistic it was for Gon to defeat Pito. This indeed ended up being true, due to the large price that had to be paid to accomplish such a feat. There is an incredible consequence for accomplishing such an incredible task. Killua watching Gon attack Pito's body while crying just sums up this moment entirely. This is anything but a victory. Gon loses his humanity and Killua is helpless to do anything for him. Through Gon's character, we see what it means to sink into darkness, shown through Gon losing his inner light, as he is exposed to the harsh, cruel truths of the world. On the opposite end of the spectrum, our antagonist, Meruem, undergoes a similar journey, but is faced with change through the bond that he forms with a girl called Komugi. Meruem is the most powerful Chimera ant, birthed by the queen. Ruling over the Chimera ants, he is the antagonist of this arc. I previously stated that he was the best shonen antagonist. This is due to the way that he is written, and the character arc that he undergoes. Meruem is born only knowing that he is the king, and it is his right to dominate the world. Other than this, he is figuratively a blank slate, like a newborn baby entering into the world, yet to form opinions of views on the surrounding environment. Due to his desire to dominate the world, he believes himself to be the most superior life form, showing no empathy for those weaker than him. He even devoured a child's flesh and spat it out, stating it is terrible compared to the feeling he had when he was nourished with Nen users in his mother's womb. Meruem was opposed to the structure of human society, voicing his opposition to the idea of people ruling over others due to their bloodlines or birthrights. He found it to be illogical and against the laws of nature to not have the most powerful rule over the weak. He eventually learns that there are great inequalities within human society. He observes that weak children are allowed to starve, while weak-minded leaders and fortunate individuals eat with a plentiful supply of food. He was especially disgusted by their greed and fear. Meruem questions the way that humans live. He is especially confused by their contradictions. After visiting a king and learning about humans allowing the weak to rule over them, he kills the king, while his dancers beg for their lives. Miriam questions them, asking if they showed any mercy to the cattle or animals that they slaughter daily to feast upon. Due to his disgust for humanity, he decides to restrict their freedoms and make them endure pain and suffering due to their idiotic customs and greedy selfishness. Out of boredom, Miriam begins to learn different board games, and one by one masters each of them and defeats the world champions for all the games that he masters. That is until he learns a game called Gungi, and begins to challenge the world Gungi champion called Komugi. She is clumsy, quiet, and rather childish. Her personality is very simple-minded, and she tends to speak too much and comes across as disrespectful due to speaking informally. She has lost her eyesight, so is unable to play Gungi without someone speaking the positions out on the board for her. Komugi defeats Meruem very easily, as her whole attitude and demeanour changes while she plays Gungi. Despite Meruem studying the rules more and improving, he is still unable to defeat her. Meruem becomes obsessed with their games. He forgets to eat and even begins to use Komugi's own tactics against her, but she still counters them with ease. Meruem eventually offers Komugi a wager for their next game, telling her that if she wins, then he will give her anything that she desires. However, if she loses, Meruem has requested to take her left arm. However, Komugi contemplates the offer, and instead tells the king that she will place her life on the line, should she lose. She offers her life up due to stating that Gungi is the only thing that she has focused upon. Should she lose, then her life would be rendered useless. Meruem surprisingly laughs at her response, due to being surprised by Komugi's offer of her life. 
He then tears his own left arm off as an apology to her, but cut him until he treats himself. Even with Meruem threatening to kill her if she doesn't play, she still refuses and tells him that he should instead try to kill her in a game of Gungi. Meruem accepts her terms and has Puff heal his left arm for him. Strangely enough, this is the first person that we see who isn't afraid of Meruem, who can voice their opinion against him and doesn't succumb to his fear tactics. Despite ordering that he will play Gungi with her without any breaks until she is defeated, he allows her to rest once he can see that she is exhausted, his reasoning being that he would not consider it to be a fair victory if he defeated her while she was tired. Komugi exchanges tips with Meruem and helps him to improve his technique, all the while she improves at an alarming rate also. Due to playing Gungi continuously with Meruem, she eventually awakens her Nen, realising that her ability is to improve in Gungi, as she sees various tactics and moves play out in her mind. Komugi while resting is attacked by a bird, but she does not yell out in pain or request for help. Meruem who enters her room to find her being attacked kills the bird. She is concerned about troubling Meruem, but he states that she is an important guest. Meruem at this point begins to develop feelings for her that he cannot begin to explain. He even orders Pito to watch over her and to protect her from now on. Due to boredom, the king begins to play board games and develops feelings for Komugi. Unintentionally, he diverts his attention from his main goal of world conquest and focuses his efforts on defeating Komugi. Through Komugi, Meruem changes his initial perception of humans and learns that there is more to them than meets the eye. He further elaborates upon his changed perception through his battle with Netero. When you consider what the Chimera ants did, you feel a sense of disgust, hatred and apathy towards them. But how is it that Hunter x Hunter can make you care for a character like Meruem, who in his introduction ate the flesh of a child? It is maddening to even consider such a character could become reformed or have a change of heart. Meruem was pure evil when he was born, but throughout human history, they too have inflicted travesty onto their own kind. The Chimera ants were born without any other feelings we grow up and develop. They are newborn babies taking the form of full developed sentient beings. Humans grow up with several people that they develop feelings for and care about. These feelings of love and hatred that develop are the very reasons as to why humans are so perfectly flawed. The ants behaved with such inconsideration, lack of empathy and pure malice due to lacking human emotions, but that does not mean that they were incapable of learning them through relationships and experiences. When Miriam develops feelings for Komugi, this causes him to become more humanized. Through the influence of one girl who had assumed her entire existence was meaningless, the perception of the King was changed. Like I said previously, I feel like this arc is a great discussion on the human condition. When Miriam battles Netero, Miriam speaks about his changed perception and new outlook on humanity. He tells Netero that he no longer considers humans to be livestock or a source of food. He is even allowing him to live by letting him surrender. Convincingly, Miriam even tries to reason with Netero, questioning why he wants to fight him despite knowing that he is going to lose, stating that if he is doing this for the betterment of mankind, then he should join Miriam and his plans to rid the world of of inequality and injustice. Meruem surprisingly comes to the conclusion that power should be used to serve and protect the weak who deserve to live. He deems people worthy of living to be individuals like Komugi and even Netero himself. The king sits on the ground and wishes to not resolve this conflict through the exchange of fists. He would rather talk to Netero about their differences. The chairman, however, tempted by this offer, chooses to follow his duty to the Hunter Association and attacks Meruem. The Hunter Association was fully aware that Netero was no match for Meruem. However, they knew that once Netero Netero was killed, the nuclear weapon would be activated, thus killing the ants and the surrounding hunters. If Meruem did not suggest to fight elsewhere, then the innocent people in the area would all have died. The Hunter Association deems that this mass killing would be justified, as long as the ants were killed also. This is another example of how humanity could stoop to lows equally as low as the Chimera ants. At least the ants have an excuse of never having learnt emotions or experienced feelings through relationships, but what is our excuse? After his battle with Netero, Meruem began to understand the true nature of humans, even beginning to admire their determination, especially as he learns about Netero and his commitment to his training, how the chairman practiced the same move for years on end, a feat that no ordinary person could accomplish. After this, he believes that he was wrong to impose his belief system onto others. He realises he has no right to try and rid the world of inequality. He no longer wishes to needlessly kill people he deems unworthy, as each person has the ability to possess great potential. Meruem eventually dies due to the poison released from the poor man's rose that Netero had detonated upon his death. In his final moments, he chooses to spend them with Komugi. His final wish is to play one last game of Gungi with her, as he finally tells her his name. Komugi chooses to stay with Meruem, despite knowing the poison radiating from his body would kill her too, emphasising the strong bond that the two of them are formed, as they choose to spend their final moments with each other. Meruem, who is the strongest character within the Hunter x Hunter universe, acknowledges the strengths of humans, even admiring them. He does this through the influence of someone as weak as Komugi. He understands about what it feels like to express 
compassion, empathy and concern for others. Through his failure to defeat Komugi and the bond that he forms with her, he develops compassion and empathy for her. Through Netero, he comes to understand the great potential that humans possess, how each person can attain unheard of heights through surpassing their own limitations. Through this, he begins to understand the value of life. It is impressive writing on Togashi's part to write a character who is not at the mercy of the events of the story. As an antagonist, Meruem does not fulfil the role assigned to him. His character arc excels the typical cliché of shonen tropes, as he is written with more depth than a villain set out to conquer the world. Our expectations are swept from beneath us, as we see a villain embrace his humanity and learn to acknowledge the very people he attempted to dominate. It is so easy to speak at length about the story and characters of Hunter x Hunter. They are so well written and nuanced. Initially, I intended this video to be half of the length that it ended up being, but even at over 40 minutes in length, I feel like there are so many things I have not even mentioned or glanced over. Characters like Nov, Morel, Knuckle, Netero or the Royal Guards, how they grow and develop during this arc, I would love to discuss them in the future depending on how well this video is received. My four focus was to explain how the Chimera Ant arc is the best shonen story ever told. Throughout the arc there is no shortage of subversions, how Gon gives in to his intense desire for revenge and eventually exchanges everything to become a monster, or how Meruem learns to acknowledge humans through his love for a girl who taught him how to feel emotions. This arc features parallels to our reality as it comments on humanity and the frightening discussion of how similar we are to the monsters we are fearful of. It is a compelling commentary on humanity's contradictions, especially referencing the lengths that they will go to so that they can ensure their own survival. For example, we can draw parallels to a poor man's rose and the atomic bomb, which both are products of humanity's desire to survive and prove their dominance by devastating perceived enemies or threats. Just as the themes which are featured within this arc are given the respect that they deserve, their relationships between characters are also advanced into new levels of growth. Gon and Killua's bond is literally put to the ultimate test, as Killua is made to confront the weakness of their bond, how he has become reliant on Gon's light, and feels responsible for keeping it alight. Their relationship is pushed to its ultimate climax as Killua is unable to protect Gon from losing his light, thus leading directly to the characters naturally parting ways, progressing to their next stage of growth, to grow as individuals who no longer rely upon each other. In my first Chimera Antark video, I analysed and discussed Gon and Merim's character extensively. In this video, I'll be discussing some of the other characters which feature within this arc, as well as analysing and breaking down aspects of the story which I didn't mention in the first video. Even after going through the entirety of the Hunter x Hunter story, I still believe the Chimera Antark to be my favourite story arc of the series, and it continues to add further details to concepts that have been introduced in the series like Nen. In addition to this, the Chimera Antark is very unpredictable. Some of the events that occur totally catch me off guard. This arc has several different phases, beginning with the Queen Chimera Ant building her army by devouring humans, and then after Kite's death, Gon and Killua returning to train again with Bisky, and ultimately prove themselves to knuckle and shoot before they are allowed to join the Chimera Ant extermination team, and lastly wrapping up with the palace invasion, which ultimately leads to the defeat of Merim and the Chimera Ants. So let's now break down and analyse these various different portions of this arc, while also paying particular attention to any characters that I didn't discuss or talk about in my first Chimera Antark video. The Chimera Antark is the longest story arc to feature within Hunter x Hunter. It spans a total of 132 chapters. The way that it was serialised is probably the reason why the 1999 anime did not adapt this arc. This is because the first chapter of the Chimera Antark, chapter 186, was published in June 2003, and the final chapter of this arc, chapter 318, was published in October 2011. The reason why this arc took 8 long years to complete was because of Togashi's hiatuses, which are credited to his failing health. In the first video of the Chimera Antark, I discussed the duality between Meruem and Gon, describing how Meruem had slowly been able to gain his humanity, while at the same time Gon loses his humanity. I didn't speak much about the chairman of the Hunter Association, Isaac Netero, and how he was put in a very difficult position and had to improvise while having no support from the Hunter Association or the V5. This further adds to the discussions of humanity, through how uncooperative the Hunter Association and the V5 were towards the threat of the 
the Chimera Ants, which ultimately places Netero in a very difficult situation, which not only involves the political sphere of the Hunter Hunter world, but also puts at risk the existence of the Hunter Association through his position as its chairman. Under normal circumstances, a character who saves humanity would be celebrated, but the way that Tagashi unfolds the circumstances and the variables which are associated with it result in Netero being in a dilemma where he could be discredited for saving humanity. And this is even assuming if Netero will even survive his encounter with the Chimera Ants and their king. Very simplistic and surface level assessments of Netero's actions during the Chimera Ant arc associate him to some kind of a monster, even going as far as to describe Netero's actions as cruel. The fact of the matter is Netero wasn't a hero, nor did he ever try to be, but he did sacrifice his own life in order to kill Meruim and the rest of the Chimera Ants. If you have read and paid attention to the subtle nuances of this arc, then you will know that Netero did not go through all of this effort just so that he could fight a incredibly strong opponent. He had no desire to fight Meruem, or even the royal guards for that matter. When he first sees Pito, Morel even says to him whether if they should fight Pito, but he refuses to. Instead, he focuses their efforts on destroying the different squadrons and their groups, slowly whittling down the Chimera Ants via a well thought out tactical approach, which allows Netero to practice his abilities against the Chimera Ants that are being teleported to him, as well as giving him ample time in order to meditate and to become stronger. When the threat of the Chimera Ants is made known to the main leaders of the world who are represented by the V5 organization, they hire Netero to eradicate the threat of the ants by any means necessary. Knowing that the palace would have tens of thousands of civilians, as well as being aware that the other hunters would also be present to launch their counterattack against the Chimera ants, the V5 had no issue with throwing the Hunter Association under the bus by suggesting that even a genocide is appropriate as long as the threat of the Chimera ants is eradicated. We learn about this in chapter 288 when Netero has a flashback to when he was assigned the mission by the V5. Instead of preparing their militaries, they hire a lone hunter to deal with the issue. Knowing that there have been hundreds or if not thousands of casualties at the hands of the ants, they burden the task of killing the ants with Netero and order that he kills them as quickly as possible. He is granted permission to complete this task by any means necessary. In hindsight, knowing that Netero activated the poor man's rose, it is jaw-dropping to see the leaders of the world give complete permission to launch a nuclear attack upon thousands of innocent people. And this is where you call into question the humanity of the people who are leading the world. If it wasn't for Netero taking the initiative to hire Zeno, and through using his ability, Dragon's Head taking himself and Merim to a faraway location where military equipment is tested, then the poor man's rose would have detonated within the palace, killing thousands of individuals. And thus, through Netero's actions, the reputation of the Hunter Association is called into question, as well as the murder of countless innocent people, all to get rid of a threat that most of the world doesn't even know about. Only the select few individuals who are leading the world know about this threat. So imagine when the rest of the world finds out that the chairman of the Hunter Association launched a nuke which ended up killing so many people, but it was for the sake of killing man-eating ants. But the funny thing is there is no evidence of these man-eating ants even existing because they were all blown to smithereens. Nobody will believe this story which would result in Netro not being celebrated but vilified. Just remember, before he even went to the battlefield, the man placed a bomb within himself. He was ready and willing to give his own life. This wasn't a quest to fight a strong opponent and to test the results of his training. This was a do or die mission. When he was first assigned the task to kill the ants, he didn't know that they could use Nen. Meruim wasn't born, nor were any of the three royal guards. So the measures that he initially takes to defeat the Chimera ants isn't as excessive as his later measures. His first real description of someone who has actually faced off against a Chimera ant is from Killua. He reveals to Nov, Morel, and Netero that one of the Chimera ants could use Nen. He describes Pito's Nen as being malicious and far more sinister than anyone else that he has ever met. The maliciousness of Pito's aura exceeded Illumi's and even Hisoka's. Kidawa, who knows Nen himself and can assess the strength of other Nen users, states that despite Nov, Morel, and Netero being strong, they are nowhere near strong enough to face off against Pito. But Nov and Morel take no heed of Kidawa's warning. They simply assume that Kidawa must be overestimating his opponent. In response to this, Netero behaves more maturely, as he states that the threat of the Chimera Ants puts the survival of humanity at risk. At all costs, he says that he must do what he can in order to stop this crisis from worsening. If they do not tackle the Chimera Ants with all of the strength that they have, then they will risk being assimilated with them. Netero here states that if they do not defeat the Chimera Ants, then they will be eaten by them, and thus risk handing over all of the information that is stored within their brains of their experiences of learning about Nen to make the Ants evolve and become stronger. So it is for this reason that only small groups are going into the NGL to investigate the Chimera Ants. And you could even say this is why Netero doesn't want to hire 
hire so many different hunters to go and assist him. Because if even one hunter who knows how to use Nen is captured by them, then they can learn everything that they need to know about Nen through this individual. So it is for tactical reasons that they are keeping their number small for now. But they are unaware that the hunter that we had seen earlier in the hunter exam arc Pokal has already been captured by the Chimera Ants, and he has divulged all the information that he knows about Nen to them. Netro states that only a select few will be able to face off against the Chimera Ants, and Gon and Killua do not meet this requirement, and it is for this reason that he had arranged for two assassins in the nearest city as opponents for them to overcome. He hands Killua two tokens for him to present to the hunters, and orders both him and Killua to take out these two assassins. If they cannot do this, then they are not worthy enough or strong enough to help Netro and the others. The fact that Netro was carrying these two tokens and arranged for the two assassins to be in the nearest city means that he knew that Killua and Gon would fail, but at the same same time he wants to give them a chance, and through this very brief moment we learn why Netro didn't enlist the help of other hunters aside from Nov and Morel. The three of them were strong enough to assess the threat of the Chimera Ants, at least to the extent of knowledge that he had about them at the time which was prior to the birth of the royal guards and even the king. As we learn later, his plan to eradicate the Chimera Ants completely changes once he is able to feel Pito's sinister aura for himself. In chapter 234, we learn about some plot points which set up the next arc of the series, as well as revealing to us the relationship that Netero has with the Hunter Association despite being its chairman. We learn that the Hunter Association made it difficult for him to even hire Nov and Morel to assist him in this mission, and any additional hunters that they requested for were not provided instead weaker temporary hunters were given. You can assume that the Hunter Association and the people who are on its board wanted Netero to fail, and this presumably stems from the individual who wants to become the next chair of the Hunter Association. I'm of course talking about Pariston Hill. Nov speculates that the Vice Chairman Pariston has been bribing the board of the Hunter Association, which is resulting in them giving jobs to hunters who have pledged to vote for Pariston in the next Vice Chairman election. The evidence to support this is through the squadron leaders that they have tracked down, and have requested requested the Hunter Association to assign hunters to capture them have all been getting away, and this is because the hunters who have been assigned the jobs are supporters of Pariston, who desire for Netero to fail in his mission. If Netero fails this mission then he will be held responsible for all of the victims that the Chimera Ants are killing. If he doesn't defeat the threat then he won't be deemed as being suitable for the role of the chairman. What confidence would this instill into other hunters if Netero, their chairman, fails this mission? Just like a real world politician, Pariston is behaving unethically. He is inadvertently allowing the squadron leaders to escape and thus kill more innocent people. And all the while, Netero has been placed into a situation where, even if he manages to kill Meruem, then it will be considered a failure because of all of the casualties which will result in the fallout after the defeat of the Chimera Ants. Nova Morel had known this, and so did Netero. He risked his reputation and put everything on the line to come up with this plan to defeat Meruem. They estimate that the unavoidable casualties in order to defeat the King and the Chimera Ants is at least 5 million people, and this is the moral dilemma of Netero's situation, whether if it is justified to kill thousands of people in order to save millions of them. The Chimera Untalk excels in discussing the nature of humanity, and it does so by introducing a new species, the Chimera Ants, to the individuality of humans. Like I mentioned in my first video, the second generation of Chimera Ants were born with human traits, and thus developed individuality and egotism. The Chimera Ants end up becoming a reflection of mankind, as we see deplorable actions committed by the Chimera Ants, but then are faced with our own tragedies and wrongdoings that humanity has inflicted upon itself. It leads us to conclude that in the end, the Chimera Ants and the humans are not so different after all. As a species, humans have always undergone growth and evolution. This can only occur after we let go of who we once were. Learning from our mistakes is an essential part of evolving and growing, and thus every stage of development that has occurred has been as a result of our flaws and our mistakes that we have made. This isn't always the case, but because we make mistakes and we are imperfect, it results in us being able to empathise with others and to grow as a species. Looking back at the many atrocities that mankind is inflicted on its own, you empathise with the victims of humanity's selfishness. Why is it that we live in a world where people have an abundant supply of money, while others don't even have a roof over their head and are starving through poverty and malnutrition? It is because of our flaws that we can reflect upon our actions, and we can see the consequences of our imperfections on the lives of others, and this leads us to being generous and empathetic. But at the same time, it is our very flaws and imperfections which lead us to committing these atrocities in the first place, out of egotism and selfishness, which are the very 
three personality traits that the Chimera Unts have learned through assimilating with humans. But at the same time, good did occur through assimilation with humans, as Meruem was able to develop humanity, and at the end of the arc, he had spent his dying moments with the one person that he had fallen in love with. But on the other hand, Gon had given in to his emotions, to the degree of sabotaging himself. He ultimately regresses as a character, all for the sole purpose of revenge. Through the protagonist and the antagonist of this arc, we can see the mirrored dichotomy of humanity. In chapter 215, Netro learns about the birth of the King Meruem, and he asks Kot to compare his strength to the King's strength, considering he has been in the presence of the King. Despite displaying an immense amount of aura, Kot states that he would not even be able to touch the King, because at his current state of power, he will be killed by one of the royal gods. Netro smiles at the prospect of a challenge that he may not be able to overcome. At this point, you can assume that Netro has decided that he is not strong enough to defeat Meruem, and his decision to place the poor man's rose into himself has been solidified as he states that he is going to see a old friend. In order to prevent mass casualties occurring at the palace, he enlists the help of the Zordix, in particular Killua's grandfather Zeno. Netro had planned for the palace invasion to occur so that the hunters that he has enlisted to help him can split up all of the royal guards so that he can be left to battle the king on his own. Considering Netro isn't even strong enough to defeat a royal guard, and you compare the strengths of the other people who had accompanied him to the palace invasion, you can assume that all of these hunters, including Gon and Killua, had invaded the palace knowing that they may never return from this encounter, considering the overwhelming threat that was presented to them. The ultimate goal of the palace invasion for Netro is to kill Meruem. Netro exudes an aura of confidence during his encounter with Meruem because he knows now that he has separated the king from the royal guards, and is fighting at an appropriate distance away from the millions of people who may have been a casualty to the poor man's rose. Even if the explosion from the detonation doesn't kill Meruem, then the poison emitted from the poor man's rose will surely kill him. He also knows that if anything were to happen to the king, then this would summon the presence of the other royal guards, who would be exposed to the poison which is still emitting from the corpse of Meruem. Netro's plan is successful, as Puff and Yupi were exposed to the poison through Meruem's body, and as a result, they ended up dying along with Meruem. The only unfortunate casualty to Netro's poor man's rose is Komugi, who ends up dying out of her own choice, in order to spend her dying moments with Meruem. 5 million people would have died if Netro didn't make the necessary preparations to take out Meruem. This also would have been the case if Netro and the other hunters would have failed in their task to defeat the Chimera Ants, as on selection day, 99% of the citizens would have died, after forcibly initiating their Nen. In chapter 251, we learn about how the Chimera Ants are sorting through 500,000 people per day with a 1% survival rate. They have currently sorted 5,000 people, who have successfully initiated their Nen. They are being stored in human cocoons, waiting to be hatched into Nen weapons. Meruem will use these against mankind as his pawns, and most likely they will be controlled by Pito's Nen. If Netro and the other hunters' plans had failed, then Meruem and his army of controlled Nen users would have invaded the rest of the world. I've mentioned all of this to disprove the notion that Netro was wrong in his encounter against Meruem. It is easy to state that Netro was cruel or even selfish with desiring to fight Meruem, especially when Meruem just wanted to sit and exchange words. But after all of this, you understand that a lot was on the line for Netro. Meruem as a character was seeking identity and to learn more about himself. He was struggling between his human side and his Chimera Ant side. After learning and gaining some humanity through his interactions with Komugi and Netero, Meruem decides that he isn't going to kill all of humanity like he had planned, but instead he is going to rule over them as a fair and just king, and he will only kill a select few who he deems unworthy of living. Meruem has become more humane, but it isn't a complete 180 change. It's because his actions when he first appeared were so polarizing and so far from humanity that when he shows even a a glimpse of humanity, it feels like a total change in his character. He is still far from being a good person, and this is why Netro must defeat him. It is not for the sake of Netro wanting to fight a strong opponent, but it is rather for the survival of humanity. He only behaves the way that he does after the poor man's rose is detonated because he knows that he is dying, so he sees no point in continuing on with his ambitions, so instead he decides to spend his final moments with the one person that he loves. Even if Netro were to have sat down and exchanged words with Merrim, there is no way that he could have convinced him not to enslave the human race. This is ultimately a struggle for power. When the world leaders were threatened by the existence of the Chimera Ants, they hired Netro as a glorified exterminator to get rid of the pests. The battle between Netro and Meruem begins in chapter
chapter 287 and concludes in chapter 298. It begins with Meruem telling Netero that he doesn't stand a chance, and there is really no need for him to hurry towards his death. He says this not because he is underestimating him like Netero assumes, but rather because he knows that Netero is aware of this fact. Meruem even tells him that it is counterintuitive for him to fight for the sake of humanity. The world is being run by selfish individuals who have partitioned it into several different borders. He describes that on the border to the right hand side, children are starving to their death, while on the borders to the left hand side, idle leaders are feasting with excess. Merrim describes this as madness, and I totally agree with him, but it is the way that he wants to enact change onto the world that I disagree with. He states that he will destroy all of the borders and create an equal world, a world where nobody is living to excess. Merrim describes his plans to Netero. He has incredible power and he has learnt what this power should be used for. He decides that it is there to protect the weak who deserve to live, and it doesn't exist to oppress others, like how the leaders of the world have been oppressing other nations through the threat of nuclear war, by strong arming their way into positions of power, by instilling fear into their adversaries who dare to oppose the current way of the world. But this isn't the case with Meruem. He has far more power than any of the leaders of the world, and he wants to use this power to bring about a somewhat positive change to the world. Netro even states that this is quite a situation, as he can see that Meruem is wavering between his human side and his ant side. Netro states that he has to choose between one of them. Meruem objects to fighting Netro, and he says that he will stay in this spot and sit down and debate with him. His human side is depicted through Netro seeing Meruem hold on to a injured Komugi, who is damaged by the dragon dive ability that was unleashed earlier. He is shocked to see this monster being concerned and caring for the life of a frail girl, while on the other hand, his monstrous side is depicted through when he had eaten the flesh of a child. But regardless of the side that Meruem eventually settles upon, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the task that Netro has come here to do. He has been ordered to exterminate and destroy the ants. So before his heart starts to waver due to Meruem actually speaking sense, he decides to begin their battle. While he is set down, Netro attacks him with his 100 type Guan Yin Bodhisattva Nen ability. He strikes him with the first hand. Despite his attack being a direct hit, it only causes Meruem to spit out some blood. Meruem still wants to sit down and talk with Netero, but this time Netero strikes him with the third hand. But his attack is blocked by Meruem, and he expresses his anger through his Ren. Through this display of Ren, he demonstrates a small portion of his aura, but it is enough for Netero to double the distance that he usually retreats. Netero's persistence and his determination to battle Meruem was brushed aside so easily as if he was ironically an ant. Meruem still wants to exchange words, but Netero is frustrated because the king is in no position to negotiate with him. But that's when Netero realizes that he can persuade Meruem to fight through words by stating that he knows the king's name. He states that if the king can make Netero admit defeat, then he will tell him his name. Finally, in chapter 290, Meruem agrees to fight, but only enough to satisfy him. He will not go all out in order to kill Netero. It may appear that Meruem is underestimating Netero as he says that it's not going to take him too long, but this really isn't the case. Meruem is so incredibly powerful. It's like Togashi inverted the relationship between actual size ants and humans in this character called Meruem. The best way to describe it is placing Netero in the position of the small ant and with Meruem being in the position of the human who is about to crush the ant with his oversized foot. Because of Netero's incredible strength, he had usually waited for the opponent to make the first move, but for the first time in a long while, he charges towards Meruem after gaining his approval to fight. Netro immediately unleashes the 99th hand, an ability which reminds me of Jotaro's stand ability from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. During this battle, Netro actually realizes that it became routine procedure for him to shake the hand of the loser and to accept their gratitude for teaching them a lesson. But this is not the outcome of a battle that he had wanted after hours upon hours of training. He realizes that he instead had dreamed to actually give his heart and soul to a battle against an unstoppable adversary. You can say that Netro's pursuit of growth and evolution was stunted because he couldn't find someone worthy enough to fight against. He didn't go into this battle having realized this, he realized this during his battle with Meruem. He initially fought against Meruem because he was a threat to the survival of humanity, and primarily because Netero was ordered by the world leaders to kill Meruem. But indirectly through this battle, Netero has finally found what he was looking for. Eventually, the two of them fall beneath the ground into an underground structure, which Netero describes as Meruem's grave. At the end of chapter 291, Netero expresses his gratitude, as he states that he is lucky and thankful for everything that has led him to this point. All of the events that have occurred that have ultimately led him to this fight 
fight against Meruem. The two of them begin to exchange back and forth attacks, with the Netero successfully maintaining the distance between himself and the king whenever the king would try to get close enough to him. Meruem could barely follow the after images that Netero was producing. It had left Meruem feeling admiration for his enemy. Despite all of the attacks that Netero had unleashed upon Meruem, they had no effect on him. Meruem tells Netero that he is a rare example of a human who has transcended beyond his limits, and he has done so through effort alone. He commends Netero, but Netero responds with anger. You could say that Netero's pride is angered here, and his feelings of superiority have been crushed by Meruem. He even angrily states to himself that Meruem thinks that he is so far above the rest of humanity, but instead he is just a smug little insect. Netero continues to attack Meruem, while Meruem continues to close the distance between the two of them, as he wants to engage in close combat. But every time he manages to close the distance, he is smacked away by Netero's ability. Netero's 100 type Bodhisattva is the only ability that he has that can surpass Meruem's speed. But the king isn't concerned by this, because the ability actually does little to no damage to him. Meruem begins to enjoy his battle against the chairman, as he starts to treat it like one of his board games, trying to tactically come up with a strategy to defeat his opponent. It appears that not only is Meruem enjoying the battle, so is Netero. The battle between the two of them, as Netero describes, is a battle of endurance and concentration. Any lapse of judgement from either of them will result in their bodies being torn limb from limb. This results in Netero feeling a constant pressure to perform at his best. He will try to prolong the fight as long as he can until he has exhausted all of his options, and then at that point Netero states that Meruem will meet his end. Netero sadistically smiles as he is taunting the king to try and checkmate him, but in retaliation he has yet to show him his ability called the Zero Hand. After exchanging thousands of attacks with each other, Meruem started to feel a dull internal ache. That is, until Netero's right leg has been completely severed. Meruem was able to sneak past the arms of Netero's Nen ability. He believes that he has done enough to satisfy Netero's urge to battle. He tells him to stop the bleeding through his leg and to tell him his name. It appears that this is the end of the battle as he says that he has done well for a human. Merrim says that it was inevitable that Netero would have been striked by one of his attacks, because his attacks are flawless, but Netero's defences are not perfect. He credits his foresight to his games that he has played with Komugi. Merrim states that next he will target Netero's left arm, and at this point Netero realises that this is probably the last moments of his life. The exchange of blows that occurs next is so incredibly fast that it occurs in less than a minute. The blows that they exchange within this short period of time had exceeded over a thousand. This continues until Meruem is able to deduce the flaws in Netero's moves. He finds a slight bias in the way that Netero is exhibiting his offensive style. He attributes this way of attacking to habitual behaviour. It is through this habitual behaviour and this bias which exists within Netero's abilities that he is able to find a weak spot. He capitalises upon this and is able to once again slip through the Nen Aura arms that Netero has constructed, and this time he fulfils his promise of severing Netero's left arm. It is at this point where when Netro unleashes his final ability, Zero Hand. In this one final attack, Netro focuses every last ounce of his aura. It is described as a merciless raw emitting from a merciful goddess. Predictably, it is evident that not even this ability is able to injure Meruem. This attack drains Netro of all of the energy that he has, and he appears to be incredibly frail. Meruem describes the stature between the two of them. He states that he is the future of his species, and on top of this, he is their king, while Netro is one of many. There was no chance for him to win. He states that the entire existence of the Chimera ant species was focused on its end point of evolution, which was the birth of Meruem, whereas humanity as a species focuses on diversity. Evolution is not focused upon a singular being, but rather on individuals themselves, and it is for this reason that no single individual could have faced off against the peak of evolution, and had expected to win. Meruem even realises that through assimilating humans it disrupts the ant's command structure, as the Chimera ants that are birthed from humans are far more individualistic, and do not work for the betterment of the colony. It appears that Meruem is continuing to underestimate the persistence for survival that humans have. Despite using up all of his aura, it appears that Netero still has one last thing left to do. But before this, he reveals to the king that his name in fact is Meruem. Netero, even in his final moments, refuses to succumb to the fear and absolute power of Meruem. He remains defiant, and this shocks Meruem. Netero tells him that he has no idea. Meruem knows nothing of the bottomless malice which exists within the human 
own heart. Even a being as incredibly powerful as Merrim is able to feel the fear behind these words. Merrim, who is at the peak of his existence and his youth, is made to feel fear by an old man who is frail and has nothing left to live for. And in his final moments, Netro's facial expressions exhibit this bottomless malice which Netro had just described. Netro pierces his own heart, stopping it from beating. It is revealed that when his heart stops beating, the poor man's rose, the bomb within his body, will detonate. The poor man's rose is described as a chemical explosive weapon of mass destruction, and it is one of the most dangerous and powerful weapons to exist within the world. The bomb is small, cheap, but lethal. Once it was developed, it was mass produced across the world, and ironically, after the bomb is detonated, the mushroom cloud forms into the shape of a rose, which strangely symbolizes beauty after destruction. Togashi explains in chapter 298 that the poor man's rose had been detonated over 10 times, and it has taken the lives of over 5 million people. This is approximately the same number of lives that the Chimera ants were willing to kill during their selection. Eventually, an international treaty was established to ban the production of the poor man's rose, but 80% of the countries had refused to get rid of their bombs, or to ban the use of detonating existing roses. Years later, there still remain hundreds of thousands of poor man's roses waiting to be detonated. And it is here where Togashi draws a parallel between the ants and the humans, stating, were we so different after all? How was it that Netero was not able to consider this question before he detonated the poor man's rose? In the end, humanity exhibits the same level of malice, if not more, than the Chimera ants, especially when it comes to their tendency to hurt other species or even their own kind, all for the sake of survival. I do understand and appreciate that this arc is very divisive amongst fans of the series, as some believe the beginning portions to be really dragged out and slow, as well as being uninteresting, but I personally cannot agree with this. I don't see how the premise of giant man-eating ants being uninteresting. From the very beginning of this arc, I was looking forward to the birth of the king. I was eagerly anticipating the arrival of Meruem, having no idea what he would look like. We were just promised that he would be the peak of the evolutionary chain of the Chimera ants, and this was enough to keep me captivated for the story. As well as this, I was clinging on to some hope that Kite could be revived. That is until I had seen Kite's head on Nefropito's lap. And from this moment onward, I was interested to see how Gon would react after finding out that Kite has indeed died. And this is just a very small example of some of the plot points which kept me invested into the story of this arc. And as you know, the highlights of this arc for me were Gon's confrontation with Nefropito, how Meruem had developed humanity through his relationship with Komugi, how we see the character development of the royal gods, and how each of them reacted differently to Meruem coming to learn more about the world and humans. But ultimately, all three of them had wanted the best for Meruem. But the difference is, each of them have a very different and unique way of serving the king, which is unique to their own mindset. And of course, the battle between Meruem versus Netro, which is easily one of the best anime fights ever. And on top of this, one of the most impactful transformations ever occurs within this arc, seeing Gon transform into his adult form. And through all of these great and epic moments, we get questions of morality, and comparisons of how humans are no different to the monsters that they are afraid of, as well as discussions of the lengths that a species will go to in order to survive. One thing that became very very evident from my first Hunter Hunter video was that a lot of people didn't like the presence of the narrator during this arc. I didn't feel like the narrator was interrupting the flow of the story. Some of these events in this arc occur in such a short amount of time that the narrator breaking down and explaining the events that have occurred is better than having no explanation at all. In the end, I feel like the narrator's presence was more impactful to the events that were occurring. I love the moments when the narrator was present, especially during those moments where time had slowed down. It helped to build anticipation and even tension for events that were about to unfold. I am aware that a lot of people didn't like the narrator constantly being there, but I personally enjoyed it a lot. As this arc was unfolding, I had began to really like Merrim as a character. As well as this, Netro had become one of my favourite characters in the series after learning more about him from the Chimera Antarc. In addition to this, it was devastating to see the bond between Gon and Killua reach its final endpoint during this arc. We have followed these two characters from the very beginning of the series, and here we are forced to see them come to terms with the fact that they are not always going to be there for each other, and for them to now grow as individuals, they need to do that separately. They can no longer rely upon each other. And I feel like this is why Jin didn't want to meet Gon at the end of the Greed Island arc, because Gon was too reliant upon Killua being beside him. But neither of them were aware of this fact. But I feel like the Chimera Antarc does well to teach both Gon and Killua that they can grow independently of each other. And this is a risk that most authors aren't willing to take. Togashi stays away from established formulas in order to experiment with his story and to try something different. We see the two of them part their separate ways in the next arc of the story after Gon recovers and I will talk more about this in my next video which will cover the 13th Hunter Chairman election arc.
In this arc, we are introduced to several new characters, as well as seeing familiar faces from the prior arcs of the series. In addition to this, this is the first story arc where Gon is pretty much non-existent. He appears later on in the arc, but his reappearance serves to wrap up his story arc. As the title of the arc suggests, this arc is about the election of the new Hunter Chairman. After the prior chairman, Isaac Netro, had passed away during his battle against Merwim in the prior arc, the Chimera Antark. The task to elect a new hunter chairman involves a group called the Zodiacs. The Zodiacs comprise of 12 hunters whose skills have been recognised by the prior chairman Netero. Among their members is Gon's father, Jin. During this arc, the Zodiac members are gathered in order to run a election which will decide the new hunter chairman. While this is going on, a side story is occurring, where Killua is trying to help Gon who has been hospitalised after his battle with Pito. Gon is in critical condition, and in order to help him, Killua is enlisting the help of his brother called Aluka. Through using Aluka's dangerous but very helpful Nen ability, he aims to heal and revive Gon. But Killua's efforts to help Gon are opposed by his older brother Illumi, who has teamed up with Hisoka. Illumi doesn't want Killua to use Aluka's powers due to the threat that they pose on Killua's own life and Illumi's life. I'll talk more about Aluka's powers later on in the video. But for now, let's begin my analysis of the 13th Hunter Chairman election arc. <laughs> The 13th Hunter Chairman Election arc is the final arc that was adapted into the 2011 anime. It runs from chapters 319 to chapter 339. It spans a total of 20 chapters. This is the arc where we are finally introduced to Gon's father, as well as understanding more about the dynamics of the Hunter Association. We also appreciate a lot of the legacy that Netero has left behind. The first is through his 12 chosen Zodiac Hunters, the top 12 Hunters that have been handpicked by Netero. The 12 Zodiac members have all gathered in order to discuss the elections for the next chairman. We had briefly heard mentions about the vice chairman in the prior arc, but in this arc we are formally introduced to him and get to understand a lot about his character. Pariston Hill is in all intensive purposes the villain of this arc. He plays an excellent role, which is further emphasised through the reactions of the characters which surround him. There are a few characters in this arc who don't totally buy into Pariston's character that he's portraying. He desires to be the next chairman, but he has ulterior motives. One of the twists that we learn about Pariston and later on in the arc is that he and Gon's father Jin share in a very similar desire. They both want to follow in the footsteps of Netero and continue on with his legacy, but we learn more about this later on. Another excellent antagonist within this arc is Illumi. We see him trying to sabotage Killua's efforts to heal Gon, and he even enlists the help of Hisoka. Their pair up is a nostalgic callback to the Hunter Exam arc, where we had last seen these two characters properly interacting with each other. We learn a lot about Illumi's character and how his mindset works. In addition to this, we learn more about the Zordic family through the introduction of a new member. Aluka is a central character within this arc. His powers are pretty much the only hope that Gon has of recovering from his injuries. The severity of Gon's injuries lead a few of the hunters to believe that he may not even recover, but from the very onset of this arc, even before Aluka's involvement, Jin believes that Gon will make a recovery. When I was first experiencing this arc, I didn't expect Liorio's character to be brought back into the story so soon. But not only is he reintroduced here, but he leaves a very memorable impression not only on us the readers, but also on the other hunters within the Hunter Association. The impression that he leaves is so impactful that it results in his character becoming a likely candidate of election to become the next chairman. I say this in every arc analysis video that I have done up until this point. The story told within this arc is unlike any that we have seen up until this point. We have several events occurring at once. On one hand, we have the gathering of the strongest hunters in the world, who are deciding upon the next chairman of the Hunter Association, while on the other hand, Kilwa is trying to protect his brother while racing to the hospital in order to heal Gon. He is being chased by not only his older brother, but by Hisoka also. After these events wrap up, we get a touching moment where Gon finally gets to meet his father. This then eventually leads up to the wrapping up of Gon's character arc, as he even parts ways with Killua. One of the things that I really enjoyed about this arc was that we saw the fallout from the Chimera Ant arc. After he recovers, we see Gon who meets a reborn Kite. The Queen Chimera Ant had given birth to this reincarnation of Kite, at the same time as giving birth to the King. Kite is reborn as a red head girl, who just so happens to be the twin sister of Meruem. 
Gon's interactions with her helped to give him some very necessary closure, especially after the events that occurred during the Chimera Antarc. He was not only made to feel emotional distress, but a great deal of physical injury which would have led to his death if Alucard didn't intervene and heal him. So at the start of the arc, when the Zodiac members all gather to discuss the elections, Pariston takes charge by volunteering to moderate their discussion. It begins by him volunteering himself to be the next chairman, saying that they can skip the elections. All of the Zodiac members, aside from Jin, who is pretty carefree anyway, appear to be angered by this suggestion. The Zodiac members make it clear that they would not vote for Pariston, so he cannot assume the outcome of the election, which he states would be heavily favoured towards him. They don't trust Pariston because in the three years that he has been the vice chairman, there have been 18 hunters that have gone missing. The average before Pariston had taken office was about 0.6 hunters per year. Ever since he became vice chairman, these numbers have increased by up to tenfold. While they are bickering, Jin out of nowhere nominates himself to be the next chairman, but the Zodiac members make it clear that they would not want to vote for him either, since he has a tendency of going missing for months to years on end. Pariston tells Jin that Gon might die, but Jin is pretty confident in his son and says that he isn't going to. Their meeting continues as they deliberate upon the best voting method for the election, which would be in line with the necessary requirements required for the position of the chairman, which requires 95% of all hunters to be voting. So the rules of the elections begin to be confirmed one by one, as the first rule states that all hunters have been nominated to become the next chairman, and every hunter is eligible to vote. The second rule is that if the winner of the first vote doesn't get a majority vote, then there will be a revote with the top 16 nominees, and every time there is a revote, the nominees will be reduced by half. Also, a particular vote will be redone if the participation rate is less than 95%. And lastly, it is mandatory that all hunters state their name. Nobody can anonymously vote, as those anonymous votes will be invalidated. These rules have been written by Jin, as he states that his decision to remove anonymity to the voting is because it would be more interesting to see who voted for who. The other Zodiac members are obviously angered by this rule, and they state that Jin only ever thinks about himself and how much fun he would have in a particular situation. With the four rules decided, the Zodiac members now have to decide upon the chairman of the election committee. In a flashback, we learn that Jin has no intentions of being the next chairman. He only wishes to follow on with Netero's legacy. He has no desire to actually become the chairman because it involves a lot of tiresome work. 661 hunters have been given a ballot paper. They are all tasked with returning the ballot paper to the Hunter Association headquarters. The deadline for voting is the 8th of August. In chapter 320, we see Hisoka has arrived to vote. He places his vote, but he states that he isn't really that interested in the outcome or even in voting in itself. He is only here because he wants to talk to Gon's father, Jin. While he is here, he is giving numerical values to the different Zodiac members that he is speaking to. He gives a 8.5, a 9.0, and a 7.7. .7. Not only this, he starts to give numerical values to the other hunters around him, who appear to have abysmally low scores. But just as he is about to leave, he sees a 9.5, and it just so happens to be Illumi. The two characters become reacquainted, as Illumi fills Hisoka in on all of the events that occurred during the Chimera Antarc. It appears that Hisoka has paid no attention to the world events because he has been so fixated upon exercising the Nen from Krollo's heart. Illumi even teases us by saying that if he wasn't running after Krollo, then he may have even had a chance to fight against the Chimera Ants. Illumi informs Hisoka that Gon and Killua were also partaking in the battle against the Ants, and as a result, Gon is in a near-death state. Illumi also tells him about the whereabouts of Killua, as we learn that he has gone to speak to his father, Silver Zoldic. What Killua is planning to do will lead not only to his death, but Gon's death also. We learn from Illumi that in the Zoldic family, there is a brother that we have yet to see, and Illumi wants to get rid of him. The election results for the first vote have come in, and it appears that the voter turnout was 87.7%. There have been 48 invalid votes, so a revote is necessary in order to satisfy the requirements for the 13th chairman election. There were 33 absentees who didn't vote, of which are obviously Gon, Kidawa who has gone to see his father, and surprisingly, Kurapika is among the absentees also. In chapter 321, Kidawa arrives at Kukuru Mountain. He enters through the testing gate of the Zordic residence, and this time he opens up to the fifth door. Previously, he had opened up the third door, highlighting the vast difference in his power from the beginning of the series to this point. It appears that he has returned to his family home in order to help Gon. He he requests his father to allow him to see Aluka as he needs his help. 
but his father refuses his request because it appears that nobody can control Aluka. But Killua disagrees and states that Aluka is family and not a tool to be used. Silver says that Aluka is not a human and he shouldn't think of him as family. Aluka is described as an entity that has come from another place. He is something that has come from darkness. Killua explains how Gon had made a contract with his Nen. It was so terrible that no mere exorcist can help him. The only way Gon can be helped is if Aluka can grant a wish for him. Killua uses his father's words against him as he states that he cannot abandon Gon. The only way that he can save Gon is through Aluka. If he was to leave Gon to die, then isn't that the same as betraying him? If you remember in the Zordic family arc, Silver had made Killua promise to him that he would not betray his friends. And this is what ultimately leads to him wavering and allowing Killua to meet Aluka. In chapter 322, we get to understand how Aluka's wishes work. Killua and Aluka had spent a lot of time together when they were kids. This is until a butler reports to their mother that Aluka's face changes after you listen to three of her requests. Killua is forced to explain to his parents that if you do what Aluka says three times, then her eyes will turn black, and they only go back to normal after she grants you one wish. Aluka had told Killua that if she grants you one wish, her eyes turn back to normal, and if you fulfill three of her demands, then her eyes turn black. Killua and Aluka's mother demands that the butlers refuse all of her demands, no matter how small. The butlers agree to this. After one of the butlers, Mitsuba, refuses three of her demands, her body is entirely crushed. This is the consequence of declining Aluka's requests. When Aluka Aluka is with non-family members, he constantly pesters them for requests. If they decline four of these requests, then that individual is crushed and so is their loved one. It appears that Aluka doesn't ask for any demands from any of the Zordic family members. The Zordics use the butlers as experimental tools to test out Aluka's powers. After one of the butlers called Yasuha listens to Aluka's three requests, this butler asks Aluka to make her a millionaire. This results in a plane which is transporting money disappearing from its route, and it appears on top of the butler and Aluka. The money then falls from the plane, appearing to have fulfilled the wish. After this wish was granted, another butler was assigned to listen to all of Aluka's requests, no matter how great or small. It appears that after Aluka had fulfilled the wish of becoming a millionaire to this butler, her requests have become far more difficult to fulfill. And remember, if you refuse her requests four times, then you are killed. The first of Aluka's demands is for the butler's liver. Of course, the butler refuses. And then Aluka asks for the butler's intestines. Of course, this is also refused. Then Aluka asks for the butler's spine. And lastly, Aluka asks for the butler's brain. All four of these requests have been declined. So it appears that if you fulfill three of Aluka's demands, then you have one wish that can be granted to you. And it appears that there is no limit to these wishes. But if somebody asks a proportionally large wish, then the demands will be equally as large for the next individual that Aluka asks. Fans of Fullmetal Alchemist will relate to this concept of equivalent exchange. And this is exactly what is going on here. The consequence of the prior wish has to be fulfilled by the the next individual who has demands asked of them. If you refuse her requests four times, then at least you and another individual that you love the most will die simultaneously. And if the prior wish had been a large wish, then there will be more casualties after Aluka's demands have been refused. The aftermath and the consequences of the butler's request to become a millionaire has killed 67 people so far. In chapter 323, we see Illumi explaining Aluka's powers to Hisoka. Illumi says that Kidwa is going to wish for Gon to be healed. If he makes the wish and a stranger who encounters Aluka later has to pay the price for it, then there's no issue. But Illumi assumes that Kidwa will do the reverse. He assumes this because Kidwa has a actual conscience, and he doesn't want himself or Gon to feel guilty of the consequences of this wish. Illumi states that Kidwa will make someone else request for the wish, and he will pay the price for the wish himself. He assumes that Kidwa is going to behave in this sacrificial manner. Illumi talks about the power and strength of the Chimera Ants, how they had forced Netero to use the poor man's rose, and how Gon had made a contract that is described as worse than death in order to defeat Pito. A wish that will reverse the effects of this contract will result in Aluka making almost impossible requests to be granted. Illumi rightfully assumes that Kidwa will not be able to fulfill all of Aluka's impossible demands. Even if he wanted to, these demands are going to be far more severe than giving up one's liver or one's spine. Illumi states that no matter what Kidwa does, it will result in the death of innocent people. Because when Kidwa is unable to fulfill the four requests, then it will not only result in his death, but in the death of his loved ones and the people that Kidwa has spent the most time with. 
So ultimately, even if he saves Gon through Alucard's wish, it will still lead to Gon's death because he won't be able to fulfill the demands of Alucard. But Illumi isn't concerned about this. He is more concerned about his own death and the death of the Zordic family because of the consequences of Killua's actions here. And it is for this reason that he has to stop Killua. So after Hisoka and Illumi come to an agreement to work together to stop Killua, we get the results of the third round of the election, with Pariston and Cheadle both taking the top two spots. But they note that there are even more absentees in this round of voting than in the last. It is evident that Pariston is the type of character to accept and make suggestions that will put him at a disadvantage, but it appears that he enjoys overcoming these obstacles. Cheadle says that he is a lot like the former chairman Netero in this way. In this round of voting, there have been even more absentees than before, and this is probably because of the new rules that were set in place to avoid any individuals from making invalid votes. Pariston suggests that they gather all of the hunters and all of the Zodiac members make speeches to them, relaying to them how important these elections are, especially for the Hunter Association and the future of humanity. He suggests this in order to lower the number of invalid votes, and to lower the number of absentees who haven't voted in the elections. Meanwhile, while Killua is reunited with Alucard, we learn that he knows rules about Alucard that the others don't know about. Like for instance, the real Alucard refers to Killua by his name, whereas the alternative personality which exists within him called Nanika refers to Killua as brother. Killua ends up leaving the Zordic family mansion with Alucard after he threatens to kill his mother through using Nanika's powers. Killua doesn't believe that Gon can be healed through conventional means. He calls Morel and he relays information to him that he has a way that will guarantee 100% that Gon will get better. But Killua has a problem. He doesn't know how he will get to Gon's location with himself and Alucard safely. Then conveniently, he is accompanied by Goto and Canary, the two butlers from the Zordic estate. They are also accompanied by another pair of butlers, Subon and her granddaughter Amane. They have been ordered to assist Goto and Canary by Silver. In chapter 325, they leave the Zordic estate by car. It appears that at the hospital, all of Gon's friends that he has encountered during his journey have come to see him. This of course is including Leorio. It appears that Goto has some conditions that must be fulfilled before Gon can be healed. This condition is that Gon needs to be the only person at the hospital, so there can be no doctors or patients there. Leorio adamantly refuses to do this, but Morel instead agrees to take care of this matter. Gon and his friends enlist the help of an exorcist who arrives to see Gon's condition, but after seeing Gon, the exorcist admits defeat and says that healing Gon is beyond her ability. Morel states that this was the only known exorcist within the Hunter Association and she had given up, so their only hope is to rely upon Killua to help Gon. Leorio leaves the safety and well-being of Gon to Morel, who will be Killua's contact. They have to simply trust that Killua knows what he is doing, and he has a surefire way to help Gon. Knowing that Gon has been left in safe hands, Leorio states that he has a lot of things to say to several different people. One of the individuals he desires to speak to is Kuripika, but he is unable to get a hold of him. We then see him stood in front of the Hunter Association headquarters. He arrives while the Zodiac members are giving their speeches to the other hunters, relaying to them the importance of the election and why they should be voting. Leorio raises his hand in order to ask a question to one of the Zodiac members. He just so happens to direct his question towards Jin. He directly asks him why is it that Jin won't visit his son, despite knowing the critical condition that Gon is in. For me, this is a very satisfactory moment. Finally, someone pulls up Jin on his questionable parenting. Jin avoids answering Leorio's question. He compliments the quality of Gon's friends, and even responds by asking Leorio a question of himself, whether if Gon had asked for his father to come and see him. This understandably angers Leorio because Gon is in no condition to even speak. Jin sternly watches Leorio as he overreacts. Out of anger, Leorio successfully lands an uppercut on Gon's father, much to the applaud of all of the hunters around him. After this emotional display, Leorio Leorio has won the hearts of many of the hunters who are present at this gathering. As a result, he has become one of the top three candidates for the 13th chairman election. The voter turnout was 97.1%, so a successful round of voting has finally occurred, with Leorio gaining 55 points, Cheadle gaining 57 points, and Pariston leading with 258 points. With Gon still in critical condition and the whittling down process for the elections just beginning, we turn our attention over to Killua, Aluka, and the butlers, who must now avoid Illumi and Hisoka in order to arrive at the hospital safely. While traveling, Goto receives a call from Illumi. Here we get to understand more about what kind of relationship the different Zordic members have with Aluka. Silver is understandably concerned by Aluka's powers, because like I mentioned before, the way that Killua wants to use Aluka's abilities, it may result in the death of his family. Silver doesn't particularly hate Aluka, but he does desire to control him, and this is the reason why he had sent Subon and Amane to accompany Goto and Canary. They are his most trusted butlers, and he can trust them to gather more 
more information about Aluka's abilities, while on the other hand we have Illumi and his intentions. It is evident that Illumi's plans are different to his father's. It is evident that he has no intention to control Aluka's powers, but instead it is more like he wants to kill Aluka, and the third party involved within the Zordic family desires to use Aluka's powers in order to heal Gon. The different intentions and motives of the Zordic families have all interwined around this one character, and this is where we see their differing opinions of Aluka play out. Illumi challenges Killua and he fearlessly takes him up on his offer. Now that he doesn't have his needle within his head controlling him, he isn't afraid of Illumi. He knows that Illumi and the others don't think of Aluka as family, and he refers to his family members as bullies. The cat and mouse game between Killua and Illumi begins. The car that they are travelling in is crashed into by a driver that Illumi is controlling. This results in their vehicle falling off of a cliff. While this is going on, we see Illumi and Hisoka watching from afar. The butlers scramble to protect Killua and Aluka. Illumi, who is watching the aftermath of the car crash, assumes that Killua is hiding rules from him, the rules which relate to Aluka's powers. He uses this as justification to get rid of Aluka as soon as possible. Illumi orders Hisoka to get rid of the butlers, and to separate Aluka from Killua if he is able to. What Hisoka asks Illumi here is the cause for a lot of conversation between Hunter Hunter fans. Within the 2011 anime and in the Viz translated manga, Hisoka asks Illumi if he can kill Killua. A lot of fans like to speculate or assume that Hisoka's question has sexual undertones to it. I personally think that this is because of mistranslations from fans who have translated this line completely wrong. If you were to ask me, I don't think Hisoka has any sexual undertones in this moment, and you can't convince me otherwise. I think he is genuinely asking if he can kill Killua. As to the hand sign, it could mean anything. You might just be holding it in that position for whatever reason. Regardless of whatever Hisoka was referring to, the reaction of Illumi is startling. Out of protectiveness, Illumi breaks out of his composed state, and he threatens to kill Hisoka right here and right now. Illumi is very possessive over Killua, and this reaction is completely understandable. It wasn't because of Hisoka inferring something obscene, but rather because Illumi had been manipulating Killua, and he is incredibly possessive over his little brother. The Zordics want to shape and mould Killua into the future leader of the Zordic family. The controlling nature of their family is seen firsthand through how they feel about Aluka. Hisoka ends up calming down Illumi after stating that he was just joking. Illumi's reaction to Hisoka causes him to release his bloodlust. This allows Killua to pinpoint his location, which leads us to believe that Hisoka had purposefully asked him that question to rile him up in order to reveal his location to Killua. We learn that deep down Hisoka would prefer if Gon was alive, since he likes the idea of having many powerful opponents to choose from. And as we know, Gon and Killua are hyped to have incredible potential, and the prospect of fighting them at their full potential in the future is too enticing for Hisoka. So while he is helping Illumi, if possible, he would like it if Gon is healed. The butlers reaffirm to Killua that they are not his enemies. Their duties are to protect Killua, but Killua sees them as enemies since they didn't include protecting Aluka as one of their duties. And this is because Silver and Zeno, who had ordered the butlers, don't care about Aluka's well-being. Killua uses his ability Godspeed to separate himself from the butlers. Meanwhile, Hisoka has arrived to confront the butlers. Subon is left to catch up to Killua. She is impressed by Killua's speed, and notes that he will grow up to become an excellent assassin, even adding that before long Killua will even surpass Illumi. In chapter 327, Aluka asks Killua if she is a burden or a hindrance to the Zordic family. Aluka wonders if they would all get along if he wasn't around, but Killua casts aside Aluka's doubts and assures him that he is not a hindrance to the family. Killua states that he will always be there for Aluka. He advises Aluka not to worry about the opinions of their family. Meanwhile, Hisoka battles the butlers Goto, Kaneri, and Amane. He easily deals with Goto's coin toss ability thanks to his bungee gum. He ends up hurtling the coins back towards Goto. Goto blocks all of the coins, but is unaware that Hisoka is about to attack him from above. Hisoka proves to have no chill as he beheads Goto. The butlers try to catch up to Killua as he is using his lightning speed, which is making it almost impossible for them to keep up with him. Killua is headed to the nearest airport so that he can board one of the airships with Aluka. He successfully leaves with Aluka on an airship as he leaves behind not only the butlers but Illumi and Hisoka also. Illumi and Hisoka can't just go to the hospital where Gon is because all of their friends are at the hospital concerned about Gon. On the airship, Killua explains the situation to Morel and how he is planning to use Aluka's abilities to return Gon back to normal. Illumi ends up manipulating civilians through his Nen-infused needles. These individuals are called Needle People, and they have been assigned with the task to follow all of the blimps that Killua has used as diversions in order to locate Killua's whereabouts. But in response to this, Killua has asked Morel to enlist the help of hunters in order to track down the Needle People and to stop them. In Chapter 329, we get the results of the fifth round of the Chairman elections. Cheadle and Leorio have both dropped a position as the hunter Teradin has taken the second spot. Illumi eventually learns about the whereabouts of Killua and what Blimpy is on through finding a map. 
What is incredibly funny is that Hisoka is trying to help Illumi but sabotage his plans at the same time, as he had also found a map, but had planned to doctor it and send it to Illumi, before realising that Illumi had found a map himself. It is really entertaining to have Hisoka involved in this arc, and it is really enjoyable to follow his character whenever he appears on screen, as he does lighten up the mood and add a lot of comedic value, and when he is not being funny he is incredibly epic in battles. At the same time the butler Subon and Amane locate Killua's whereabouts, while Hisoka and Illumi are getting rid of the temporary temporary hunters that were sent to take them down. The sixth round of voting is occurring. The sixth round of voting ends with the top four candidates not changing in position. Killua's blimp finally lands in a forested area. A car is already there waiting to transport Killua and Aluka to the hospital, but their plans are quickly foiled as needle people surround the car and Illumi appears from the darkness of the forest. Illumi cuts to the chase and asks Killua that he is hiding something about Aluka from him. We learn that Illumi was able to track down Killua's whereabouts thanks to his brother Miluki. Killua reveals a rule about Aluka that was not known to the Zoldix. He tells Illumi that Nanika needs to touch a target in order to heal them. Every time Nanika has been asked to heal an individual, the demands that follow it are not cruel at all. And for this reason, Kilwa states that Aluka is not evil, he is kinder than anyone else. The real people who are cruel and cursed are the people who are making these selfish wishes. Kilwa further emphasises that Aluka is not a tool to be used. Illumi realises after Kilwa explains this new rule to him that maybe he is able to heal Gon without hurting the Zordic family after all. Even after learning this new rule, Illumi is persistent that there is still information that Kilwa is hoarding from him about Aluka, and for this reason he will continue to pursue Aluka. Illumi ends up leaving after losing interest while Killua thinks to himself that if he had revealed the last rule, then it would have resulted in Illumi putting a needle into his head again to manipulate him, so that he could in turn exploit this new rule and manipulate Aluka through her abilities. Meanwhile, we get the results for the seventh round of the chairman election, as the top four candidates are Pariston, Leorio, Cheadle, and Musaistum. In chapter 331, we see Jin speaking to Cheadle, as Jin reveals to her Pariston's plans to prolong the elections until the Day of Reckoning. We learn that the day that Netro had blown himself up, the Hunter Association had sent 100 blimps to the palace. Jin reveals that they recovered the 5,000 cocoons that the Chimera Ants had selected. The cocoons contain half-human beings that were created by the Chimera Ants. All 5,000 of them have Nen abilities. Jin even assumes that they have hatched by now. Jin states that Pariston is planning to use them to have some fun. He further elaborates that the Day of Reckoning that he is speaking of is the date of the next Hunter exam. He leaves this information with Cheadle, assuming that she will become the next next chairman, since Pariston isn't interested in winning, nor is he interested in losing. He is just here to have fun. As the eighth round of the chairman election continues, the remaining four candidates are participating in a Q&A session. It is also revealed that the 606 hunters that have gathered to watch the Q&A session will remain here until a chairman has been chosen. At the end of chapter 331, Killua and Aluka finally arrive at the hospital. At the hospital, friends and acquaintances that Killua and Gon have made throughout their journey are waiting anxiously. These individuals include Bisky, Palm, Knuckle, Ikalgo, Hanzo, and even Melody. We cut away back to the elections as the four remaining candidates take the stage and make their opening statements to the hunters. Mizaistum sacrifices his position in order to prevent Pariston from winning, as he tells everybody who has voted for him to vote for Cheadle, while Cheadle states that everybody should vote for Leorio in her opening statement. When Leorio takes up the podium, he questions why is he here. Leorio states that if he were to become the chairman, then he would use the resources of the Hunter Association for his own personal gain. If he were to be elected, his first order of action would be to do everything that he can in order to save Gon. Leorio feels guilty that he is even here, but even with his medical knowledge, there is nothing that he can do for Gon right now. The sad reality is that Gon is dying. Leorio feels guilty that he did not cherish Gon as a friend. He was in medical school, but he was spending his time studying, drinking, and partying with girls. Meanwhile, Gon was pushing himself to his limit, and he was fighting in order to protect and save others. Gon had been making incredible progress since he had last met Leorio, but he didn't make it this far by forsaking or stepping on anyone else. Gon is always fair and just and looks out for the well-being of the weak. Even if he knows the obstacle in front of him is far too difficult to overcome, he stubbornly persists until he finds a way to overcome the threat that is presented to him. At the end of his speech, Leorio mentions how one of his friends is even risking his life to save Gon. In chapter 332, Killua finally explains to Aluka that his friend is very sick, and he wants Aluka to make him better. In this moment, we find out about the rule that Killua was hiding from Illumi. The final rule is that the rules of Aluka do not apply to Killua. Killua ensures that this will be the final wish that he will ask, and he does so so that Nanika will never be awoken again. So finally, Nanika appears and agrees to heal Gon. This is the first time that we really get to see Gon's 
Ward's condition. He is bedbound and covered in bloodied bandages. We really get to appreciate the consequences of Gon's actions when we see him in this critical condition. On top of this, we see the impact that he has left on other characters, through how Leorio gave an emotional speech about saving Gon, and even how Killua goes through all of these lengths and risks his life and even his brother Aluka's life in order to save Gon. Not only does he have friends that really love and care for him, he also has made acquaintances that he has left an impressionable impact upon. We have characters like Knuckle, Hanzo, and even Canary in the waiting room of the hospital, praying for Gon to get better. Meanwhile, back at the elections, the four remaining candidates debate with each other. You can really tell that Takashi enjoys these internal politics, and exploring the dynamics of the election, in regards to the percentages of hunters that are voting for each individual party. I do feel like the whole election portion drags on quite a lot. I mean, even Jin is seen to be falling asleep in the crowd. I would prefer if they just got on with it and elected the chairman already. When we cut to the segments which include discussions about the elections and who's voting for who, I just want to get back to the portion of the story that is really keeping me invested in the arc, which is to see Killua using Aluka's powers to heal Gon. In chapter 333, another round of voting for the election takes place. Meanwhile, we cut back to the hospital where Nanika requests for Gon's hand, and we get to see a glimpse of just how badly injured Gon is. He is literally skin and bones. You can see his exposed nerves and his veins. Nanika holds onto his hand and heals Gon. The aura that is emitted from Nanika while Gon is being killed is so powerful that all of the hunters in close proximity notice this large spike in aura. The results for the elections come in with Leorio and Pariston taking the lead by the majority vote, which means that the final vote will be between Leorio and Pariston. The hunters at the election can even feel the aura that Nanika has emitted, in particular Pariston and Jin. While Pariston and Leorio are making their final speeches, they are interrupted by Morel, who with a tearful expression shows a thumbs up to Leorio. Gon arrives healed and fully recovered. Leorio has a huge emotional outburst as he expresses a great deal of relief, while Gon's father Jin has a more subdued expression. Pariston is also seen to be smiling since it appears that he has won the election, because the only reason that Leorio wanted to become a chairman was to heal Gon, but now that he is totally okay, he has no reason to really continue in the election. Not too long after, Gon spots his father in the crowd. Through his grumpy expression, you can see that he wasn't expecting to meet his son under these circumstances, but it is hilarious to see Jin being put in this uncomfortable situation. His dismissive attitude, and his frankly bad parenting, is criticised by the crowd, but before any of this happens, Gon apologises to his father and says that it is his fault that Kite has now turned into a girl. Gon breaks down in front of his father, which catches him off guard completely. He doesn't know how to deal with this situation and you can see him flustered and uncomfortable. And while this is going on, an entire crowd of hunters is watching the exchange occur between the two of them. Jin composes himself after Gon says that he should have been the one who should have died. He explains to Gon that Kite had asked for Gon and Killua to accompany him because he thought that it would have been an easy mission. He only asked for the two of them to escape once he had seen the circumstances had changed, and this is because he had underestimated the situation. If Kite had known an enemy like Pito would have appeared, then he would not have asked for Killua and Gon to have accompanied him. Jin tries to make Gon feel better, as he says that it wasn't his fault. It was more so because of Kite underestimating the situation, that all of the events unfolded like how they did. Jin tells him that the only thing that he should feel responsible for is the fact that he was weak, and he should correct this mistake, and never allow it to happen again. On top of this, he tells him not to apologise to him, but he should apologise to Kite. If Kite indeed has survived, then it is imperative that Gon goes to speak to him. It's strange to see Jin give some solid advice to his son, a father who was never really around, and had been ducking and diving from his son throughout the entirety of this series, and we only get brief mentions and glimpses of him. This exchange between the two of them we have been waiting for for over 300 chapters, and it feels surreal to see the two of them speak to each other. When Gon decides to leave in order to speak to Kite, he asks his father if they can continue to talk more later, but Jin turns back to being awkward and says it's kind of difficult to because he's busy, which leads to the audience of hunters who are observing this exchange erupting out of anger, and they are frankly saying what we are thinking, referring to Jin as heartless, and it is funny because someone even asks Leorio to punch Jin again. All of this criticism eventually leads to Jin agreeing to see Gon when he comes back after apologising to Kite. As for the elections, both Gon and Leorio vote for Pariston as Leorio pulls out from the elections. The final round of voting occurs with Pariston winning with 458 votes and Leorio in second place losing with 157 votes. We had known from the very beginning that
that Pariston had no intention of being the chairman. He had just wanted to prolong the procedure and to make it more tedious and difficult for the others. His first act as a chairman is to appoint Cheadle as his vice chairman, and then immediately after he states that he is going to resign, which automatically results in Cheadle becoming the next chairman by default. Nobody, including any of the Zodiac members, had expected Pariston to do this. Cheadle is understandably angry at Pariston, but he tells her that he didn't agree to become the vice chairman to Netro because he wanted to work his way up to become the next chairman. He had only accepted the position in order to toy with Chairman Netero. It was like Netero had welcomed all of Pariston's actions, and had even found some joy in overcoming some of the obstacles that he had put in place. Pariston shows some emotion here as he is upset at the death of Netero, that he wasn't able to toy around with him more. As his final request, he asks Cheadle to amend the bylaws and to amend the Hunter exam, and he promises Cheadle that if the Hunter Association becomes boring, that he will return, and he will make things really difficult for her next time round. Before Gon leaves to see Kite, Jin remembers something that he had forgotten to tell him. He reveals that he was the one who had taught Kite everything that he knows about Nen. He says that his Crazy Slot's ability has a number that only comes up when Kite really doesn't want to die. So if indeed Kite is alive, then this is probably the reason why. Jin tells Gon to not feel bad because he wasn't trying to sacrifice himself for him. Through these encouraging words, he tells Gon to apologize properly to Kite and to not worry about the thought of Kite having to sacrifice himself because this wasn't the case. Meanwhile, back at the hospital, Killua and Aluka are approached by Illumi, who is now even more fascinated with Aluka's powers after he had witnessed Aluka heal Gon. Illumi tries to convince Killua that he is the only one who can efficiently use Nanika's abilities, and if he does doesn't intervene, then Aluka will remain locked away in his room forever. He offers to manage the two of them so that they won't lose their freedoms, but Killua disagrees and says that he will be the one to protect Aluka. Killua then summons Nanika and orders him to teleport Illumi back to their home. At the end of chapter 336, Killua tells Nanika that he can't come out anymore. He does this so that Aluka can be free, but he only ends up upsetting Nanika. When Aluka wakes up, he forces Killua to apologize to Nanika. Aluka will only accept Killua's protection if he promises to protect Nanika too. He ends up apologizing and admits that he was wrong for trying to push away Nanika, and he explains the reason why he had done this. He had been afraid of Illumi for so long. He grew to hate having to listen to whatever Illumi had to say. Killua is afraid of Illumi trying to do the same to Aluka, forcing Aluka to do things against his will. Out of fear, he reacted and tried to suppress Nanika. He apologizes to Nanika and promises to protect the two of them. In return, he requests Nanika not to grant other people's wishes anymore, because from now on, Killua will be there to praise Aluka whenever he wants. Months. In chapter 337, we frankly get one of the worst drawn chapters that I've ever read of Hunter x Hunter. It is disappointing because this chapter features a very insightful speech by Koala. He discusses the meaning of life and feeling repentance for his sins, and it's fitting to have this conversation about life with Kite who has been reincarnated. At the end of Koala's speech, he tries to run away from his problems again, but Kite tells him to stay with her. In his past life, Koala was a hitman who had killed countless people, but now that he has also been reincarnated, he has a chance to right the wrongs that he has done. He can live a new life, a life that he believes to be just. Through this exchange, we see that Kite's character hasn't changed at all. It's just obviously the appearance is strikingly different. It is a very meaningful discussion that the two of them have, and it is very dialogue heavy, but it's just a shame that Togashi didn't redraw this chapter, which he usually does whenever a manga volume is going to be compiled. A meaningful discussion about life, death, and the existence of the soul occurs here. And not to mention, within this chapter, we get the reunion between Kite and Gon. Gon finally gets Kite's closure after feeling so guilty about Kite's death. He arrives to speak to Kite and apologizes immediately. The apology is for leaving Kite behind to fight Pito alone. He takes responsibility and says that he was too weak, but next time he will stand by Kite. Kite comments on the crazy feats that Gon had accomplished in order to defeat Pito. At the end of the day, Gon had defeated an enemy that was too much for Kite to handle, but Gon admits that if he hadn't had the help of Killua and the others, then he wouldn't be here to speak to Kite. He hadn't accomplished this feat alone. Both Gon and Kite agree that without the help of others, neither of them would have survived, and they are only here speaking to each other thanks to their efforts. After apologizing to Kite, she tells Gon to go back to see his father. She tells Gon that if she ever needs his help, then he will call upon him. So at the end of chapter 337, Gon returns to the Hunter Association to see that his father will be waiting for him at the top of the World Tree. And this is where the end to Gon's journey as a character begins to be solidified, as he finally gets to accomplish his goal of meeting his father and to properly speak to him. Along with Killua and Aluka, Gon arrives at the World Tree, 
tree, which is 1,784 meters tall. It is taller than any man-made structure. It is said that only 30 people a year are able to climb to the top of the tree. In chapter 338, Gon finally bids farewell to Killua as they both part their ways. Before they part ways, Killua reveals Nanika to Gon and explains to him how he was healed. Killua explains to Gon that it is his duty to protect both Aluka and Nanika. Killua feels thankful to Gon that because of him, he is able to now protect his brother. You can see that their farewell is bittersweet as Gon doesn't want to go. Killua says that he is going to go traveling with Aluka, while Gon agrees to do some traveling of his own. Before leaving, they do confirm to each other that they are still part of a team no matter what happens. With somber expressions, they finally part ways. This is definitely one of my favorite moments of Hunter x Hunter, as we get to see the two boys mature up and part their separate ways. It is difficult to let go of something that you rely upon, but these two characters show an enormous amount of growth here. Since their friendship had reached its natural conclusion at the end of the Chimera Untalk, the two boys now have to part ways to grow as individual characters. I'm sure that this isn't the last time that we'll see the two of them together, but they no longer have anything to gain from each other. If anything, if they remain to stay together, then it will only hold them back. And this is a tough part of growing up that everybody has to come to realize. After school ends, everybody goes their separate ways. And I love how these bittersweet farewells that we experience in our real world are implemented in this manga. When Gon reaches the top of the world tree, he is greeted by his father. When they finally get to speak to each other, the first question that Gon asks him is, what is it that he wants? Jin tells him that he wants whatever he doesn't have. He had wanted to become a hunter because it was the most realistic way to get to any place that he had wanted to go to. We learned that when Jin was 15, he had set up a non-profit organization to repair and research a archaeological site. Jin is the type of character to go after whatever he wants, and he doesn't do so for financial or monetary gain. Jin values the bonds and the relationships that he forms with people along the way. That is the best part for him. It is not to accomplish a task, but it is the people that accompany him and help him along the way of his journey. Quite similar to Gon and his relationships with Kurapika, Leorio, and Killua. Gon then asks him what is it that Jin wants now? Jin explains this through describing the tree that they are sat on. He says that the growth of this tree was stunted, and this is because it doesn't get enough nutrients, and this resulted in the tree being much smaller and shorter than what it should have been. Jin reveals to Gon and to us that the real world tree grows out of a mountain. The roots of the tree suck in magma, and it is so tall that it reaches out of the atmosphere, but Jin explains that this tree exists outside of this world. He teases aspects of the story which will be discussed heavily in the next arc of the series. Jin explains that the Chimera Ants had come from the outside world too. Of course, he is talking about the Pandora's box that is the Dark Continent. It is a much bigger world. Jin describes that there were some people long ago who had left records of their travels to the Dark Continent. After briefly describing the Dark Continent, he tells Gon that what he wants is always the same, and that is something that he doesn't have. We learn that Jin desires to explore the Dark Continent, but there are four things that are preventing him from starting his journey. The first is permission to explore the Dark Continent. The second is the means to actually explore it. The third is qualifications. And lastly, a contract, which will most likely fund the expedition to the Dark Continent. Jin doesn't meet any of these four requirements, but he isn't in a hurry. He is just enjoying the journey. And he advises Gon to enjoy the details of his journey also. He advises Gon that something more important than the thing that he is hunting could be right there beside him the whole time. Throughout the night, the two of them continue to share stories with each other, while Gon also returns Jin's hunter's license to him. In chapter 339, we wrap up some loose points which were left at the end of the Chimera Antok, as all of the individuals who fought against the Chimera Ants are rewarded for their efforts. After he speaks to his father, Gon returns to meet Kite and his team. We see updates and whereabouts of all of Gon's friends, but there has been one that has remained absent up until this point. Of course, I'm referring to Kurapika. Kurapika, who's been completely absent since the end of the York New City arc, appears to have a very somber expression on his face. We see him paying respects to a shrine. It appears that this shrine has been constructed to pay respects to the fallen Kurta clan. By looking at the shrine, it is obvious that Kurapika has been able to retrieve five pairs of his clan's scarlet eyes. Meanwhile, at Kukuru Mountain, the Zordic butlers are paying respects to Goto's grave. And finally, the last images that we see are from the desolated Republic of East Goto, as Tagashi takes us through the abandoned area until we reach a room where we see Meruem and Komugi holding hands at the resting place of their bodies. And this ends the 13th Hunter Chairman election arc, as well as concluding the 2011 Hunter Hunter anime. The election arc was only 20 chapters long but it feels like so much had occurred within these 20 chapters. It is definitely very different to the Chimera Antok, and it feels like a return to the Hunter Hunter that we are very familiar with, without the theatrics and dramatization of the Chimera Antok. The arc had its serious moments, as well as having a fair share of comedic moments, and this is a striking contrast to the Chimera Antok, which felt very morbid and depressing. Not that that was a bad thing, it's just the prior arc was very bleak and void of hope. 
This arc understandably focuses on the after effects of the Chimera Antarc. In particular, we focus on Gon who is in critical condition, and on the absence of Netero which results in the election of the next chairman. Despite everybody including the best exorcist of the Hunter Association giving up on Gon's well-being, there are a group of people who do not give up on Gon, and these are the people that Gon has truly left an impact upon throughout the series. The burden of hope that Gon will get better is placed onto Kilwar's shoulders, and he carries this responsibly. Not only does he look after the safety and well-being of Gon, but he also looks after the well-being of Aluka. He takes up responsibility and is no longer afraid of his older brother, and this shows immense growth for Killua's character, especially when you compare him in his first appearance to his last appearance. Another really enjoyable aspect of this arc was being able to see Hisoka again. Every time we see him, he appears with a brand new outfit, but he always has the same sadistic attitude. You never know whose side he is on, and this is what leads to him being unpredictable and entertaining to watch. One family dynamic that is explored upon heavily in this arc, and I feel like throughout the entirety of the series is the Zordic family. It was fun to see the Zordics taking part in an intra-family mission, with three different parties hoping for three different outcomes. The portions of the story where Killua and Aluka were trying to get to the hospital in time had me on the edge of my seat. I didn't know if Illumi or Hisoka were going to be successful in managing to stop Killua, or if Zeno and Silva had other plans up their sleeve and were planning to intervene at the last second. The tensions had remained high for me until Killua and Aluka had finally reached the room where Gon was resting. And when it comes to the elections that this arc is named after, there is only one character who really stands out for me. I'm talking about Leorio. The anger that he feels towards Gon's father, and the care and emotions that he feels towards his friend. It really won Leorio's character over for me. Prior to this arc, I didn't really care much about him, but after this arc, he is definitely a character who I'm looking forward to see more of. It would have been really funny if Leorio ended up becoming the chairman, but as Gon says, it isn't Leorio's ambition to become the chairman. His ambition is of course to become a doctor. And if I were to speak about another character who was a highlight for me in the election portion of this arc, then it would definitely have to be Pariston. His mischievous and deceptive nature leads not only us, but the characters within the series questioning what are his true motives. The election arc, like I had said before, is different to the other arcs that we have seen up until this point, but not only because it revolves around events that we haven't seen before, but primarily because Gon isn't involved in the arc at all. Instead, the election arc is heavily focused upon Killua, and I think that Togashi pulls this off very successfully. This is ultimately credited to Killua being a very well-written character so much so that he can carry the story. I also felt like this was in a way Killua trying to redeem himself for not being there for Gon during the Chimera Antark. He had done everything in his power in order to save his friend. In the Chimera Antark, he had seen Gon succumb to revenge. He helplessly witnessed Gon sabotaging himself, but in this arc, he truly redeems himself and solidifies his friendship with Gon, and this is what makes it so heart-wrenching when the two of them have to part ways. Both of them have come so far, but to go even further and to fulfill that potential that everybody in the series has been hyping up, they need to now grow on their own and not rely upon each other. This arc was an excellent way to wrap up the 2011 anime as it's the end of Gon's journey. In this video, I'll be covering the Dark Continent Expedition arc. It is a transitionary arc, which helps the story to progress from the 13th Hunter Chairman Election arc to the Succession Contest arc. Prior to this arc, we had heard about the Dark Continent from Jin, when he was speaking to Gon on top of the World Tree. In this very short arc, we learn a lot of information about the world of Hunter Hunter. That is, a lot of exposition, and it is very dialogue heavy. New characters are introduced, and we learn a lot more information about existing characters that we knew little about. In addition to this, we get the reintroduction of characters like Kurapika, who has not been in the story since the York New City arc. So without further ado, let's get into this exposition heavy arc. The Dark Continent Expedition arc is the first in our manga exclusive arc breakdowns. The material that I'll be covering in this video has not been adapted into the 2011 anime. After the first chapter of this arc was published in 2012, the series went on to hiatus until 2014, where Tagashi had returned to complete the final eight chapters of this arc. Because of this, and the way that this arc ends and seamlessly transitions into the next one, it wasn't adapted into the 2011 anime. The Chairman Election arc seemed like a fitting end to the 2011 anime, especially as it wrapped up Gon's story. The material that I'll cover from this video spans from chapters 340 to 348. Despite only being 9 chapters long, this arc is dialogue heavy, as there is a lot of exposition and setup for the future of Hunter x Hunter. As the story evolves from being centred around Gon and his quest to find his father, Togashi introduces us to the true scale of the world of Hunter x Hunter. As the story starts to revolve around several different characters who have very differing motives, it is a lot to juggle and sometimes difficult to understand, but hopefully in this video, 
video, I'll be able to explain to you all of the new concepts that are introduced and what the differing motives of each of the characters are. The arc begins with the Zodiacs gathering for a meeting, as it is brought to their attention that the king of the Kakin Empire has decided to advance onto the Dark Continent. We learn that whenever humanity had tried to go to the Dark Continent in the past, they had brought back with them great calamities. The last official attempts to go to the Dark Continent were over 200 years ago. The Kakin Empire is not within the V5, so it is exempt of their laws and restrictions, thus allowing them to fully partake in an expedition to the Dark Continent. In Chapter 342, we learn that the world of Hunter x Hunter that we have known so far is just a group of islands which is in the middle of a gigantic lake. Of course, these islands are not small. Due to their size, they are considered to be continents of themselves, but they are small in comparison to the true scale of the world. The world of Hunter x Hunter is located within an enormous lake called Lake Mobius. This lake is located in the center of the Dark Continent. It is said that the Dark Continent is a freakish display of Mother Nature. It is inhabited with gigantic monsters and filled with various different diseases. Due to the known and mostly unknown dangers within the Dark Continent, the V5 had forbidden its member groups to explore any more of the Dark Continent. During the history of mankind, they had tried to go there 149 times, but out of all of these trips, only five returned with survivors. There were 28 people who had stepped foot onto the Dark Continent and had returned. One of these individuals is Isaac Netro himself. Each of these five voyages that returned brought back with them a great calamity. These would eventually come to be known as the five great calamities of the Dark Continent. Of the 28 people who had returned from the Dark Continent, there is only one survivor now, and it just so happens to be Isaac Netro's son, Beyond Netro. We learn that the Kakin Empire has organized a expedition team, and the individual that they have chosen to lead this team is none other than Isaac Netro's son. This revelation comes as a surprise to the Zodiac members, as not many people had known that he had a son. In his opening statements, Beyond Netro states that his father had always said that when you stop challenging yourself, that is when your life is truly over. Beyond wants to decipher all of the myths and to explore the ruins within the Dark Continent. He wants to know where our ancient ancestors came from. Fitting to his name, he wants to go beyond his father. He wants to remove all of the obstacles that are stopping humanity from exploring the Dark Continent. He has an open invitation to anybody who is willing to join him on this voyage. Beyond Netero promises to the world that he will take them to the Dark Continent in order to explore the new world. We learn that Beyond has been planning to go to the Dark Continent for a long time. If Beyond had wanted to go on his expedition with the permission of the V5, then he would have been caught up in years of legal paperwork, which have purposely been put in place to stop individuals from wanting to go to the Dark Continent. But Beyond doesn't want to sit around for years waiting for permission and to play by V5's rules. His desire is to go where no one has gone before. He wants to meet individuals that nobody has ever met. He wants to explore the Dark Continent without any restrictions. He wants to acquire resources that nobody has touched. He wants to leave his own unique mark on this unexplored territory. Beyond is fixated on this goal. He is accepting of anybody who wants to join him on his expedition. But at the same time, he doesn't care if anybody wants to leave also. He states that the only thing that will bother him is if someone tries to interfere with his plans. In chapter 340, we learn that Pariston and Jin have coincidentally resigned from the Zodiacs, just as Beyond had announced his plans for his upcoming expedition. In response to Beyond's announcement, the V5 have ordered the Zodiacs to hunt him down. The Kakin Empire is doing as they please because they haven't signed the treaty that the V5 members have signed. This treaty forbids the V5 from entering into the new world. So in effect, the Kakin Empire have skipped all of the screening processes that the V5 have set in place. In chapter 341, we learn that the entrance to the Dark Continent is guarded by a gatekeeper. Very little is known about this gatekeeper, but he is mentioned in passing conversations several times during this arc. The Dark Continent is described as Pandora's box. It is something that should not be opened. In chapter 341, we are shown the risks of exploring the Dark Continent through seeing examples of the five great calamities and the effects that they have had on humanity ever since they had come from the Dark Continent. We are shown human bodies that have been twisted and contorted like wrung out towels. They are preserved within glass jars to remind humanity of the risks of exploring the new world. We are also introduced to a survivor of one of the great calamities. It has transformed the individual into something that is no longer a human, as it no longer eats food, and it is self-sustaining, as it has survived for over 50 years without a meal. We learn that the V5 had made this treaty to not go to the new world after they realized that every time that humanity had returned from there, they flee from this unexplored land, bringing back with them an extinction level threat. During the expedition that Netero had gone on, he was accompanied by a son, and we learned that Beyond Netero had been trying to go through unexplored routes, and this resulted in many casualties. Because of this, he had ended up returning from his expedition and introducing new threats into the world. During the lifetime of Isaac Netero, his son had tried to go to the Dark Continent once more, but he had forbid him to, at least until after his death. We cut back to the Zodiac members who were left with a 
a message from Netero. It is said that this message should be shown to the Zodiac members if someone were to appear claiming to be a son. In this message, Netero says that he had gone to the Dark Continent twice when he was younger, but the strength required to explore this new world is not what he was looking for. He had been searching for strength through an individual that he could see as an opponent, with the only outcomes being victory or defeat. Instead, what he had found in the new world was not a strong opponent, but rather a harsh battle against Mother Nature, where there is no clearly defined victor. He eventually cuts to the chase and in his message he requests that the Zodiac members successfully explore the Dark Continent before his son Beyond Netero does. He requests them to overcome any of the risks that are associated with the new world, asking them to return with hope. The difficulty of this request is of course an A rank. He tries to disguise this final wish as a request and not an order, but the Zodiac members are well aware that Netero had not asked for anything but this, so it feels like an order. So they are left with no choice but to adhere to his final request, and to explore the Dark Continent themselves. In a surprising turn of events, Beyond Netero hands himself into the Hunter Association at the end of chapter 341. He does so so that there are no problems between the discussions that are occurring between the V5 and the Kakin Empire. He wants the Kakin Empire to meet the V5's necessary requirements in order to enter the Dark Continent without any issues. The V5 want to include the Kakin Empire as a new leader country, so that they change into the V6. And they also want Beyond Netero to be captured. This is so that any expeditions or voyages to the New World can be supervised by the V5 organization. They are aware that the Kakin Empire wants to explore the Dark Continent in order to colonize it. So in chapter 342 we learn that the V5 wants to trick them by giving the Kakin Empire islands which are on the outskirts of Lake Mobius. These islands are located in the waters just before the Dark Continent. They want to make them believe that they have reached and conquered the Dark Continent by handing them over these islands. But now that Beyond Netero has handed himself in and appearing to comply with the V5, in actual fact he has a plan of his own. The V5 have no intention of allowing the Kakin Empire to explore the Dark Continent on their own. They instead want to supervise their actions. And now that Beyond Netero has handed himself in, they are able to supervise and to restrict him. The Five Great Calamities are like a preview of what to expect from the Dark Continent. These are the threats that humanity had brought back from there. The first is the botanical weapon called Brion. It is a sphere that protects mysterious and ancient ruins found within the New World. Then there's the gaseous life form called AI. It is described as the codependence of desire, and it would appear that Alucard's powers have originated from this gaseous life form. The third calamity is the twin snake called Hellbell. It is a monster that infects its prey with a homicidal desire. The fourth is a beast that keeps people as pets called Pup. And lastly, the fifth great calamity is called Zobe, the immortal disease. It is described as endless despair which is disguised as hope. If you recall, we had seen an example of a victim who has fallen to Zobe, having survived 50 years without any food. But the consequence of this is that the individual no longer appears to be a human. The fact that the Kakin Empire have made the general public know about the expedition leads the V5 to come up with a strategy to properly supervise it, as it will be impossible to make the Kakin Empire listen to them now that the news has gone public. In order to calm the situation and to peacefully resolve this issue, they need to invite the Kakin Empire into the V5. Now that Beyond has handed himself in, the Hunter Association will act as his chaperones during the expedition. The Zodiac members rightfully assume that Beyond is currently playing along just so that he can get to the Dark Continent while being supervised. But once he arrives on the uncharted territory, then he will escape and do as he pleases. It is up to the Hunter Association to come up with a way to prevent him from escaping, and to properly supervise him and to prevent any of his accomplices from breaking him out. In chapter 342, we are shown how the Kakin Empire plans to transport people to the Dark Continent. They have built a giant transport ship called the Black Whale No. 1. It has a capacity to carry 200,000 people. This will be the ship that will carry the expedition team into the New World. On board will be the King of the Kakin Empire and his 14 princes. So now that we know the premise and the context of this arc, let's now look at some other characters aside from Beyond Netero and the Zodiacs. When it comes to Jin's character, we know that he has wanted to explore the Dark Continent from the previous arc. He supports the efforts that the Kakin Empire are going through, and it is for this reason that he also supports Beyond Netero. But he does appear to have a problem with Paristan, who is second in command of the expedition team. Jin understandably believes that Paristan's intentions are not clear. He thinks that he wants to sabotage the expedition to the Dark Continent, all for his own pleasure. And it is for this reason that he has joined Beyond Netero's team. And this is why Jin is so adamant in this arc to take the position of second in command of the expedition. Jin doesn't necessarily want to even be in control. He just wants Paristan to not be number two under Netero, where 
whether in position or even rank. In this way, he can prevent Pariston from sabotaging their efforts. In his efforts to become the second in command, Jin offers a lot of money to the other members of the expedition team so that they can accept him as the number two. He has plenty of reasons to suspect Pariston's actions, especially knowing that he has 5,000 Chimera Ant soldiers on standby waiting for whatever command that he throws at them. In chapter 343, Leorio becomes a member of the Zodiacs because of his exceptional performance at the elections. Because of this, he has become a very well respected member of the Hunter Association, and it is for this reason that he has been invited to become a Zodiac member. Knowing that there is another vacant spot within the Zodiacs, he recommends Kurapika for the position. After initially being apprehensive, he is convinced to join the Zodiacs. After learning that the fourth Kakin prince called Saridnik owns the remainder of his clan's eyes, Kurapika joins the Zodiacs and he immediately assists them. He does so by identifying traitors within the Zodiacs and even within the Hunter exam. He is looking for individuals who may be assisting Pariston and even beyond with his escape plan. We can see that Kuripika's character is very different. We can only assume that this has happened because he has allowed himself to become further consumed with his goal of revenge. I feel like he is no longer the Kuripika that we knew prior to the York New City arc. Thanks to Kuripika's help, at the end of the Dark Continent Expedition arc, we learned that Monkey is the traitor within the Zodiac, and in regards to retrieving the remainder of his clan's eyes, he desires to speak with Sridenik and to convince him to give the eyes back. He knows that all of the 14 Kakin princes will be on board the Black Whale on the expedition to the Dark Continent. This is why he will try to infiltrate in their ranks, so that he may be able to speak to Sridenik. Another character that is briefly mentioned in this arc is Gon. We learn about his whereabouts and updates as to how he is progressing. Gon is unable to use Nen, which results in his father advising him to seek out what he is able to do now that he has lost his powers. This results to Gon returning back to his home on Whale Island, where we see him studying and catching up with paperwork, for now living what seems to be a normal life. Another important story beat which the next arc will be focused upon is the Succession Contest. We know that the 14 princes of the Kakin Empire will be on board this expedition. The king of the Kakin Empire declares that the sole survivor of this voyage will be the next king, so the 14 princes have a lot on the line to wage war against each other, so that one of them may be declared the next king. In chapter 348, we get introduced to Benjamin, another one of the princes. We see him wrestling with a lion. We see Sridenik speaking to him and discussing the Succession Contest. We see how the two of them are both sinister and evil in their own unique way. Sridenik may not have the strength of Benjamin, but he appears to be extremely formidable through his facial expressions alone. You can see that this character is very twisted, especially considering the fact that we have seen him collect body parts and kill multiple women within this arc. It is evident from chapter 348 that Sridenik will do anything in his power to become the next king, so it's definitely interesting to see how these events will unfold in the next arc. The Dark Continent is a vast unexplored region. Their cures to many different illnesses will be found. It is rumoured that these secrets to longevity or even immortality may be found there. So there is a lot of incentive for leader nations to be going to the Dark Continent, as each country has an equal chance of being responsible for finding the next innovation which will benefit human life. At the end of the Dark Continent expedition arc, we have a lot of unanswered questions. We continuously get mentions of the gatekeeper of the Dark Continent. Aside from two mentions of him in chapter 341 and 342, we don't really know much more about this individual. In addition to this, in chapter 344, Jin has a shocking revelation of his own, as he states that there was an individual who had written a book called Journey to the New World, and there were two editions to this book, the East and the West editions. The only volume that has been found is the East version, and there are no signs of the West edition, which leads Jin to say that the West edition is still being written. This person had set out on his own expedition to the Dark Continent almost 300 years ago, and the fact that he is still writing the second volume may be because he has consumed some of the longevity rice, or herbs that can cure ailments and illnesses. Jin reveals that the author of the book Journey to the New World world is Gon and Jin's ancestor, called Don Freaks. This is an incredibly huge teaser for the upcoming events in the story. In addition to this, we don't know who the next king of the Kakin Empire will be. There is so much that occurs within the Dark Continent Expedition arc, so I've tried to wrap it up and summarise a lot of the events within this video. If you are still confused about a lot of the internal politics or the events that occurred, then I highly recommend reading the next arc of the story. With the current state of Hunter x Hunter, it is difficult to say what will happen, as the Succession Contest arc begins in chapter 349 and it is currently currently ongoing, with 42 chapters released. Hunter x Hunter's latest story arc, the Succession Contest arc, takes place between chapters 349 to 390, and as of making this video, it is incomplete, with only a total of 42 chapters having been released, between August of 2014 to November of 2018. Continuing on from the Dark Continent Expedition arc, this story arc begins the Succession Contest between the 14 princes of the Kakin Empire, as they are tasked to kill each other as soon as the Black Whale begins its journey towards the Dark 
Dark Continent, with the sole survivor being crowned as the new king of the Kakin Empire. We know that Kurapika has been hired as a bodyguard to protect the eighth queen and her daughter, Prince Warble. Kurapika's main motive is to confront the individual who had last owned the eyes of his clan. This is none other than the fourth prince, Sarydnik. During this most recent arc, we also get to witness one of the best battles within the entire series, as Hisoka and Krodo finally face off against each other. So before I give everything away, let's start by talking about the preparations that were needed prior to setting off on the voyage for the Dark Continent. The current ruler of the Kakin Empire, King Nasubi, has his personal butler explain to Prince Rydnik that the succession contest will begin as soon as the Black Whale begins its departure for the Dark Continent. If any of the 14 princes were to die prior to the departure, then the contest would be called off. We learn that the contest will be between the children of the eight legal wives of King Nasubi. Of these eight wives, he had 14 legitimate children, and despite their gender, all children are referred to as princes. Each prince, upon agreeing with the terms, has to take part in the seed urn ceremony, which is a tradition of the Kakin royal family. They offer up their blood to the urn, and in exchange, they will be granted a special power. Each prince will give birth to a guardian spirit beast, which will serve to protect them, but it is to be noted that these guardian spirit beasts take after their user, so an individual who has very little conviction will produce a very weak guardian spirit beast, one that will be unfit to serve them or to protect them. These guardian spirit beasts are created from the deceased first king of the Kakin Empire and his desire to preserve his lineage through his descendants. We know that these guardian spirit beasts are a type of parasitic Nen beast. They possess the descendant of the first king and they feed on their aura. Using this as an energy source, they take shape and develop abilities which are influenced by the host's character and their personality. So the more sickening the character of the prince, the more disgusting and threatening looking their guardian beast will appear to be. All guardian beast spirits have two rules which they follow. They do not fight and kill each other, and they cannot attack another human being who is being guarded by a guardian spirit beast. Now as far as beyond Netro's role is concerned, he is currently in the custody of the Hunter Association. He clearly states in chapter 349 that he is only interested in exploring the Dark Continent, and he will not do anything to jeopardize his chances of traveling there. We learnt during the Dark Continent expedition arc that one of these Zodiac members is a mole. This individual is of course Sayu, and it seems as though he is working with Pariston in order to take back Beyond Netero. To prevent him from being freed from captivity, Kurapika proposes a plan, as he states that they need to restrain Sayu somehow before landing upon the new continent. Later, we learn that some of the princes of the Kakin Empire are hiring bodyguards. Unaware of the succession contest, Kurapika questions why six of the Kakin princes are wanting to recruit bodyguards for the celebration and the journey. They're concerned that this will give an opportunity for some spies to board onto the ship. Kurapika ends up recruiting Basho, Biscuit, Hanzo, Izunavi, and Melody as the bodyguards for the six princes, and he tasks them to learn more information about the fourth prince, Sarydnik. He wants to learn enough information in order to come into physical contact with Sarydnik. He then studies the six profiles of the princes. He then narrows down his analysis on two particular profiles, the first being the prince who had the highest reward by constantly increasing it so that it's higher than the others, and the second profile who had appeared to not change their price no matter how much the other princes had increased theirs. He deduces that the individual who had kept their price the same appears to have very strong self-esteem. It is like they are a competitive individual who likes to display power. He makes an assumption that this profile fits Prince Halkenberg. He deduces that if he was to work for this particular prince, then it would be the best choice for him to get closer to Sarydnik. So he decides to work as a bodyguard for the prince that he had assumed to be Prince Halkenberg. When he gets a response and he heads to meet his employer, he learns that he will be working for the eighth queen and the mother of Prince Warble, the 14th prince. It is here that Kurapika learns about the succession contest. Kurapika agrees to be their bodyguard while on the journey, as his friends have also been hired as bodyguards for the other princes, with Izunavi working for Prince Tyson, Basho working for Prince Luzurus, Melody working for Prince Kacho, Hanzo working for Prince Momose, and Biscuit working for Prince Mariam. We now turn our attention towards Heaven's Arena, where we learn that Hisoka has challenged Krolo to a battle. The two of them agree to have a fight to the death. Hisoka had done very little to prepare for the bout, whereas Krolo had developed new abilities in preparation for this fight. Krolo begins the battle by using the ability Black Voice in order to control the referee of the match. He uses him as a shield in order to close the distance between himself and Hisoka. Krolo is constantly pressuring Hisoka to think on his feet, as he then unveils a new ability that he has learnt called Sun and Moon Pair Destruction. It allows Krolo to detonate anything remotely that he 
is touched. He then reveals that by using an ability called Double Face, it allows him to use a bookmark on one particular page in order to maintain his ability so that he no longer has to hold the book open to use it. But if he was to hold the book open on another page, then it will allow him to use two abilities at once. When Crawler goes on to explain all of the various different abilities that he has learned, Hisoka doesn't appear to be phased, as he enjoys witnessing people's plans fall apart. Crawler is using Black Voice to control targets to attack, the ability Convert Hands to hide himself, creating copies with Gallery Fake, and controlling these copies with Order Stamp, and attaching his ability Sun and Moon to the copies in order to detonate them. It is evident that during this battle, Crawler constantly has the upper hand. The complexity and the range of abilities makes the battle very unpredictable. Hisoka then begins to be attacked by doppelgangers made up of the spectators. They are being controlled by Crawler's ability Order Stamp, as they have been given the command to break Hisoka. While Hisoka is distracted by the clones, Crawler disguises himself and begins to attack Hisoka from behind. Hisoka is absolutely overjoyed by the level of skill that is on display. He is excited for more as it appears that he is being beaten by Crawler. While Hisoka focuses on beheading the clones, Crawler takes advantage of the situation as he continues to attack Hisoka while his guard is lowered. Crawler then creates copies and he places Sun and Moon on them, so that they won't disappear if he chooses to use other abilities. Hisoka only realises this after Crawler had tricked him into attacking a copy of himself that was being controlled by his ability Black Voice after he had used Convert Hands. It is so fascinating to see Hisoka keep up with Crawler's complicated fighting strategy, as he mixes up several abilities in various different combinations in order to catch Hisoka off guard. Hisoka deduces that Crawler has been marking his clones with the ability Sun and Moon, while also using the ability Order Stamp to break him. He realises that at any time Crawler can make maximum powered explosive puppets encircle him and to detonate on command. After fighting off a crowd of clones, he realises that the head that he has been holding in his hand helping him to attack the clones ends up detonating as it blows away his fingers. He then uses bungee gum to run alongside the spectator stands, but the clones follow him as they have been ordered to detonate at close range. He is then ambushed by a group of puppets that detonate and send him hurtling into the air towards another crowd of more explosive puppets. He questions whether if he is going to die. The puppets charge towards Hisoka as they surround him, as an incredibly large explosion engulfs all of them. This brings an end to the deathmatch, as we see Hisoka's corpse lying before Shellnark, Kotopi and Machi. Shellnark and Kotopi leave as Machi states that she will stitch Hisoka up, but before she can do anything, an aura emerges from Hisoka's corpse, as it seems as though he has come back to life. We learn that Hisoka had placed bungee gum on his heart and lungs, in order to restart them if he were to ever die. After his revival, Hisoka admits that he had underestimated his opponent. He then restrains Machi using bungee gum as he states that his new desire is to kill all of the members of the Phantom Troop. While Shalnark is speaking with Crawler on the phone, we learn that he is planning to board onto the Black Whale and to steal the valuables of the Kakin family. After hanging up, Shalnark wonders why Kotopi is taking so long in the bathroom, but it is then that Hisoka leaves the toilet with Kotopi's severed head in his hands. And while Shalnark is enraged, he takes advantage of his emotional state by dashing forward and powerfully striking his head, which immediately kills him. Shalnark's contorted corpse is tied to a swing and Kotopi's head is placed in front of him, as Hisoka has begun his mission to hunt down the spiders. Meanwhile, all of the voyagers setting off for the Dark Continent gather within Kakin, as they are all present before the Black Whale. They begin entering the whale in a tier-based structure, as the first tier consists of the Kakin family, the V5 politicians, while the second tier consists of anybody rich enough to come, as well as celebrities, and tiers 3, 4 and 5 have been assigned to general passengers. The Black Whale one, which houses 200,000 passengers, as well as being the main area where the succession contest will be taking place, set sail for the Dark Continent after the departure ceremony, which involved the King, the Princes and the Queens. So let's now give a brief overview of each of the 14 Princes who are involved within the succession contest. The first Prince of the Kakin Empire and the eldest son is called Benjamin. He is an aggressive individual who has a lot of self-confidence. He is very large and muscular, and the first time that we see him, he is literally wrestling a lion. The second prince is Camilla. She is the eldest female among the 14 siblings. She has long hair which she fashions into a very complicated hairstyle. Throughout her appearances, we see her wearing several fancy dresses, and while she may appear to be elegant and well-mannered, she is in fact very sadistic. She's a heartless individual who has no issue with killing even a biological brother. The third prince, Zhang Li, is a bald, short man. In his appearance, he resembles a Chinese monk. He is a diplomat 
charismatic individual who shows generosity and tolerance to others. He is the type to avoid conflict and killing, unless it is absolutely necessary. The fourth Prince Sarajnik, who I've mentioned several times, is of particular interest, because at some point he had obtained several scarlet eyes, which had belonged to Kurapika's clan. These are pairs of eyes that Kurapika had failed to track down. In terms of personality, Sarajnik is the worst of the worst. He is inhumane as he takes a great deal of pleasure in slaughtering human beings and collecting their body parts. And in particular, he is overjoyed with the idea of being able to kill his siblings, as he views them all as trash. The fifth prince, Tubepa, is a scientist. She is a patient and tolerant individual, and she values traits like humility and modesty, and she has commented upon her siblings as she states that Benjamin is arrogant, while Zhang Li indulges in excess and luxury, and she has also criticised Camilla for her greed. Unlike a few of the other princes, she has demonstrated confidence in being able to win the succession contest. The sixth prince, Tyson, is a round-faced woman with a large head. She enjoys being in the company of handsome men, and this is the criteria that she had picked for assigning her bodyguards. After being assigned to her, she was very possessive of them, refusing to allow the Hunter Association to screen them. We learn that despite being involved within the succession contest, she is opposed to violence, and she believes that her teachings on love can change the world. The seventh prince, Lazarus, is a slim, long-nosed man. Very little is known about his personality, but we are aware that his older brother, Sarajnik, refers to him as a moron. We do learn that he has a compassionate side, as he wants to use the healthy drug Clean Leaf in order to rehabilitate any drug addicts. The eighth prince, Sail Sail, is referred to as a womanizer, as we see him constantly surrounded by women. Because of his lust and his gluttony, he refuses to be a part of the succession contest, as he'd rather enjoy himself at parties. Hackenberg is the ninth prince of the Kakin Empire. We learn that he is a pacifist, and he has no intention with participating within the succession contest, as he does not want to win the crown through bloodshed. He opposes the ways of the royal family and desires to change them. The tenth prince, Kacho, is the twin of the eleventh prince, Fugetsu. We learn that she is cold-blooded, and she has a shallow, spoiled personality. Unlike some of the other siblings, she has no problem with murdering her own blood. Kacho cares a great deal about her twin sister. Fugetsu, the eleventh prince of the Kakin Empire, is quite shy and soft-hearted. It is evident that she is kinder than her twin sister, and she is more considerate to her subordinates than Kacho is. Fugetsu also appears to be opposed to the succession contest. The twelfth prince is called Momose. She has long hair that she fashions into a ponytail. From what we see of her, she appears to be a gentle and calm girl, and we see that she is forgiving towards her mother, and she even feels pity for her brother Mariam for lacking the ability to become king. The thirteenth prince, Mariam, is a small child. He is fond of his pet hamster and he carries it around with him everywhere. He just seems to be happy to play video games, and he doesn't really hold negative feelings towards anybody. And the fourteenth and final prince, Warble, is the youngest amongst the fourteen princes. She is, in fact, an infant so she has no real defined personality. We know that Kuripika has been assigned as Prince Warble's bodyguard in order to protect her during the succession contest. The Black Whale One is currently headed for the New Continent, which is one of several large islands that are dotted around the perimeter of the Dark Continent. The succession contest is scheduled to have concluded by the time the Black Whale One arrives at the New Continent, with only one of the princes having survived and being crowned as the new king of the Kakin Empire. The succession contest is quite complicated, as it's far removed from a death match like what we had seen with Hisoka and Krolo. So if any of the princes are to eliminate their competitors, then they are to do so in a discreet manner. We know that each of the princes have a guardian spirit beast that was assigned to them through the seed urn ceremony. They are a type of Nen beast that acts as a parasite, and their role is to assist and to protect their user. At the onset of the succession contest, we are aware that none of the 14 princes had known about Nen, so they don't really know how to control their Nen beasts. And it is these these Nen beasts that are the main weapon for the princes to utilize during the succession contest. It is no secret that the fourth prince, Rydnik, has the highest likelihood of winning the succession contest. He proves to be a genius as after learning about the existence of Nen, who is able to learn about its core concepts within only a few days. And throughout the course of the succession contest arc, Rydnik is continuously gaining more and more power. He has the innate ability to cultivate a large amount of Nen aura, and he has become so powerful and well refined in his Nen abilities that he was able to manifest a second Nen beast without him even knowing. Sridnik has also proven himself to be a Nen specialist, as he has developed a powerful ability called Parallel Future. While Sridnik is engaged in Zetsu, this ability allows him to momentarily see into the future. The fourth prince has proven to be a formidable threat during this contest. As I've said, throughout the course of this story arc, he has 
gained new abilities and is mastering Nen at an incredible speed. Later we learn that Kurapika decides to teach Nen to the bodyguards of several princes who agree to his terms. He wants to balance out the playing field of the succession contest. The sixth prince Tyson and the second prince Camilla had refused Kurapika's offer. Each of the princes who had agreed to Kurapika's training had sent two bodyguards each. Each of these bodyguards have their own motives and desires, and it's quite easy to get lost and for the story to feel very complicated, as so many new characters have been introduced all at once. What we need to know is that some of the bodyguards have ulterior motives, as a few of them already know how to utilize Nen. The only certain thing is that none of them can be trusted, because at the end of the day they will be acting on the best interest of their prince. I'm fairly confident that they will go through great lengths in order for their respective prince to win. Like Prince Reidnik, Hockenberg and Benjamin have also developed their own Nen abilities, as well as the second Prince Camilla having developed a post-mortem Nen power. This ability is to be activated after Camilla is killed, as a giant Nen beast that takes the appearance of a cat appears behind the killer, and it crushes them with its paws extracting their life force. The cat then pours this life force into Camilla, thus resurrecting her. This Nen ability has made it impossible to kill Camilla. Now as of the release of chapter 390, we don't really know if any of the other princes have developed their own unique Nen abilities or even know how to use this power. Of the 14 princes, we are aware that three of them have lost their lives. The first being Momose, the second being Kacho, and the final being Sade Sade. Now earlier I did mention that Krolo had expressed his interest in boarding the Black Whale 1 in order to steal the valuables of the Kakin family. We know that all of the current members of the Phantom Troop are actually on board of the Black Whale 1, including Krolo. They are aware that Hisoka has also boarded the Black Whale 1, but they don't know which tier he is on. We are aware that Hisoka had even hired Illumi to join the Phantom Troop in their search to kill him. So with all of these individuals on board the same ship, and with the succession contest taking place simultaneously, it is evident that there is still so much more of the Hunter x Hunter story to be told, especially considering that the survivors of the succession contest arc will be partaking in the next story arc which is going to be centred around the Dark Continent. We were told about the existence of Don Freaks, an explorer from 300 years ago who was said to still be exploring the Dark Continent. The future of Hunter x Hunter as a series is pretty bleak. As of last year, it's been over 1000 days since we've had a new chapter of Hunter x Hunter. We all know about Togashi's health concerns and the declining quality of the manga. Ever since the Greed Island arc, there was a noticeable drop in quality in the actual artwork that was featured within the story. And as of recently, during the Succession Contest arc, Hunter x Hunter feels more like a novel than an actual manga series, with pages upon pages being filled with walls of text, and with some manga panels featuring only text without any actual drawings. I know that I speak for a lot of people when I say that it would be better if Togashi resigns himself to a writing credit, while he allows a new illustrator to helm the artwork for the manga. Because after all, as long as Togashi is writing the story, and he is overseeing the artwork, I think it would be the best compromise with the current situation. So this was my very lengthy breakdown and explanation of the Hunter x Hunter manga. Of course, this is far from the complete story, and with the succession contest only having 42 chapters, there's still a lot left to be told. If you've made it to this point of the video, then you're clearly a huge Hunter x Hunter fan, and you probably enjoy the content that I create. So I want to express my gratitude for your time. Hopefully after watching this video, you'll know all about the Hunter x Hunter manga and be caught up to the recent goings on. I want to hand over the discussion now to all of you. What do you think about the Hunter x Hunter story? And what are your thoughts about its future? I would love to read all of your comments and for you to share with me all of your experiences with Hunter x Hunter. And lastly, thank you for making it to the end of this video, and I can't wait to see you in my next Hunter x Hunter video. If you enjoy my content, then you can support my channel through Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, or even through YouTube by becoming a channel member. You will gain access to exclusive channel perks and a Discord server which I frequently use. So become a member of my Zero Division and be the first to know about my upcoming videos. And once again, thank you for sticking around till the end of the video, and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me.